Words Unspoken, Book Three of the Ramsley Brothers Series, written by Josephine Bintema, narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter One. It was happening again. Michael watched dispassionately as the dark, shadowy specter followed Christian Gaines around the conference room. It hovered, perhaps three feet off the ground, wandering after Gaines like a well-trained dog. Michael sighed and rubbed his eyes, but he knew that it wouldn't help. The specter would still be there, a dark, cloudy patch of fog disturbing him. It had been showing up for three weeks, distracting him. It was a nuisance. Michael's head pounded harder. He wondered if anyone else could hear the hundreds of miniature woodpeckers hammering away inside his head. He glanced at his Rolex. Noon. Only noon, and he had already used up all of his prescribed migraine medications. Gaines took Michael's glance at his watch as a signal to wrap up the meeting, and mercifully did so. Michael calmly watched as the cloudy black figure decided to follow John Pritchard out the glass doors along the corridor. Colin Ozit slapped Michael on the shoulder. Well, the FDA won't like it, but I'm sure our new director of the board will be able to smooth it all out. Michael gave a reserved smile. He had found throughout the years that a reserved and calm attitude made most people instinctively trust, respect, and admire him. He probably seemed much smarter than he was. The acquisition of Claymont Pharma is a good business decision for our company. While it may restrict the market further, Claymont has already decreased its presence there. I'm sure the FDA will agree that it is the best long-term solution. Ozit laughed obnoxiously. That's why you're the man for the job. Michael nodded. He gathered up the materials from the meeting and walked the short distance to his office. He was not the man for the job, Michael reflected. Max had been the man for the job. Max had been confident, inspiring, able to sweet-talk his way through anything. His youngest brother was perfect at lobbying to get exactly what the company wanted. Unfortunately, their father, David Ramsley, just recently retired, and Max hadn't seen eye to eye. To be fair, Max had been right. Now Max no longer worked with Ramsley Pharmaceuticals which meant the task fell to Michael. The claimant deal was Michael's first large test in the eyes of big business as the new head of the company. Either he would fail, and everyone would think that he had only received the position due to the fact that he was David's firstborn, or he would succeed and make his mark. He smoothed down his suit as he took a seat in his comfortable leather chair behind his mahogany desk. Anne had followed him into his office with a memo pad. She closed the door behind her, automatically getting a glass of water and putting down two of her own stash of over-the-counter pain medication on his desk with the glass. He looked at them for a moment, debating on telling her that they wouldn't put a dent into his migraine and that he was on far stronger medications. Of course, he didn't. He didn't tell anyone about the medications, or that he'd had a constant headache for the past six months, or that he was hallucinating black specters that floated behind people ominously. The only one he told was the doctor. Michael took the pills anyways and tried to focus on what Anne was saying. Gentlemen's Quarterly called again. They're still trying to get you for the cover. They promised to send over the interview questions before so that we can approve them. Absolutely not. Unlike his brother, Max, who had enjoyed being the center of attention, Michael did not. He much preferred his privacy. Same response for Business Weekly? Please. Anne tilted her head to the side and studied him for a moment. Business Weekly has been asking for years. With you now being the head of the company, it might be good press. No, thank you. Michael said softly but firmly. Chairing a conference was one thing. Working through meetings was okay. Even committee hearings he could do if he was well prepared. Going one-on-one -on -one with someone and knowing that every word you said would be recorded for posterity, with the expectations of delving into his personal life? No. Not possible. Besides, he had no personal life. He jogged the beach. He read extensively. He sailed. He worked twelve to eighteen hour days as he had done from the age of twenty at the family business. There was nothing else. Dr. Reynolds' office called. They have an opening today at one. There was a soft and unspoken query from his secretary with that statement. Anne was sharp, and she'd been with him for over twenty years. Twenty-two years, eight months, and nine days. But who was counting? 
Test results from Dad. He's on that cruise with Mom for the next four months, Michael lied. It was his own test results. He'd find out today if he was losing his mind. Unless there's something pressing, please confirm with Dr. Reynolds for one o'clock. No, there's nothing urgent. Anne paused for a moment and looked like she wanted to say something more. I'll set up the appointment. Anne, he asked, causing her to stop from exiting the office. Is there something else? I was going to talk to you about something, she said reluctantly. It can wait until the end of day. Are you sure? he asked. Yes, the end of day would be better. Anne gave him a smile. You should eat something. I'll get you a sandwich and coffee sent up from the cafeteria. He nodded because it was easier than explaining that he didn't really want anything to eat. The pain in his head made his stomach nauseous. Or maybe it was the numerous drugs he was swallowing. He watched her return to her desk to make phone calls. When she tilted her head just so, the sunlight made it shine like burnished gold. He caught his breath a moment, watching her through the glass. She really was beautiful. He ought to stop staring, mooning after her. It wasn't professional. Of course, he'd been doing it for twenty years, so it was a natural response, like breathing the air or drinking water. Twenty-two years, eight months, and nine days, his mind corrected him. Michael stared down at the briefing from the Claymont deal. The words blurred, and he blinked hard to bring them back into focus. He grabbed a legal pad and jotted down some notes to try to win the FDA over. At some point, the coffee and sandwich arrived. He managed the coffee and half the sandwich. It was all he could stomach. Anne knocked on his door, poking her head in. The car has arrived. Seven months ago, he had come to the decision to use a company car and driver to go everywhere. With the pain from the headaches, it made sense. His own beamer sat useless in the parking garage of the downtown condo. People from the company had probably thought it had more to do with his position, but he actually preferred to drive himself. He just no longer trusted himself to. Twenty minutes later, he was escorted through the waiting room of Dr. Reynolds' office. He was directed to sit in the doctor's personal office and wait perhaps a minute before Dr. Reynolds joined him. Michael was surprised when the old man who had been treating him for years sat down in the seat next to him rather than in his usual chair across the desk. They shook hands in greeting. "'I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Michael,' Dr. Reynolds said gravely. Michael had known it was going to be bad. People didn't generally hallucinate and find out it was good news. He waited patiently for the doctor explained. "'There's a mass behind your right eye. It explains some of the migraines, the occasional blurred vision, and the hallucinations which are actually vision impairment caused by the pressure of the mass. It is small. I will need to biopsy it to determine if it is cancer.' It explains some of the migraines. Not all, Michael asked, picking up on what the doctor hadn't said. No. There was pity in the doctor's eyes. Michael, there is a second growth. It is much larger, and is pressing against a very delicate area of your brain. It is a miracle that you have not had an aneurysm or stroke yet. If you did, the results would be catastrophic. By all medical accounts, you should be dead. Michael absorbed the news. It wasn't good, but surely with modern science and medicine, something could be done. What are the next steps? Chemotherapy? No, Dr. Reynolds sighed. Even with the radiation, the mass would shrink too slowly. You could have a stroke at any moment. Dr. Hammond and I believe that you may have as little as two months before the pressure becomes too much for your brain. There's too much risk that you will die before the mass is shrunk enough to ease the pressure. Surgery is your only option. It's not without risks. When? Michael got straight to the point. As in business, cutting everything down to the facts was essential. Becoming emotional had never served any purpose. Normally a surgeon will schedule seven to eight months from now. You do not have that time. I am going to recommend Dr. Hemond. He's a very good brain surgeon, and he has a cancellation in three days. I urge you to take it. If you do not, you will have to find another surgeon, or you will die. Michael felt numb. I expect other surgeons would be booked as well. They are. Dr. Reynolds put a hand on Michael's arm gently. Michael, there is a very good chance you will not survive the surgery. If you do, there will be damage to the brain. What are the odds of surviving this sort of surgery? The numbness was being replaced with a gnawing panic, but Michael didn't show it. He was a master of calmness, no matter the turmoil he might feel inside. What sort of damage? 
One in two patients survive. The doctor waited for that to sink in. If I don't have the surgery, I will die. If I do have the surgery, there's a fifty percent chance I will die. Michael repeated his earlier question. What sort of brain damage? Dr. Reynolds took out a sheet showing one of the many scans that Michael had undergone. This is the small mass. Dr. Hemmen can carefully remove your eye and then remove the mass, reinserting the eye without any problems to your vision. That is the easy procedure. It didn't sound easy. Michael's stomach rebelled. He liked his eyes and preferred to keep them inside his head. He didn't particularly care how skilled the surgeon might be. Dr. Reynolds pulled another scan from the bottom of the file folder and placed it on top. This is the larger mass. We need to approach it where there will be the least consequences to your daily living. Essentially, he is choosing what brain damage to give you. By removing a part of your skull here and coming through this area of the brain, we would affect the area of your brain that deals with language. After the surgery, it is very likely that you would have a condition called speech aphasia. While you'll be able to understand everything spoken, you might have trouble replying. You might forget a word. You might mean to say a word like fork, but insert onion instead. You will not be able to read or write. The words and letters will get mixed up. It will be a permanent condition. How likely is this brain damage to occur? Michael felt like he had been punched. To never speak properly, write, or read again? It would be almost certain. But there is a chance that it wouldn't happen. He had to ask. Michael, I would not count on it. Dr. Reynolds shut the file. This is the best chance that you have to live. I'm going to schedule the surgery. I would respectfully suggest that you update your will and see to any unfinished business in the next three days. If you survive the surgery, we can biopsy the removed masses and find out if it is cancer. We will proceed from there. Please, go to exam room one and the nurse will take you through the pre-op forms and liability forms. Michael nodded and swallowed thickly. Dr. Reynolds squeezed his shoulder. I will do everything I can to get you through this. In the meanwhile, I am going to up your dosage for the pain medication that you are currently on to help with the migraines. Michael shook the doctor's proffered hand, then proceeded to exam room one. The nurse walked him through the paperwork. He agreed not to hold the doctor or the hospital responsible for anything that might occur during the surgery, including death. He received paperwork detailing his aftercare and what to expect. His head would be shaved at the hospital for the surgery. No food or water after midnight, the day of the surgery. He would remain in hospital for a minimum of three days, perhaps more, depending on how things progressed. He was given a prescription for the medication increase and told not to drive or operate heavy machinery. Today was Monday. Surgery was scheduled for Thursday. He's going to be at the hospital at seven in the morning. How was he going to deal with the claimant acquisition? What about the other legal issues he had sitting on his desk? Who would take over his work? Moreover, who would take his place as head of the company? Michael did everything on automatic. He listened politely to the nurse, nodded in all the right places, signed his name where he was supposed to. He took his paperwork, folding it. He placed it in the inside breast pocket of his suit. He didn't need anyone knowing about this. Not just yet. He thanked her for her time and was silent as usual on the drive back to corporate headquarters. He pretended to be checking emails on his phone. However, the truth was, he didn't even see the screen. Going through emails was pointless. He couldn't concentrate. It was 4.31 when Michael came back to his office. He knew this because he grabbed his current journal, wrote down the time and date, and then wrote down his prognosis. It seemed so permanent when written down in his script. Michael had kept a journal since the age of eight. For a moment he sat, staring at the words. Then he began a list of things that needed to be done. He would have to adjust his will. Ethan and Evan, his new nephews from his brother Noah and wife El, hadn't been alive when he had made the last will. He'd like to leave something in trust for them, should the worst happen. Then there were instructions for the Claymont deal. He'd have to get the legal team up here to finish what was necessary, and leave everything in order to make it easier for his replacement. There should be instructions given for the Kellington court case. They should settle out of court and out of the press. It would be the best scenario. As for his own replacement, perhaps Deagle for the head of the legal department and Gaines for the head of the company. Noah wouldn't be interested. Max was no longer with the company in any meaningful way. Gaines would be the best candidate. He was trustworthy. 
He knew the vision the company had for the future. Michael was interrupted as Anne knocked on the glass and entered his office, shutting the door firmly behind her. "'Michael, I thought we should talk.' "'Now is not the best time.' He continued to write furiously. "'Could you ask Deagle to come here? Tell him to bring Sanders and—' "'What is the other assistant's name?' "'Walkers?' "'Yes, Walkers. Please tell them to come.' "'Michael, I need to talk to you about something important.' Anne came forward and sat across from him. "'I've worked here for a long time, and I've decided to make some changes in my life. Twenty-two years, eight months, and nine days.' He laid down his pen and waited to see what she would say, impatient to get to work, but taking the time to listen to her. Instead, she took a deep breath and handed him a paper. "'What is this?' But he knew. The first few words gave it away. It was a letter of resignation. He looked at her with some confusion. "'Anne, why? Are you unhappy here?' "'I've loved working with you,' she explained. "'You are an amazing boss. You've taught me everything I know in the business world. But I can't keep doing twelve to eighteen-hour days, chasing you around, making your world easier for you.' "'We could reduce your hours,' he offered. If you need more vacation time or anything else, you need only ask. It's not about working less hours or vacation. I want— Anne stared at her clasped hands that rested on her knees. I want some things that I can't have if I continue to work here with you. I don't understand. I'm forty years old. I want a family. I want to go to PTA meetings, school plays, soccer, or gymnastics, or whatever sport my events my kids might choose. Michael felt a flare of panic, but tried to stamp it down. His Anne hadn't dated anyone seriously since that Roy character. He was certain she wasn't dating anyone right now. Was she? The company has a great maternity program and daycare. You're not understanding me. Then help me to understand. He rose from his chair, coming around the desk, stopping when she stood as well. Anything I can do to help. Anything I can give you, I will. There was a slight hitch in her voice. Can you give me babies? Michael stared dumbfounded at her. What could he say? A voice inside his head jumped up and down, screaming yes. The sane part of him said he would likely be dead in three days. Why on earth was she asking this, and what exactly did she mean? There was disappointment in her eyes and her voice. I thought not. He didn't know what he'd done, or not done, or what he should do. She turned and briskly walked to her desk, grabbing her purse. Galvanized into action, he followed her. Anne, please wait. She kept walking, and he continued to dog her steps. Please stay. I need you here. She gave an odd sort of little sound. We can talk about this, he said. He wasn't sure how, but he was willing to. Anything for her to stay. Please, Anne. She walked into the elevator and pressed a button. The doors began to close. He put his hand out to stop them. Please stay. She looked at him for a moment, then pressed the button again. As the doors closed, she said, "'Good-bye, Michael.' He stood staring at the elevator for a moment, like the idiot he was. A hand clamped onto his shoulder. "'Trouble in paradise, Ramsley?' It was Colin Ozit. Michael didn't care for Ozit under normal circumstances. He liked him far less right now. There had always been a bit of a rumor going around that Michael and Anne were romantically involved. There was, disappointingly, no truth to that rumor, but it didn't stop people from talking." He looked Ozit straight in the eye and lied. Everything's fine. Ozit chuckled. Sure thing. Michael walked around the odious man and went directly to Jeanie Duvel. Mrs. Duvel was secretary to Christian Gaines. She was a competent woman. Mrs. Duvel, I apologize for interrupting, but I find myself in a situation. Mrs. Duvel looked up from her filing. Oh? Anne's gone home for the day. She's had a bit of a family emergency and is likely to be away for a while. Michael lied again. He did so very convincingly, for a man who rarely ever did lie. I was wondering if you could call the temp agency and ask them to send someone over tonight. Tonight, Mr. Ramsley? she asked, surprised. Yes. Actually, please tell them to send three people. Michael revised his order. Do you happen to know Deagle's extension number? 332. She grabbed her address roster and looked for the temp agency. I'll get that done right away, Mr. Ramsley. Thank you, Mrs. Duvel. I appreciate it. Michael returned to his office and called Deagle. 
It was nearly the end of day and unfair to ask the legal department to keep working, but it was necessary. He needed to ensure that things were finished before his surgery. Of course, he didn't tell Deagle this. He simply quietly insisted that Deagle and his team come to the nearby boardroom. He was the head of the company, and they complied. Michael looked at his journal. With a few strokes, he noted the time. Anne has quit. I am drowning. He closed the book and shelved it. Grabbing all of the necessary files, he headed toward the conference room. Michael Ramsley was an idiot. A brilliant lawyer and businessman, but an idiot nonetheless. Anne slid into the booth and kicked off her heels. She pulled the clip out of her hair and massaged her head. The waiter came, and she ordered a strawberry daiquiri to start. Ten minutes later, Elle slid into the booth. Elle's dark form beauty was a foil for Anne's fair blondness. They'd become friends shortly before Elle had become engaged to Noah, Michael's brother. Now Elle and Noah were married with twin boys. It was the birth of Elle's babies that had really started the regret and thinking into motion for Anne. She dedicated most of her life to Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, and one Ramsley in particular. Michael was tall, lean, had black hair that was starting to gray at the temples. He was quiet, but had a sense of humor. She'd loved him since she was seventeen and saw him speak at a conference she was crashing. She was supposed to be working as part of the wait staff for the conference across the hall. Ten years older than her, Michael had been poised and elegant in his speech about the company. It was a meeting of shareholders, and he had simply been wonderful. Afterward, she'd managed to think up what she thought was a very good question and approached him. He'd been patient and kind. She cringed now to think of it. She'd known nothing about business or big pharma. Her question had been silly. Michael hadn't treated it as such, though, and for the first time in her life she'd felt worthy of someone's attention. That was when she decided she was going to figure out a way to make him hers. Three weeks later, and with the extensive ridge search, she'd found out that Ramsey Farmer was hiring a secretary for one of the legal staff. It was Michael. She'd borrowed a suit from one of her former teachers, brushed up on her resume, polished her interview answers, and charged forward like the teenager that she was, knowing that she just had to get the job. The interview hadn't gone well. It was conducted by an old lady going into retirement and deciding on her replacement. It was obvious that Anne had no experience. As she was walking down the hall, dejected from the episode, she'd run into Michael. Bolstering up her courage, she'd greeted him by name. He'd been startled to see her, but actually remembered who she was, and that was all that Anne needed as encouragement to say how much she wanted the available job. She'd run her pitch until she was out of breath, and then waited on tender hooks until he'd simply said she was hired. The previous secretary had protested, but Michael had quietly stated that while a secretary could be taught the necessary skills to do the required job, ambition and loyalty couldn't be taught. Anne seemed to have both. After that, Anne had done everything she could to prove that she was the secretary that he needed. She'd done a good job after she'd mastered the basics. She'd also tried to flirt, showed a little too much leg, and finally had asked him out. He'd replied by gently telling her about the harassment policy. She'd slunk away and been a very proficient secretary after that. She would make him proud of her by being the best secretary that the company had ever seen. She felt like she'd accomplished that. Over the years, they had become friends. He'd escorted her to company events, allowing her to be his plus one. She'd gotten to dress up, socialize, and even dance with him. It had been like Cinderella. However, just like Cinderella, the ball ended, and the next day was back to work. She had been professional. It was hard sometimes, because every year she'd fallen more in love with him. His touch could soothe or thrill depending on the moment. His rare smile made her melt. It was hopeless. She wasn't sure he wasn't asexual and had no sex drive at all. He kept his private life incredibly private. Anne had tried to make him jealous by dating others, yet he hadn't reacted. She sighed heavily. Today it was all over. Today she started to take back her life and hopefully have the family she'd always wanted. Only it wouldn't be with Michael. It went that bad, Ella asked. She signaled the waiter and ordered a lime margarita. He's clueless, Anne flushed. I said something really stupid. What? Elle asked gently. He asked if there was anything he could do, and I asked him if he could give me babies. 
You should have seen the look of shock on his face. What did he say? El leaned in. Nothing, Anne shrugged miserably. He said nothing. Did you tell him how you feel? It has to be an idiot not to know, Anne gulped down some of her slushy goodness. There's been a rumor going around the company for years that we've been having an affair. He's never even kissed me. He's the perfect gentleman. You say that like it's a curse. Elle thanked the waiter for her drink, and Anne ordered another one before the waiter could get away. Maybe you should slow down. I wish, just once, that company didn't have glass offices everywhere. I wish he would just have ripped off my clothes like in one of those steamy, trashy romance novels. Fifty Shades of Ramsley Corporate. Anne sighed and stirred her drink with a straw. I can't believe I've wasted twenty years. I'm forty. What if I have no good eggs left? What if I can't get pregnant? What if there are complications because I've left it for so long? What if I never want to have anyone's babies but Michael's? Those are a lot of questions, and I don't think you need to answer them all tonight. Elle grabbed a menu. Why don't we order something before you manage to get yourself stinking drunk? Jeanie slid into the booth. Sorry I'm late. I was very sorry to find out you had a personal family emergency, Anne. What? Anne looked at her in confusion. That's what Mr. Ramsley said. That you left early and wouldn't likely be in for a few days because you had a family emergency. Jeanie tried to flag down a waiter, but was unsuccessful. There is no family emergency. You know that, and I know that, but Mr. Ramsley didn't know that I knew you were resigning. I think he's going to try to sweet-talk you into coming back. This time Jeanie managed to get the waiter's attention. Three shots of Tennessee whiskey, plus two glasses of your best lager. Elle and Anne stared at her. What? I thought we were getting smashed tonight. Anne just did the hardest thing a woman could ever do. She broke up with the guy who doesn't even know she loves him. Jeanie gave them an innocent look. She is one of the most professional secretaries in the firm. But once she was off the clock, Jeanie was a firecracker. Something which very few people in the firm knew. Although... If he does come around begging you to come back, maybe you could ask him for passionate sex in exchange for returning to your job? Anne rolled her eyes. He's not going to go for that. At least ask him to be your baby, Daddy. You can get his squirmies in a cup down at the clinic and get them to inseminate you. Jeanie! Anne laughed, then sobered and wiped away a tear. I hope those shots of whiskey aren't for me. I can't stand hard liquor. Don't you worry. They're for me. My mama taught me how to drink. I can see I'm going to have to be the sensible one here. Elle reached over and squeezed Anne's hand. If there's anything no one I can do for you, let me know. Thank you, but I don't see that there's anything anyone can do. Anne sighed. He's simply oblivious. The waiter returned with a tray, and Anne's second daiquiri joined her first. Jeanie lined up her assortment of glasses, and they ordered appetizers. When the waiter left, Jeanie volunteered. I have a cousin. His name is Orville, but don't worry, nobody calls him that. We call him Magnum. He looks like Tom Selleck did in Magnum P.I. Anyhow, his girlfriend Judy left him, and if you'd like, I could set you up. No, please, no setups or blind dates yet, Anne protested. I'm not ready. You're the one who said her eggs aren't getting younger, Jeanie pointed out. He's a firefighter. Or, if you'd prefer, there's Holden. He's a detective for the police force. His wife, Dee Dee, died of cancer a couple years back. He's got three children, two girls and a boy, so you'd have a ready-made family. Can I just mourn the unrealistic dream that I had of being with Michael before we discussed new men? Anne asked. Absolutely, Elle raised her drink. To Anne, and starting over. They all raised their glasses to that. By the end of the evening, Elle made sure that Jeanie and Anne got home safely. As she walked the very drunk Anne through her apartment to bed, Anne lamented mournfully, "'Did you know there's a rumor going around the office that we're having an affair? It's been going around for years.' "'No one mentioned something about it. So did you, earlier at the bar. Here we are. Sit down.' Elle pulled off Anne's shoes and tipped her back onto the bed. "'You should get some sleep.' "'He's never even kissed me,' Anne groaned. Anne also groaned in the morning when daylight blinded her. Elle had left two pain pills and a bottle of water on the nightstand. Anne rummaged on the floor for her purse and pulled out her phone. There were no messages from Michael. 
She pressed a pillow over her head to drown out the light. Her head hurt. Chapter 2 His head hurt. Michael ignored the pain and pressed forward. He hadn't bothered to sleep. The legal team had swilled enough coffee to float an ocean liner, and the claimant deal was complete as it was going to get. So were several other important matters. He'd made the call to his lawyer after taking Anne's phone and address book. The new will was ready to be signed and witnessed today. The three temps had performed beautifully, making copies, getting coffee and snacks, generally just being impressively useful. However, it had taken three to do what Anne could do simply by herself. His Anne, who had quit. Michael shoved the thought away, along with confusing conversation about babies. There wasn't enough time. He'd scheduled an emergency board meeting for Thursday morning at six. Most in the board were unimpressed with the early hour, and some wondered if there was an issue with the Claymont acquisition. Michael didn't bother to explain. However, there was one important person that he needed there. When Michael had stepped into his father David's role as head of the company, David had handed over his controlling shares. As a result, Michael now had 31% of the vote. Noah had 10%. Max had 10%, but didn't know it. When Max had left the company, he had sold his shares. He had needed the money to supplement a fund that would pay for the medical fees of each child who had suffered because of a drug that the company had put into market. The drug was designed to help children with diabetes metabolize correctly. Instead, it had been pushed through too fast, and incorrect lab results had been created. The drug shut down kidneys and livers, causing death to hundreds of children. In court, the company had proven that the drug wasn't responsible for the issues these children were having. Michael knew that his father, David, had had a hand in the cover-up, and had vowed that under his tenure, as head of the company, it would never happen again. Max had felt responsible, and in the end had given literally everything he had, and everything he earned over the next six years to the fund to aid these families. To help Max start the fund, Michael had a fictitious company made up in Max's name to purchase the shares for him at a slightly above market value. The shares remained in Max's possession, only he didn't know about it. Now Michael needed his vote. So, right after the trip to the lawyer, Michael was in the car with the driver driving him to Paget Williams' apartment. He'd kept tabs on Max, just like his father had kept tabs on all of his sons, keeping a private investigator busy investigating their lives rather than just keeping in touch. There was a reason Michael had no personal life. He hadn't wanted his father to use it against him at any point in his career. Not that David hadn't tried. Now it was a habit, being isolated from everything and everyone but work. Michael regretted not being more involved in Max's life, but Noah had been there for their brother. Plus, it would have damaged his relationship with their father further after he had argued in favor of Max's solution. Michael had stood between David suing Max, his own son, over the entire matter. No one knew except Michael and David. Michael had also managed to quietly pull the drug off the market, citing legal concerns. It had been difficult and time-consuming, but it was the right thing to do. He admired Max's conviction and resolve. He admired the way Max could stand up for what was right, ignoring the consequences. Michael simply wasn't that man. He weighed the consequences continually. A car drew to a halt near a tired park. Everything was tired here. The buildings, the people... It was a shabby but neat neglect. Slowly the neighborhood was descending from its previous splendor perhaps forty or fifty years prior. Max lived here with his fiancée, Paget, a previous society girl who was widowed and down on her luck. Together they made a wonderful couple. They seemed to make each other happy if the P.I.'s reports and photos were correct. He knew that Noah and Elle had befriended the couple. Michael walked through the park, ignoring an old man who slept on the bench. At the apartment building entrance, he went to buzz the correct apartment when an old lady pushing a walker went through the door. Michael took the opportunity to simply enter. Max would be less likely to turn him down in person. It took only a few moments and two flights of stairs to reach Paget's apartment. Michael hesitated, drawing a deep, calming breath, and then knocked firmly. There was laughter from inside, and he could hear Max say, I'll get it in just a minute. The door swung open, and the two brothers stood face to face. Michael. 
It had been six years since they had spoken. Six years, two months, five days. Michael knew exactly when. It was little facts like this that made his mind a legal trap. Hello, Max. Paget pushed around Max to see who was at the door. It was obvious she was curious to see him, the brother who hadn't been in Max's life for so long. Hello, I'm Paget. Good manners had him shaking her proffered hand. Pleased to meet you. Won't you come in? she asked in return. Michael thanked her politely. The apartment was old and tired, but homey. He liked it despite its neglect and age. Mostly he liked it because it was much better than his brother sleeping in the parks on the street. You have a lovely home. Thank you, Paget gave him a tentative smile. She really was a pretty thing with her red hair and fair skin. Michael, why are you here? Max cut right to the heart of the matter, ignoring Paget's silent look telling him not to be rude. Michael liked her the more for it. Because I need you to do something for me. Max folded his arms. Michael knew that stubborn look. This likely wasn't going to go well. Why? Would you like to have a seat or something to drink? Paget offered, trying to diffuse the tension as a good hostess would. Michael offered her a small smile. Thank you for the offer, but it's unlikely that I'll be staying very long. What do you need, Michael? Max asked. He sighed. He hadn't expected this to be easy. As you know, I am now head of the company and director of the board since Dad's retirement. It means I have a controlling interest of 31%. Yes, and Noah has 10. What of it? There's going to be an important vote tomorrow morning. I need your vote, Max. Max shrugged. I don't have any shares. I can't help you. Michael took some paperwork out of his inside suit jacket pocket and offered it to Max. You have retained all of your shares. Max took the papers and scanned through them. This is a dummy company in my name. I created the company and put it in your name. Since you were determined to sell, it bought you out, and you've maintained ownership of the shares. I put in some extra funds to pay any income taxes on it, and had an accountant refile your taxes for you each year. Michael quietly explained, I didn't want you to get in trouble with the IRS. Why? Max asked, puzzled. Michael shrugged. You're my brother. You did this, using your money. Max sought clarification. Yes. Dad didn't know. If he had ever found out that I had put my money into your fund to help those affected by our company's mistake with that diabetic drug, I would have been fired, Michael said dryly. It was the truth. David could be ruthless. He was pretty sure David had never known. What is the vote for? Max folded up the papers and gently set them on the kitchen table. He grabbed a cup of coffee and handed it to Michael. It was a reconciliatory gesture. Michael took the coffee gratefully. He needed the caffeine. I'd rather not say. Come on, Michael. You can't just come in here asking for my vote, not tell me what it's for. Max was angry and disappointed. It's obvious you think that the other members of the board aren't going to like it, because you wouldn't be lobbying for votes otherwise. I need to know, because I'm not going in blind. Please, Max, Michael said. I need you there. I need you to vote with me. You'll hear the motion when everyone else does. I need you to second the nomination I put forward and vote with me. It's imperative that you do. The emergency meeting of the board is for six in the morning tomorrow. So early? What is so important? Max persisted. Michael set down the coffee. I know I haven't been a good brother to you for the past six years. I'm sorry for that. I should have done more to help you. I should have done a lot of things. He thought of Anne with regret. I will never be able to apologize enough. If you can make it to tomorrow's meeting, I will be eternally grateful. Max reluctantly took Michael's proffered hand. He knew that he wasn't going to get any more details. Michael turned to Paget and congratulated her on the ring. Max is a very lucky man. He took his leave of both of them and hoped he had said enough to convince Max. Max would come. Max would vote correctly. Michael tried to have faith, yet it was difficult under the circumstances. An ominous black floating cloud kept pace at the side of his vision and his head felt like the woodpeckers had been upgraded to jackhammers. He hadn't bothered to take any of the prescribed pain pills. One of the major side effects was drowsiness and possible confusion. He needed to be alert. 
would know a vote as Michael wanted him to. He didn't know. He wasn't going to ask. It would be better to simply surprise him along with the rest of the board. If Noah had time to think about the implications of what was about to take place, he'd fight it tooth and nail. Thirty minutes later, the car was outside a high-rise apartment building in a much classier side of town. Michael rubbed his tired eyes. He desperately wanted to sleep, but there was no time. He'd sleep during the surgery, which was looming ever closer. Walking to the front lobby, Michael selected the appropriate button and waited. Hello? Anne's melodious voice voted back to him. Anne, I'd like to talk to you if I could. It felt like a full minute passed before she buzzed him in. A short elevator ride, and he stood awkwardly outside her door before knocking. He could hear her release the security chain before opening the door. She stood before him in yoga gear, her hair down and her feet bare. He realized he had never seen her hair down. It reached just past her shoulder blades. It was gorgeous like her. I'm not coming back, she stated quietly. I'm not asking you to. He realized that was true. He hadn't come to ask her back, no matter how desperately he wanted her to. I want you to be happy, and if you're not happy at Ramsey Pharma, then you need to do what's best for you. She digested this for a moment. Then why did you come? You've been the best secretary that I've ever had. You've also been a good friend. Thank you. She waited patiently while he sorted his thoughts. I'd like to present you with a token of appreciation for your dedication and service to the company. I've put a package together to help you while you transition your life, he explained. He could see that she was getting annoyed and hurried to add, I hope that you'll accept it. Thank you, Michael, but it's not necessary. It is necessary, he insisted. Anne, I can never thank you enough for all that you've done for me. Please, accept this gift. She looked so disappointed rather like the time he had come to pick her up for their first social occasion outside of work. He explained it as a learning experience to get her to know the clients better, but he'd really wanted to show up the country club with her on his arm. She'd worn some frothy peach dress that had hugged her curves and showed it off with an expectant ta-da, and he'd stood there dumbstruck, unable to give voice or words to the vision that was before him. The moment had passed, and no matter how he had tried to compliment her after, it had fallen flat. She'd been very disappointed then, and he'd never been able to make it up to her. He had the feeling that he disappointed her a lot, and he wasn't sure why. Anne sighed. Fine. Okay. Good. I'll see you tomorrow morning at six o'clock in boardroom C. He quickly retreated. What? Wait? I thought you were going to give me this gift now, she called as he left. Boardroom C, six a.m., he called back over his shoulder as he walked briskly down the hall. She would come. Anne was too curious to do otherwise. Michael nearly smiled in satisfaction as he rode the elevator back to the ground floor. Now, to clean up a few other pieces before the big reveal in the morning, he ignored the black specter that rode the elevator with him. At precisely six in the morning, Anne made her way to boardroom C. She didn't want to delay this any longer than necessary. She'd settled on a braid, blouse, jeans, and ballet flats. She no longer worked at Ramsey Pharma, therefore she didn't feel the need to dress formally. Inside the boardroom, the board of controlling share members were gathered, and Anne halted. Michael must have made a mistake. She'd never been invited to a board meeting. Secretaries didn't attend such meetings. She didn't see Michael in the boardroom, so she turned around to go to Michael's office and bumped into someone. Taking a step back, she was surprised to see Maxwell Ramsley. Anne. Wow, it's good to see you. It's been a long time. Max smiled boyishly down at her. You look good. Casual, but good. Thanks. You look good, too. How have you been? She was surprised that Max was in the building. As far as she knew, he and Michael were still estranged. Curiosity bubbled up. What was Max doing here? Great. I've met an amazing, beautiful woman who has agreed to help me retire my bachelor life. Can I send you an invite to the wedding? he asked. Anne blinked. The playboy had fallen hard. She was interested to see the woman who had managed it. Sure, I like that. Noah came walking down the corridor, sipping a coffee. When he spotted Anne and Max, he paused in surprise before coming over to them. Max, is there something going on that I should know about? I'm here at Michael's request, Max explained. I take it you're in the dark about this board meeting, too? Why would Michael need you at a board meeting? 
Noah got right to the point. You'll find out soon enough. Michael came up behind Anne and laid his hands on her shoulders. He steered her in front of him into the boardroom. Michael, I don't think I'm supposed to be here, Anne whispered. It's fine. There's a seat right here for you. Michael pulled out a chair and gently pushed her into it. Max and Noah sat down as well, and there were some murmurs of surprise and recognition from other board members as they saw Max. Michael cleared his throat, standing at the head of the table. Thank everyone for coming out to this emergency meeting so early in the morning. I have two items to table today, so this meeting should be very brief. Before I do, I'd like to welcome Max back to the director's meetings. As you all know, Max is still a shareholder of this company. There was a pause to acknowledge this before Michael continued. First, I'd like to thank Ann Schaefer for her years of service and dedication to this company. She's been and continues to be an outstanding member of the team. In recognition of her achievements, I'd like to transfer all my controlling shares to Miss Schaefer. There was a shocked silence. Michael owned the most controlling shares. The net financial worth of the shares was huge. The direct sway for a vote in the company was the envy of many of the board members. To give all of his shares to a secretary? Unheard of. You can't be serious, Ozit said, sputtering. Michael, maybe you should think this through, Gaines tried to reason. Anne sat there dumbfounded. I need someone to second my motion. Michael looked directly at Max. Please. Max didn't have to ask Michael if this was what he wanted. He knew. Even though they had been estranged from each other for six long years, Max knew that Michael would never ask for something like this, something this major for the company and for himself, unless he had thought it out completely. He didn't understand why Michael would do this, but he would support him. I second the motion. What? Noah exploded. Michael, really? Michael cleared his throat and held up a hand. Put to a vote to transfer the shares. I'll say A. A. A, replied Max, putting up his hand. This is a farce, Ozit said. I don't care how good she is in bed. You can't just transfer your shares to her. All three Ramsleys glared at Ozit. Anne blushed, feeling mortified. Noah, Michael asked softly. If this is what you really want, he shook his head, obviously disagreeing. But family loyalty had him raise his hand. A. Hey. Michael took in a steadying breath. Motion stands and passes for the vote. Let the record state this. Next, I'd like to talk about a resignation. I don't accept the shares, Anne stood suddenly. Michael, you can't do this. It's already legally done. Michael took out a pen and signed his name on a document that was in front of him. He handed it to Deagle to be witnessed. The shares are in your name. To be a controlling board member, you have to be a member of the company in good standing. I resigned three days ago, Anne reminded him. I refused your resignation, he said simply. Excuse me? Anne couldn't believe what she was hearing. As your boss, I have the right to refuse your resignation. I refused it, Michael explained. Miss Schaefer, you're still an employee of this company in good standing. I, however, am not. Effective immediately, I am tendering my resignation. I'd like to recommend Gaines as my replacement as head of the company and director of the board. I'd like to recommend Deagle as my replacement for head of the legal department. An alarm beeped on Michael's cell phone. He shut it off, and Deagle began handing out copies of Michael's resignation letter. There was a buzz of noise as the men exclaimed over the resignation. Noah turned to Max, asking if he had any idea that this was about to happen. Anne watched as Michael quietly left the room. No one seemed to notice. She grabbed her purse and walked quickly after him. He turned off the normal route by passing his office where all his personal effects had already been removed and shipped to the beach house. He went down a secondary staircase, grabbing an overnight bag that had been left in the stairwell. Michael? she asked. He paused and let her catch up. What is going on? Why are you doing this? This company has been your whole life. You can't just resign. You did, he said simply. Anne stared at him, speechless. Please keep walking. I have some place I need to be. Michael turned and kept going down the stairs. Where do you have to be? What could be more important than what just happened back there in the boardroom? Anne hurried to catch up to him. If we go back, maybe you can tell them this was a joke or something. We could undo the damage and you can get your position back. That's not going to happen. Michael pushed open a side door. 
Outside, the car was waiting. The driver took his overnight bag and placed it in the trunk. Michael turned to face Anne. He didn't want to apologize for what had happened, and he didn't want to talk about it any more. Mostly, he just wanted to hug her and never let her go, but of course he couldn't do that. Almost without his violation, his hands came up to cup her face. He swallowed thickly. Goodbye, Anne. She stared up at him, confused and a little afraid. Michael dropped his hands and got into the waiting car. The driver shut the door and got into the front seat. Suddenly, the door was opened by Anne. Move over. Anne, I really need to be leaving, he tried to explain. You're not going to move over, are you? she said crisply. Anne! He jerked slightly as she crawled over him and sat beside him. I don't know where you're going, but I'm coming with. Anne, he closed his eyes, please leave. No. Mr. Ramsley, we need to be going if we're going to get there on time, the driver gently reminded him. Michael sighed. Anne? No. She reached across him and shut the door before telling the driver, please continue to wherever you're scheduled to take Mr. Ramsley. Anne, please don't do this. Michael feared his voice was slightly tinged with desperation. The car had started moving, driving toward the hospital. Tell me what is going on. Tell me where you're going and why, Anne insisted stubbornly. How could he? How could he tell her that today he was probably going to die? And if by some quirk of fate he didn't die, that he was going to be damaged, changed in a horrible and irreversible way? That was, if things went to plan, best-case scenario. If it didn't, he could be a vegetable wishing he was dead for the rest of his life. He'd taken the time to read the list of everything that could possibly go wrong, and none of it was pleasant. How did anyone say such news? He swallowed hard and looked out the window at the passing city, going about its daily business without care. Then her fingers threaded through his, holding his hand. He didn't dare look at her for fear of what he might do, but his hand tightened in hers and he was thankful for the small comfort that she offered. The ride to the hospital was all too short. The driver held the door and Michael helped Anne out of the car. Once he had his overnight bag, Michael led Anne through the maze of corridors to the surgical admitting area. She continued to hold his hand and was mercifully silent. Name? The clerk behind the glass looked up at him. Michael David Ramsley. She looked at her list. The doctor's office sent over your paperwork already. Can you please tell me why you're here? For surgery, you said dryly. What kind of surgery are you having today? She sighed. It's standard that we ask. Dr. Hammond is removing two masses from my brain, Michael replied. He could feel Anne stiffen beside him. And who is this? The clerk looked at Anne. This is Anne. Will she be with you in the ward before and after surgery? Yes, Anne said firmly. Her other hand crept around and held onto his arm tightly. Yes, I will. Thank you. Please wait in the waiting room across the hall. A nurse will be with you shortly. They turned and went to the waiting room. It was full of uncomfortable chairs. Michael picked one at random and sat down, Anne sitting beside him. She kept their hands clasped and her other hand on his arm leaning against him. He welcomed her warmth. The television was on some show meant for toddlers, and the magazines in the corner were predominantly about home decor. Michael didn't care. Anne was there, and that was all that mattered. Why didn't you say anything? she whispered. Remember the day you resigned? I had an appointment with Dr. Reynolds. Michael stared down at their joined hands. She nodded. That was when I found out. And they need to do the surgery so quickly? she asked, alarmed. Yes. He turned her and covered her other hand with his free one. And I want to apologize for anything I might have done to disappoint you. I want you to understand that all I want for you is to be happy. You're a smart, beautiful woman, and you deserve everything your heart desires. Michael? Suddenly she was very afraid. How risky is this surgery? Michael Ramsley? A nurse asked in the doorway. He stood and picked up the overnight bag. Anne quickly stood beside him. Mr. Ramsley, if you'll just follow me. He did, with Anne beside him. The nurse brought him to a room full of gurney-type beds. She pulled on a sheet that hung from the ceiling to create a feeling of privacy. She showed him the washroom, the cupboard to put his things, the hospital gown on the bed. He was to get changed and then sit on the bed. A nurse would be along shortly to put an IV into his arm in preparation for the surgery. He was to be the first patient of the day. 
The nurse closed the curtain as she left. There was a chair by the bed for Anne to sit in. Michael picked up the hospital gown. I suppose I had better get changed. Anne nodded and let go of his arm. It took only a few minutes in the washroom to strip and then put on the gown. He felt ridiculous wearing only it. Put his clothes, watch, and wallet carefully in the overnight bag and then put it in his shoes in the closet where the nurse had shown him. Sat on the bed waiting. Anne was perched in the chair, nervously playing with her purse strap. A cheery nurse, little more than a teenager, came and inserted the IV. She was very good. He hardly felt it. Or perhaps because he was used to so much pain already, a simple needle didn't register with him any more. She returned with an electric shaver. She explained that it would be easiest if Michael's entire head was shaved. Would he prefer to do it? If not, she could. I will, Anne volunteered. Michael wondered if it made her feel better to have something to do. They ended up in the washroom, he in the chair with her with the shaver, and a couple of towels around his shoulders. She hesitated. I can do this if you don't want to, he looked up at her. I just feel like if I don't shave your head, then none of this needs to happen. She gently pushed her fingers through his hair. It needs to happen. There are two tumors in my head that need to come out. That's why you've been having so many headaches lately. You've always had the migraines, but they're worse now. Yes. He didn't bother to tell her about the hallucinations. There was little point. Hopefully they would be gone when he woke up. If he woke up. Anne nodded and clicked on the shaver. Soon all of his hair was on the floor. Catching his reflection in the mirror, he thought he didn't look like himself. Perhaps he should have specified closed casket for the funeral. He'd prepaid for one and all the details had been seen to. Anne removed the towels that had been thoughtfully provided to protect the hospital gown from the hair. The young nurse knocked on the doorframe. They're ready for you now, Mr. Ramsley. He didn't feel ready for them. He turned to Anne. He had no idea what to say, but suddenly she was in his arms, hugging him. For a moment he hugged her back, trying to memorize the feel of her, her smell, this moment. It's going to be all right, he lied. He had no idea. Anne nodded and let him go. All too soon he was in the bed, blanket over his legs. The little efficient nurse pulled up the bed rails and released the brakes. She promised Anne that she would take good care of him as she pulled and pushed his bed down the corridor. He felt silly in bed while his petite young nurse wheeled him around. Keeping up a cheery, steady chatter about the weather, the awful food in the cafeteria, how she woke up and found out her son had glued Cheerios to her forehead this morning before her shift for the hospital. She pointed to her forehead. Tell me truthfully, do I still have glue? Despite himself, Michael smiled. No. That's a relief. She grinned and tapped a button on the wall with her foot, and a door began to automatically open. Well, Mr. Ramsley, I'm sorry, but I have to hand you over to the OR nurses. I'll see you when you get back out of surgery. Will you check on Anne while I'm in surgery? He asked suddenly. Sure. You and your wife are so sweet. The two other nurses came to wheel him into the room, and he didn't bother to correct the young nurse as she bounced away, humming a tune. Good morning, Mr. Ramsley. The nurses had him transfer himself to the other bed. They were older, more serious about their job. He was made comfortable as he could be under the circumstances. Then the anesthesiologist came and explained how they are going to put him to sleep during the operation. He put the mask over Michael's face and asked questions. What do you like to do? Sailing, jogging, reading, Michael answered by rote. Suddenly he added, I write. He never told anyone that he wrote. What do you write? Poetry, children's stories. My brothers are ten and twelve years younger than me. I used to write them stories. I've journaled for years. I couldn't remember what else he said, but it seemed like moments later before someone was calling his name. Michael felt confused as he focused on the nurse. Michael, on a scale of one to ten, how bad is your pain? she asked. Pain, he repeated. He meant to say eight, perhaps even a nine. Pain. One to ten. Pick a number, ten being the worst. She was annoying. Perhaps he should say nine. His head did hurt rather badly. Pain. Pain. Suddenly the noise in the operating room stilled. Dr. Hemmen came over and asked in heavily accented English, Michael, tell me your name and address. Pain. Fruit pain. Michael listened to the words tumble out of his mouth and the truth dawned on him. It had happened. He couldn't speak the right words at the right time. 
he wouldn't be able to read, he wouldn't be able to write. Shock followed by desolation filled him as he closed his eyes. What had Dr. Reynolds called it? Speech aphasia. Let's get him a sedative, Dr. Hemmond said, and shortly the world fell away again. Chapter 3 There was a clock ticking loudly. His head didn't really hurt, so strangely enough, Michael didn't mind. He lay there listening to the clock, sorting through his memories of the last few moments that he could recall. He couldn't speak. Not properly, anyways. He might as well be mute. He took a deep breath and let it out gustily. He wasn't sure how to handle this. Instantly a hand was holding his and another hand had found its way to his cheek. He turned his head to see Anne smiling at him. Hi, sleepyhead. How do you feel? He was thirsty. His throat felt like it was swallowing rocks. His head barely hurt, but he suspected that was the drugs. He could see, and there was no ominous floating dark clouds around. He was grateful she was there. What could he say? He squeezed her hand instead. Are you in any pain? He shook his head no. It was insignificant. Would you like some water? He nodded his head, and she helped him sit up. Drinking from the straw was like sucking down cut glass. He winced. Michael motioned for her to return the water to the side table. Leaning back, he watched her. Dr. Hemond was by. He said that everything went as well as it could during the surgery. She looked down at their joined hands, and he realized that she knew. She knew about his mixing up words. The doctor had probably explained it to her. He swallowed thickly and instantly regretted it, his throat raw. He stared up at the ceiling. He was permanently damaged. Noah keeps calling. I shut your phone off because everyone from the board was calling, but Noah's now calling my cell. He left a few voice messages. Michael didn't really care about the board. I think we should tell him where you are, Anne said softly. Michael looked at her sharply. He wasn't certain he wanted Noah to know just yet. He felt like he needed some time to assimilate what had happened before it was shared. Both he and Max deserve to know. They are your brothers. He hoped it was sympathy and not pity in her eyes. Michael didn't want anyone's pity. He looked at Anne again. It wasn't fair to expect her to stay. At some point, Noah and Max would have to learn the truth. Perhaps it was best that they did know. Then Anne could go if that's what she wanted to do. He wanted her to stay, though. Her presence was comforting. Conflicted, he nodded, giving her permission. Anne rummaged around in her purse and came up with her cell phone. She dialed up Noah's number and put him on speaker so that Michael could hear the conversation. Anne, where is he? Noah sounded agitated. Is he with you? Yes, Anne barely got to say the word before Noah interrupted. What on earth was he thinking? Noah exploded. The board is in turmoil. If this gets leaked to the press, the stocks are going to dip. He's put the company in a bad place. Why would he quit? He's always wanted to be head of the company. Actually, his father had wanted him to be head of the company. Michael had simply done what he'd been told to do. He wasn't sure that he'd ever really wanted the position, now that he'd come to think about it. Head of the legal department had been challenging, interesting. Head of the entire company? Daunting. Put him on the phone. I can't, Anne said calmly. Excuse me? Is he refusing to speak to me? If he's doing that silent I-know-better-than-you routine, you can tell him where to put it. He left me with this mess, and he knows I hate the politics of the board. I am a simple scientist who likes being in charge of the labs. He can't stick me with any of this. None of it was supposed to be my responsibility. Michael was confused. What responsibility? Anne saw his expression and understood. Who is trying to stick you with responsibility, Noah? The board. They're deciding between Gaines and I to run the company. Something about having a Ramsley in charge for the past sixty years. Tradition is important to shareholders and the business community. Blah, blah, blah. Noah took a deep breath. I'd like to talk to him, Anne. He's on speaker. Michael? You need to come back, Noah sounded exhausted. I can't do this. Michael stared at Anne. He felt impotent. There was nothing he could do. There was nothing he could say. Noah, we're at the hospital. Anne kept his gaze and took his hand in hers again. Michael just had surgery. What? Noah asked. What? 
A second voice came on the line. Anne smiled for a moment. Hi, Max. We're both in the conference room. No one else is here. Did you say surgery? Max asked. Yes, Anne replied. For what? Anne bit her lip, then steadily replied. They found a mass in his brain. Two masses, actually. The surgeon took them out this morning. Michael wondered what time it was. He looked at his wrist automatically, but his watch wasn't there. He supposed it really didn't matter. Anne saw what he was about and showed him hers. It was one of those digital Fitbit things. The numbers were mixed up. There was no way there were ninety-eight minutes in an hour. Michael looked at it in confusion before gently letting go of her wrist. Cancer? Noah asked. Anne looked at Michael. She didn't know. Michael shrugged. He didn't know. They would have to wait for the test results to come back. He doesn't know yet. Is he okay? Max inquired. There was a long pause before Max repeated the question. Michael certainly didn't have an answer for that one either. He and Anne stared at each other. He's going to be okay, Anne said shakily. She pulled her hand out of his and wiped a tear from her face. I have to go. And what? She clicked the end button, and then shut off her phone before tossing it back into her purse. She took a deep breath, trying to compose herself. Oh, Michael. He slowly sat up and held out a hand to her. He ignored the dizziness and nausea. She took his hand and sat on the bed with him. She hugged him, resting her head on his collarbone under his chin. He wished that she'd stay there forever. Dr. Hammond has given me a list of all these complications that could happen. Strokes, aneurysms, seizures, infection from the surgery. The mask could be cancer. She sniffed. Don't you dare die. Michael held her a little tighter. The ticking sound drew his attention to the wall, and he saw an analog clock. He might not know if it was morning or afternoon, but he could read this clock. It was five, either a.m. or p.m. For a moment he felt a little better. Then he saw a chart on the wall, and none of it made any sense. There was his name, Michael, he recognized. After that, there were words written like they had been picked at random. Letters weren't in order. He tried to reread his name, but now it was a mess as well. Maybe it wasn't his name after all written there. How could he be certain? Maybe his mind had played a trick on him. A ball of despair filled his stomach. Anne leaned back, looking at his face. Michael, what is it? She asked softly, sensing something was wrong. He gestured to the wall, the chart mocking him. The chart? At his nod, she began to read it. It says your doctor is Dr. Heaven, your nurse is Kelly, that you've had brain surgery to remove two masses, that you're not to have any solids yet. She trailed off as he gulped in air. He couldn't read it. He could see it perfectly, but he couldn't read it. If he couldn't read, he couldn't write. He'd written every single day since he'd learned how. He couldn't imagine not writing. An understanding of what he had truly lost grew darkly. He buried his aching head in her shoulder, and the shattering sobs came. He'd rather have the pounding migraines back with the dark specters chasing whomever they wished. He could hear the nurses come in. She placed a hand on his shoulder and talked to Anne, her voice full of sympathy. I'm going to get Mr. Ransley a sedative to help him rest. Michael felt Anne nod, and he could hear the squeak of the nurse's shoes as she left. He was exhausted. He slumped against Anne, wiping his eyes, and soon enough the little nurse returned. He assumed her name was Kelly. It said so on the board, according to Anne. She helped Anne settle him back on the pillows. She held up a pill and the water. He would have told her that it hurt too much to swallow, but he had no words, so he simply took the pill and swallowed it with the water. He leaned back and closed his eyes, wishing the nightmare was over. Kelly took Anne outside of the room, and he could hear them discussing him. Something about speech therapy to find different ways to communicate around his new disability. Therapy or counseling for the likely depression that he might experience over the loss of being able to communicate effectively. He wanted to say that he could hear them. He wanted to say that his mind wasn't deficient in understanding exactly what was going on. He wanted to say that he was still here. Of course, he said nothing at all. Anne listened to the nurse and thanked her for the pamphlets. She would add them to the growing number of papers in her purse. For some reason, everyone seemed to assume that she was his wife or long-term girlfriend. Anne did not dissuade them. It was easier to get admittance to Michael this way. Kelly hesitated. 
Perhaps while he's sleeping you'd like to have something to eat? Run a few errands? Go home and relax? He'll be asleep for six hours or more, likely, which will give you some time to recharge. Thank you, but I think his brothers will be here soon, Anne replied. She knew that Noah and Max would figure out which hospital Michael had been admitted to pretty quickly and were no doubt on their way. Okay, Kelly gave her a supportive smile. Remember, we'd like to limit them to visiting one at a time and only for fifteen minutes each. It'd be best not to tax Mr. Ramsley too much right now. Anne nodded. She got a coffee and something from the vending machine before heading back to Michael's room. It was a good thing everyone thought she was his significant other. She'd never have such access to him otherwise. Michael was peacefully sleeping, and she was thankful. When he'd started crying, it had frightened her badly. This was her Michael. Unflappable, patient, strong. She'd never seen him shaken by anything. He couldn't read. He couldn't speak. She sat down and looked at the pamphlets. She'd be depressed, too, if she couldn't talk to people. She put the pamphlets away and looked at her phone. Jeanie had called. Anne called her back. Anne, could you hold on a moment? Sure. Anne sipped her coffee and looked at Michael. He looked exhausted even as he slept. The white bandage around his head wasn't doing him any favors, either. I'm in the bathroom. I'm just checking the stalls. No one is here. She could picture Jeanie leaning with a hip against the counter in the ladies' room of the company. It is just a crazy mess here. Everyone has heard about Mr. Ramsley transferring his shares to you and resigning. Ozit is threatening to sue, but I talked to Deagle, and he says there's no case. Mr. Ramsley and he made sure of that when they did up all the contracts of transferal. Mr. Noah Ramsley looks like he wants to pull out his own hair and those of everyone around him. I don't blame the poor man. They're like to make him head of the board just because his last name, and we all know that's not what he wants. Mr. Maxwell was trying to calm everyone down, but it's hard with Ozit whipping them into a frenzy. Finally, both the Ramsley brothers left, and Gaines is trying to get everyone back to work. He's not having much luck. Where did you and Michael go? Has he finally swept you off your feet? Anne gave a watery sigh. Oh, Jeanie. Oh, dear. Jeanie knew that tone. What is it? You can't tell anyone. Anne trusted Jeanie. They had been working friends for ages, but Jeanie did like to gossip. I mean it. If I tell you this, it goes absolutely no further. I would consider it a betrayal of our friendship. Hey, did I say a word about how you've got the hots for the boss? Jeanie was a little offended. I can keep a secret. Anne took a deep breath and plunged in. He can't speak properly. He can't read. Jeanie, I don't know what he's going to do. Jeanie absorbed this for a moment. Anne, are you okay? We are talking about the same Michael Ramsley, right? He had surgery this morning to remove a couple of tumors in his brain, Anne explained. His brain has been damaged during the surgery. Oh, my, Jeanie breathed. Is he going to be okay, though? Other than the language thing, he seems all right, Anne replied. Now she was worried that there might be other side effects that they didn't know about yet. It was scary enough, all the other things that could go wrong. She was petrified that she was going to lose him. Two days ago, she'd finally been able to walk out of his life, and now she couldn't imagine leaving. The language. Not being able to read? Is that temporary? Suddenly Jeanie said, Excuse me, this bathroom is out of order. Use the one on the next floor. Anne waited until Jeanie said the bathroom was empty again. It's permanent. Is that why he resigned? Jeanie was quick on the uptake. He knew this could happen, didn't he? I think so. Anne could hear voices in the hall. Jeanie, I've got to go. Okay, you need anything, you call me, okay? Thanks. Anne ended the call and went into the hall to find Noah and Max talking to the nurse at the nurse's station. Max saw her first. He came over and gave her a hug, which she reflected must be a statement as to her level of exhaustion. She must look a complete wreck. Max had always been the more affectionate of all the brothers, but she hadn't seen him in six years. It was unlikely he was giving out free hugs to her unless she looked like she really needed one. "'Where is he?' Noah asked. "'You can see him, one at a time, for fifteen minutes. He's sleeping right now,' and pushed back the hair that had come out of her braid. "'How did this happen? Why didn't he tell us?' Noah ran a hand through his hair, frustrated. "'He only found out a few days ago,' Anne said softly. "'Don't defend him, Anne. He should have told us.' 
"'Yes, Noah, he should have,' Anne said sharply. "'He should have told her, too. "'Instead, he had tried to be strong and independent as always, "'not wanting to bother anyone, probably. "'It would be hard to understand his motives "'since he couldn't articulate them any more. "'Yet it was something that he would do, "'keeping his pain and uncertainty to himself. "'Michael simply didn't share his own vulnerabilities, "'not because he thought it would make him weak, "'but because he didn't want to impose on others.' I know you're hurt by his actions, but he's just been through surgery, and I'll thank you to calm down or not see him at all. Noah looked at her in surprise. Anne had never been short with him before. Max put a hand on Noah's shoulder and said, I'll go first so Noah can reorganize his thoughts. Where will you be in the meanwhile? There's a waiting room right down the hall, she pointed to it. It had become her home while she waited during the surgery. She'd read every single magazine cover to cover. I'll be there. Noah followed her to the waiting room, and they both sat in silence for a few minutes before he said, I'm sorry, Anne. I shouldn't have taken my anger out on you. Anne sighed. He didn't tell me about the surgery, either. I literally got in the car as it was leaving the company yesterday morning and refused to budge. I found out when we arrived at the hospital. Noah stared at her for a moment. He was going to go through with this, the whole thing, alone? "'I guess so,' she shrugged. "'I talked to the doctor. "'It was unlikely that he was going to survive the surgery. "'Maybe he thought he'd just spare us all the worry. "'They thought he was going to die?' "'Noah was shocked. "'Anne nodded. "'The odds weren't good. "'It was brain surgery. "'Have you been here the whole time?' Noah asked. "'Yes. "'All twenty-seven excruciating hours. "'She felt incredibly fatigued.' Even the naps she had taken in the chair beside the bed weren't really enough. You should go home. No. Anne opened her eyes, which had been drooping. Max and I can see to things here, Noah insisted. We'll look after him. He's our brother. No, he's my... Anne trailed off. What was he? Her boss? Her friend? She had about to say her Michael, but he wasn't. Yet instinctively she knew that Michael would never have cried on Noah or Max's shoulder. He was hers, even if he would never admit it. I'm staying. He asked me to stay. She neglected to mention that Michael had been asking her to stay when she was quitting the company, not at the hospital. But today he'd held her hand like he didn't want her to go. That was enough. Can I get Elle to bring you some clothes and whatever else you need? Noah asked. Please, Anne said. I would appreciate that. Max came into the room and slumped into a chair. He rubbed his face. Your turn. Noah left, and Anne watched Max as he struggled with what he wanted to say with some sympathy. It's difficult. Max gave a bitter laugh. You have no idea. I haven't seen Michael for six years except at Noah's wedding and the twins' baptism. He barely spoke to me. Then he turns up with an apology and angling for a vote, which I thought made no sense, but hey, it's what he wanted, and who am I to judge? Then he disappears and has brain surgery. He looks like death warmed over. Anne nodded, and that was all Max needed to continue. He's my big brother. He's twelve years older than me, and other than migraines, I don't remember him ever being sick a day in his life. He used to give me advice. He taught me how to swim. I've looked up to him for years. Did you know Dad was going to sue me over the medical fund for over those kids? No. Anne was surprised. Michael had never said anything. He was. Max moved his hands expressively as he talked. Gaines told me this morning. Michael convinced Dad not to. Michael also bought out my shares. That I knew about. She'd helped set up the dummy company. It had been quite the operation. It was one of the many things she admired about Michael. He did so many things for other people and never sought any credit. Really? Max ran a hand through his hair, making Anne smile. Both Noah and Max had the habit, which Michael never did. Michael never seemed to be frustrated over anything. Perhaps that would change now, she reflected. He needs a shave. What? Anne drew her brain away from the musings to try to listen. He needs a shave, Max repeated. I've never seen him not shaved. Anne hadn't either. She personally thought that if he didn't look like death half warmed over, as Max put it, Michael might make the five o'clock shadow look very sexy. Max, he's going to be okay. Anne hoped desperately that was true. You didn't sound so sure of that on the phone earlier, Max pointed out. She took a deep breath. 
there has been some residual brain damage from the surgery. Brain damage? Max stared at her in shock. It wasn't unexpected, she said. You mean they deliberately damaged his brain? Max stood abruptly. I'm going to sue. Max! Anne jumped to her feet. It was necessary to hurt the brain to get the tumors out. If they hadn't gotten them out, he would have died. What's wrong with him? What did they do to him? Max was upset. Anne tried not to cry as she rifled through her purse, finding the right sheet. Here. It's called speech aphasia. This pamphlet explains it better than I can. Max took the sheet and began reading it. Noah came back into the room, pale and all the anger out of him. He gave Anne another hug. Anne, I really am sorry. She nodded and let him go. She gave him a key. If you can get Elle to go to my apartment, I'll text her a list of what I need. Sure thing. Noah looked at Max. What is that? Max handed over the pamphlet to Noah, who began reading. Anne reached out to lay a sympathetic hand on Max's arm, but he shook his head and walked a short distance away, struggling with his emotions. "'What is this?' Noah asked, holding up the pamphlet. "'Michael is—' She didn't want to use the word disabled. He wasn't. Not in her mind. Michael has that condition. "'No.' Noah shook his head in denial. "'Not Michael. He's smart. He's got a mind like a trap when it comes to legalities.' He can go through a contract in minutes and pick out any defects. He gives speeches and leads meetings. No, this isn't happening. Noah, Max said sharply. He can't read the chart in his room. He tried and he can't, Anne's voice wobbled. I haven't heard him speak a single word since the surgery. Noah abruptly sat in the chair and put his head in his hands. Max swore and kicked a chair. They may have been estranged for six years, but he loved his brother. Is there anything that can be done? Therapists? More surgery to repair the damage? Anything? Anne wiped away another tear and shook her head. No. The nurse said we could set up appointments with a speech therapist, but it won't be for getting him to talk again. It will be for figuring out other ways to communicate. You mean like sign language? Max asked. That won't work. Any alphabet-based program won't work, Anne shrugged. The letters are getting mixed up in his mind. She was talking more like picture cards? Picture cards? Noah said in disgust. Anne turned on him angrily. We will do whatever helps him. Do you understand? If picture cards can help him communicate, then that's what he will get. Noah closed his eyes, ashamed. I'm sorry, Anne. She blew out a large breath, trying to calm down. Anne, is there something we should know? Max gently laid a hand on her shoulder. What do you mean? she asked tiredly. Well, you are really upset. And? she wished he would get to the point. Max searched for the right words. I know that Michael has always been an intensely private man. I also know about those rumors that went around the company from time to time about the both of you. Are the two of you involved? She stared at him. No. She looked at Noah, who was looking thoughtfully at her. I have been his secretary for twenty-two years. It's a long time to work with someone. I respect him. He's my boss. We've become friends. She tried to explain and looked back at Max, who looked at her with pity. Noah looked at Max. He wasn't convinced of what she had just said, but he also didn't know about her feelings like Max had just figured them out. Excuse me, I need to check on Michael. What she really needed was to escape. She headed down the corridor and ducked into the chapel. Maybe it was best. She needed to pray that Max wouldn't open his big mouth and tell his brothers about her feelings. Chapter 4 Michael could feel reality intruding. His head was thumping. Less than woodpeckers. Perhaps little gnomes with clogs on, stomping and dancing around. They were having a party, and he certainly didn't feel very festive. He raised a hand to his head, feeling the bandage, and it all came flooding back. With a sigh, he lowered his hand. "'You missed your brother's visiting?' Kelly chirped. She wrapped a blood pressure cuff around his upper arm and proceeded to strangle it mercilessly. "'The three of you are quite handsome.' Michael opened his eyes to see her smile down at him. "'Ready for some pain meds?' He nodded gratefully and the room spun. "'Dizzy?' He gave her a much shorter nod. "'The doctor said that could happen. Here, 
I'll lift the head of the bed, and then you can sit up a little better. She stepped on a pedal, and the bed obeyed her command. He downed the pills that she gave him. Thankfully, his throat was feeling improved, so it only felt like he was swallowing gravel rather than cut glass. Now, I'm going to check with the nurses, but I think you have a scan coming up to see how the swelling of your brain is doing. The sooner the swelling goes down, the sooner we'll know how your pain is going to be. He had liked her before, but now she was far too cheery. She really needed to tone it down. What had she said about the pain? He tried to focus. Ah, yes. One of the side effects of the surgery is that the doctors couldn't promise that the pain would go entirely away. Even now, it was better than it had been for the past few months, so Michael supposed it was an improvement. At least he hadn't seen any black things floating around lately. He wondered where Anne was. He wondered what Noah and Max had thought about the ghastly turban on his head. It felt huge. He poked at it a moment, then decided he didn't want to accidentally remove it and find out if his brains were leaking out. He sat on his hands to prevent them from exploring on their own. A few minutes later, Kelly was back and took him in his bed to push around the corridors once more. This time, he closed his eyes and tried to breathe evenly. The dizziness hit him, and of course, he couldn't manage to say a word about it. It was like a bad carnival ride. The good news was that he didn't disgrace himself by puking, or retching, really, since his stomach was empty other than pills and water. He endured scans of his head, a machine clicking and whirring around him. Eventually, he got a repeat ride back to the private room that was his for the duration of his stay. He desperately hoped the dizziness would go away. He was not going to be confined to a bed or chair for the rest of his life. Vertigo was not going to become his constant friend, he vowed. Dr. Hemond came in smiling. He pulled up the chair and sat down. "'Good news, Mr. Ramsley. The lab results have come back for the tumors. Both were non-cancerous. This means that you will not require any chemotherapy or radiation. We'll have to schedule regular scans to make sure that no cells were forgotten or that new ones decide to grow again, but I feel confident that this will not be the case. Michael felt relieved. He had no desire to be a cancer patient or to go through surgery ever again. I've checked today's scans, and the swelling is going down very well. How is your pain today when you woke up before medications? Dr. Hemon began counting, and Michael nodded at six. Better than yesterday. Good, good. Hemon made a note on his sheet. I think things are going very well. There's no sign of infection. Everything is going the best it possibly can. Part of Michael wanted to protest that. Losing the ability to effectively communicate was not the best that things could be. However, he was sure there could be worse alternatives. He could be dead. We'll keep you here and see how the skull fuses. In the meanwhile, has the dizziness decreased? Michael indicated that it hadn't really changed using a grimace and hand gesture. Let me know if it gets worse. Hopefully, as the swelling decreases, the dizziness will disappear as well. Dr. Hemon put his pen back in his lab coat pocket. Do you have any questions? Michael shook his head no. It wasn't like he could articulate even if he had any. Mostly, he just wanted to know when he could go home. Not to the downtown condo, but to the beach house. That's where he wanted to be right now. Sitting on the deck and listening to the waves. Dr. Hemon took his leave, and Michael stared at the ceiling. Besides sleep, he wondered what he was going to do in the hospital if no one was around. Michael had never really been bored before, and it wasn't the most pleasant sensation. What was he going to do with the rest of his life? There were no more 12- to 18-hour days at the office, no more presentations or meetings. It was kind of a relief, but also concerning. He really didn't know what was going to take up his time now. He'd have to take up some sort of work or hobby. Anne came in, and she looked entirely worn out. She had never been so beautiful to him. She plopped into the chair beside the bed and watched him. He watched her in return. He wanted to tell her what Dr. Hemond had said. He wanted to ask how Max and Noah had taken the sight of him, if they had made jokes about the turban bandage. He really wanted to know if he could change into sweats he had brought along instead of being this silly hospital gown. He wanted to urge her to get some sleep, but he knew that she was stubborn. For some reason, she had appointed herself his guardian, and he was not about to complain even if he could. Having an idea, he moved over on the bed, then pointed to her and patted the space beside him. What? She shook her head. 
Anne had nearly been dozing upright. He motioned for her to come, and she went to the bed. Gently he took her hand and belt loop, urging her to sit, then lay down beside him. "'I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to share the bed with you.' He put a finger to her lips, then wrapped an arm around her. Anne closed her eyes and snuggled up to him. "'If they come in, tell them I'm just listening to your heartbeat to make sure you're alive.' She was rewarded with a small puff of amusement from Michael. They both knew he wasn't going to say anything. He rubbed her back, and in moments Anne was breathing deeply, lost in sleep. He must have drifted off himself, because the next thing he knew, Kelly was holding Evan, and Elle had Ethan, and they were making their way into the room quietly. I brought Anne a few things. Elle set down the bag on the chair. She came over to the bed. I don't think Noah did justice in describing the diaper on your head. Against his better judgment, Michael smiled. Noah couldn't have chosen a better woman to alleviate his seriousness. Seriously, you're rocking the headgear. She hefted Ethan to a better position on her hip. I like your nurse. She complimented my baby, so that pretty much made her my friend. Kelly grinned. They're cute. I think they're going to look as good as the other Mr. Ramsleys when they get older. I bet they'll be a duo of trouble when they hit the teenage years and discover girls. L groaned. I'm not ready for the toddler years that are already here. Don't talk, teenagers. Happens before you know it. Kelly tapped Evan under the chin. L turned serious. How are you? Michael shrugged, using his free shoulder. Yeah, I feel that way some days, too. I suppose you can get away with it since you have a hole in your head. She motioned to Anne. How long has she been asleep? Michael looked at the clock on the wall. He held up two fingers. A couple of minutes, twenty, two hours. L stopped as he nodded. Noah said she was pretty wiped. Nice of you to share with her. Again, he shrugged. Not much of a conversationalist right now, are you? Michael gave her a look of caution. He wasn't ready for this conversation. However, L, being who she was, plunged ahead. I think there are two ways of looking at it, L said. One, you got a crappy deal. It sucks. But you're alive. Or we can go with scenario two, which is that I love the sound of my own voice. So you taking up less word time is great. Plus, I'm a pro at 20 questions, and now you and I are going to be playing a perpetual game. He raised an eyebrow, amused at her. Okay, so I'm not great at 20 questions. It'll make it even more fun, trust me. You'll be trying to communicate that you want me to run to the store to get beer or something, and I'll be yelling, Price is right, or it's a movie. He chuckled. He conceded that she was probably right. L sat down. I've decided that we are commandeering your beach house for Thanksgiving. Don't argue with me. There are enough of us with Paget joining the family and the twins. You can't say that you need to work, so all of us can be there. I am going to make a big dinner and stuff you men so full of gravy and turkey, you'll need to wear drawstring pants to watch the game. You still have that widescreen television there, right? He nodded. He'd actually upgraded it to even larger and high definition. He had no idea why, because he rarely ever watched television. Good. It's settled, then. How is the headache, Mr. Ramsley? Kelly asked. Michael paused and considered it. He was pleasantly surprised to feel that the gnomes had retired their wooden clogs and were just dancing around in sock feet. This was very pleasing, especially since he hadn't taken any medications in the last while. He held up four fingers. Evan and I are going to visit the nurse's station and get you a couple of painkillers. She clucked to the twin she held and danced him out the door. Really, I do like her, Elle said. I'm glad she's your nurse. I feel like she'll make sure you get the best care. Michael nodded. You know, you've taken the strong silent type to a whole new level. He rolled his eyes. Elle giggled. I think you're going to be just fine. Her comment sobered him. It was never going to be fine. Not really. But she appreciated her faith in him. Hey, she reached out and took his hand. All of us are here for you, whatever you need. He nodded again and gave her hand a squeeze. At this rate, he was going to need a chiropractor for all the nodding and shaking his head and know that he was doing. Perhaps he could cock his head to the side once in a while, to even things out. Mine, Evan said loudly, and Kelly held the pills away from at arm's length. I know they look like candy, but trust me, you don't want them, Kelly laughed. She passed the squirmy boy to Elle. Mr. Ramsley, here is your medication. Hopefully we can get that headache down to a one or none. 
Al stirred, and they all froze. She stretched, in reality intruded, telling her that she wasn't alone in the bed. She opened her eyes, blushing when she saw Michael. "'Good morning, sleepyhead,' Elle said brightly. Anne sat up, her blush deepening when she saw Elle and Kelly. She pushed her hair back behind her ears and tried to straighten her wrinkled blouse. "'I brought you a bag. The key is in the side pocket.' Elle hefted the bag a moment. I packed a few extra items, just in case. "'Thanks, Elle. "'Why don't you go freshen up?' Kelly said kindly. "'Mr. Ramsley, if you just take those pills, I can get myself back to work before my boss finds me loafing in here.' Michael nodded and swallowed the pills obediently. An embarrassed Anne grabbed the bag and went to the washroom. Within ten minutes she felt like a new woman. The nap had been good. New clothes, makeup, and brush were far better. Back to feeling composed, she went out to the room and was disappointed that El had left with the boys. Kelly was gone as well. Michael gestured for her to join him again. Anne hesitated. "'You can't be very comfortable with me hogging half the bed.' He held out his hand patiently. She sat down on the chair. Michael tried to say something, but it was like the word had fled his mind. He swallowed the frustration and put out his hand again, his eyes pleading with her. Anne thought about refusing him, but truthfully she didn't want to. She took his hand, then tucked herself beside him again. Perhaps she imagined it, but she thought he kissed the top of her head before settling himself. She hoped that he had. Michael, I know it's going to be a little while before you get released from the hospital, but what are you going to do when you go home? Someone is going to have to take care of all your appointments, look after your finances, run errands, and drive you wherever you need to go. He would no longer be able to use the company driver since he hadn't resigned. He supposed he could hire a company or a cab when he needed one, yet it wasn't like he could just call and ask. He couldn't give directions or addresses. Michael frowned. He wasn't allowed to drive until cleared by the doctor. She was right about appointments as well. It wasn't like he could write them on the calendar. He gave a troubled sigh. Anne continued, I know that Noah and Max will help out as much as they can. However, I was thinking that it might be best if I help for a while. I've been organizing your life for years, and I suppose I could do it for a few more weeks until you find a better solution. She was willing to stay, at least for a while. Michael had never felt so relieved. If that's okay with you, Anne lifted her head to look at him. Michael nodded. He was not going to turn this opportunity down. Then that's settled. Anne laid her head back down and listened to his steady breathing. The next morning was not a good one. Watch out, he's a puker. Kelly warned the physical therapist as she held onto one side of the belt they had strapped around his waist. Michael gave her an unamused look. He was not happy with the situation. Finally, he had showered and been allowed to switch to the much more comfortable sweat clothes he'd brought from home. However, in the process, it had meant standing, walking, sitting, bending, and being upright. That wasn't so bad once the dizziness passed, but the first few minutes had been horrible, and yes... Breakfast had ended up making a reappearance, something which Michael was not proud of. Since then, his stomach was still a little nauseous, but there was no danger of a repeat performance. Anne had been dismissed and told to go away for an hour or so, and now the two diminutive women had hold of this belt strapped at his waist, and he was meant to walk the halls with the aid of a walker. He felt ridiculous. It was just a walk. Instead, they had turned it into a circus. He ignored Kelly and the other woman's chatter about the handsome, in their opinion, construction guys working on the wing downstairs. They prattled on about all sorts of things, and since he was never going to repeat the hospital gossip, they asked if he would mind if they decided to chat it up about the new romance that seemed to be happening between one of the new interns and a nurse. He neither gave nor denied permission, and so he learned, much against his will, that it was suspected the nurse was cheating on the intern with her ex. The evidence was flimsy at best. Michael kept walking, pushing the walker, because they insisted he have it, rather than that he needed it. Oh, there was a baby born yesterday. Had a full head of hair. We should go down to maternity and have a look at all the babies, Kelly said, her voice getting that gooey quality that many women get when they started talking about babies. Anne wanted babies. 
He still didn't understand what she had meant when she had asked if he could give them to her. Michael frowned, shoving the thought out of his head, and kept walking. They ended up at the glass window overlooking the babies, and the two women cooed at the collection of wailing and sleeping children. As he looked in, he saw what he supposed were some nice-looking ones and some downright ugly ones. He had no experience with babies other than when Noah and Max were children. He'd been ten when Noah was born, twelve when Max was born. Mostly, the nanny had cared for them. He had done things with them, like telling them stories, camping on the beach, teaching them to swim, taking them out in the old rowboat. He tried to teach them to sail, but Noah got seasick and Max was far too daring. He'd worried Max was going to kill himself and sink the boat before he finally mastered the skill. Sailing had been abandoned. Some day he might try to teach the twins. Kelly tugged on him and they trudged down the hall. He learned where the gift shop was, and was paraded through all sorts of halls, stopping at all sorts of nurses' stations, getting introduced around as the girls caught up on any rumors. He started to get the feeling that this was more about them playing hooky rather than his well-being. Finally, he began to recognize that they were headed back to the hall that led to his room. He was starting to get tired, but he still refused to lean on the walker. It was a point of pride. Then he saw Max in the hall ahead. Fortunately, he was headed toward the room, which meant they were following him. It was unlikely that he would spot Michael, which suited Michael just fine. It was bad enough that he had this, how had L put it, this diaper on his head. He really didn't need Max to see him with a walker. There was only so much humiliation a man could take in one day, especially since he puked in front of Anne. He pushed the memory away. "'Hey, there's Mr. Ramsley's brother, Max!' Kelly exclaimed. She raised a hand to get Max's attention. "'Hi, Max!' Since when was Max allowed to be called Max, and he was still called Mr. Ramsley rather than Michael? Michael scowled at Kelly. "'He's a hottie,' the physical therapist said to Kelly, looking Max up and down. "'I know, right?' Kelly said right back. She bounced on her feet and smiled. "'He's coming over!' "'You're so lucky you've got such a great family, Mr. Ramsley.' "'Lucky. Right.' He sighed and watched Max approach. Max was grinning and gestured to the walker. "'Taking the new wheels out for a spin?' Michael ignored the remark, but the physical therapist tittered like it was the most amusing thing she had ever heard. "'Don't worry about cranky pants. He's just in a mood,' Kelly said. Michael stared at her in shocked surprise. "'Cranky pants!' Max howled with laughter. He laughed long and hard, leaning against the wall. I am so going to use that. He was done. He didn't need the walker. He didn't need these two nurses following him around. He disentangled the belt from his person and handed it to the physical therapist. He left the walker and trailed one hand on the railing as he went back to his room. He might not be able to read the room numbers, however, he knew it was the third one on the right from the nurse's station. He had no idea what he was going to do when he got to the room, but that was where he was going. "'Mr. Ramsley, you can't just walk away,' Kelly said as he chased him with the walker. "'I think you hurt his feelings,' Max was still chuckling. "'Come back, cranky pants!' He walked straight and with pride. He had been the head of a multi-billion dollar company. "'Cranky pants!' "'I'm sorry, I apologize. I was entirely unprofessional saying that. It slipped out. Sometimes I call my son that when he's having a bad day. He ignored her and counted doors in his head. Please don't let my boss know. I need this job. I love my job, and normally I'm very good at it. Kelly had to lengthen her stride to keep up. I have a son which I need to provide for. I know that's low to bring him into this, but I really need this job. Michael stopped in his doorway. He sighed. He was sighing a lot these days. He looked down at Kelly. I am so sorry, she apologized again. It will never happen again. He nodded. It wasn't like he could complain to anyone anyways. Perhaps he had been a little moody today. Then again, it hadn't been the best morning. Thank you. I promise you're released from the belt and walker, she said excitedly and hurried the offending piece of equipment back to the physical therapist. Feeling better after that little temper tantrum? Max asked, amused. Michael gave him a look, his expression telling Max not to start anything. He turned and went into the room, sitting down on the edge of the bed. 
"'You're looking a lot better than yesterday,' Max remarked, still smiling. He took the chair and put his feet up on the bed beside Michael. He looked entirely relaxed. Michael looked at the feet pointedly, but Max didn't move them. "'I talked to the nurses at the station. They said you have an appointment with a speech therapist today. Plus, more head scans.' Max folded his hands on his stomach, slouching comfortably. "'I heard you refused the pain pills this morning.' His pain had been a two out of ten. It was manageable. He didn't feel the need to swallow pills for it. As for speech therapy, he didn't even want to think about that waste of time. Hey, Max dropped his feet and sat up, suddenly serious. I get that you don't want to be here. No one likes to be sick in the hospital, least of all one of us. I would hate to be in your shoes. But you could cut the nurses some slack. They are trying to help you. Michael sighed and gave a half-nod. Good. Max grabbed the remote to the television. Michael wanted to say that he hadn't bothered to have it hooked up. Here's the game. Baseball. The Yankees were playing Boston. Max must have paid to connect the television service up, or added it to Michael's hospital bill. Max had gotten comfortable in the chair again, feet up on the bed. Michael didn't even push them off. He simply leaned back in the bed to watch the game. Anne had gone home and taken a long shower. She'd switched out some items in her bag and cancelled a couple of appointments that she had. They could wait. She'd even managed an hour nap before heading back to the hospital. On the way, she bought a day planner so she could start managing Michael's personal life with it. She would keep track of all of his appointments and medications with it. This morning had been a disaster. She felt like Kelly was rushing Michael. Getting out of bed to shower and dress when it was obvious that he got dizzy had been a bad idea, especially right after breakfast. Fortunately, she hadn't gotten any of the vomit on her. Poor Michael had worn most of it. He'd looked so pale, in pain, and completely mortified. Kelly had simply and cheerfully called in reinforcements to get him into the shower. They had told Anne to go away for a while. Michael was scheduled to go walking, so there was no point in her waiting and staring at the walls. Anne had protested their plans. Michael did not seem in good enough shape to do what they were asking of him. Kelly had firmly and merrily pushed her out of the room. Anne hoped that they knew what they were doing. Now she was returning, fully expecting Michael to be spent. Instead, she could hear Max arguing. She picked up her pace. He was out. No question about it, Max exclaimed loudly. Anne slowed her pace and looked in the room. Michael was giving Max a look that said he was crazy and made the universal safe sign. You need glasses. So does the ump. Max slouched back his feet on the bed where Michael was comfortably reclined, one leg bent as they both stared at the television. See, right there, the ball beats the runner. Michael snorted and pointed to the television. Well, from that angle, sure. But from the first angle they showed, he was totally out, Max insisted. He winked at Anne, then turned his attention back to the television. Both of them suddenly groaned at one of the plays that were made. Anne leaned in the doorway. She'd been so worried, and here he was, enjoying himself with Max. Max had a real way of connecting with people and bringing them out of their shell. She'd missed him over the past few years and was glad that Michael and Max appeared to have repaired the rift in their relationship. Michael saw her and smiled. She walked over to the bed and he made room for her. There was nowhere else for her to sit unless she sat on Max, so she decided to share the bed. It wasn't like a million people hadn't already seen her snuggled up to him sleeping. Max raised an eyebrow, but she ignored him. What's the score? Boston is spanking the Yankees. Michael keeps telling me they'll catch up. I think it's a done game. Bottom of the seventh. Michael shrugged. He mimed a walking figure with his hand. No way. Strike out. What? Anne looked at Max. We're predicting what's going to happen with the new batter. Michael says he's going to walk. Anne watched the pitch fly in. It was a ball. The pitcher's going to bean him. Both men looked at her, so she asked, why not? Unlikely, Max said. It could happen, she insisted. If I were pitching, I'd bean him before I walked him. So oh, then it's a good thing you don't pitch. I used to. Michael knew she'd pitch for a competitive high school team. 
His private investigator had turned up the information because, yes, he'd yielded to the temptation of spying on her. She'd gotten a college scholarship to pitch. She'd turned it down to come work for him, and he had no idea why. Now he'd never get to ask her. You what? Max asked absently. The pitch was made, and sure enough, even though the batter jerked to try to get away, it hit him off the ankle. He danced around in pain. I pitched, Anne said in satisfaction. Michael made a motion with his arm. He already knew the answer, but put in the question like he didn't. No, not windmill. Regular pitching. I was supposed to go to college pitching. They thought I might make it to the ladies' state team and even go national. Why didn't you? Max asked, suddenly interested. I didn't want to. I love to play the game, but to make it into a job? No, thank you. She smiled, remembering. I did recreational for a while, but got so busy with work I just gave it up. Michael thought that was a little sad. She'd given up a sport that she loved. Mr. Ramsley, it's time for your speech therapy appointment. Michael grimaced, but got up to dutifully go with the nurse. Anne immediately grabbed his arm. Are you going to be okay? He nodded, gave in her hand a squeeze, and then followed the nurse. And I know you want to protect him after all he's been through. We all do. But we need to let him decide what he can and can't do, Max admonished softly. You didn't see what he went through this morning, she said. No, but I did find him capable of what he was up against this afternoon, Max chuckled. One of the nurses called him cranky pants. What? Anne was angry. Who? He deserved it, Max said. Plus, it motivated him. I wouldn't get upset over it. The whole episode was good for him. He needs to do things for himself rather than being pandered to. Anne fell silent. Max was right. Eventually, they were going to have to let Michael do things on his own. Maybe not everything, though. You're right, I suppose. I'm always right, Max said confidently, except when I'm wrong. Anne smiled. Tell me about this girl you're engaged to. My favorite subject, he smiled happily. Her name is Paget, and she's the most talented, kind, amazing woman, who, for some strange reason, likes me. Anne watched Max get animated as he described the woman he loved. That was what she wanted. Someone who would be happier for just having her, for loving her. Her heart ached with a bit of envy. Michael did not envy the speech therapist his job. Ted shoved his glasses high up his pudgy nose again and showed off the cartoonish picture cards proudly. He explained that while Michael would never be able to use the word cards, there was no reason he couldn't learn to communicate with the picture cards. For instance, if you wanted an apple, you might grab that card that has fruit and show it to the person behind the counter at the cafeteria. Ted held up the card for emphasis. Michael wondered if he had ever worked with adults before. Then the clerk might ask what type of fruit you wanted. You could point and nod until you got the apple. Maybe he only worked with mentally challenged or brain-damaged adults. Brain-damaged like him. Michael resolutely pushed the thought away. Or you might want to take a walk. Then you could hold up the walking guy here. Ted tapped the card. Carding around a deck of picture cards, just in case someone asked him a question. Michael sighed. Was there a card for not happy and would rather be doing something else? This card is if you'd like to phone someone. See, it has a phone on it. Pretty self-explanatory. This is a picture of a toilet, so that you can ask where the bathroom is during a trip. No, absolutely not. He was not going to be some fifty-year-old man holding up a picture of a toilet to some stranger. They'd think he was a pervert or something. Here's a music note so you can ask someone to sing or turn on the radio. Ted pushed up the glasses again. This one has a giraffe, elephant, and ape on it. You might want to ask someone if they would like to go to the zoo. Go to the zoo? Really? Michael ran a hand across the stubble on his chin. Maybe Ted had brain damage. That was uncharitable. He really shouldn't think like that. The poor guy was just trying to do his job. Here we have a picture of an Xbox if you want to ask someone to play a game. Michael looked up and prayed for patience. 
The way he figured it, he really just needed one card. It should simply say, Hi, my name is Michael. I have speech aphasia. That means I can't talk, but I understand everything you say. That was the card he needed. Maybe it should have a phone number on the other side, like a lost dog tag. Please call so-and-so if you find me. This is a television. He could see that. He wasn't blind. Hmm. Pardon me? Ted squinted at him. Michael shook his head and tapped the next card. Best to get this over with. Oh, that's if you'd like to go to the park. This was geared for children. Great. He picked up some cars and sorted through them. Nothing for the beach. He wondered how he was going to tell Anne that he wanted to go back to the beach house. Perhaps he could just tote around an erase board and a dry erase marker. He was credible at sketching. Ted went through the rest of the cards with him. He gathered them up and handed them to Michael. This is your very own deck. Wonderful. His very own deck. Michael slowly took them. He offered his hand to Ted, who, surprised, shook it. Do you need help to go back to your room? He shook his head negative. He managed just fine, his sense of direction not letting him down. However, the nurses at the station waylaid him, sending him for another round of head scans. Michael patiently put up with the prodding. Finally, they changed his bandage, Dr. Hemond overseeing. Everything was pronounced good, and he received a smaller bandage. The diaper was gone. He was released once more, but instead of heading back to his room, Michael found a mirror in the men's room. The bandage was a lot smaller, but still stood out, pronouncing him damaged. He didn't like it. He wasn't a vain man, but he'd like to be tidy, put together. He sighed, resigned. At some point, it would go away. So would the stitches. His hair would grow back and cover the scar. In the meanwhile, he'd just have to live with it. Michael made his way back to his room. Anne was still there, jotting down something in a day planner. Max had left. He tossed the cards onto the side table. One of them caught his eye, and suddenly a solution presented itself to him. He looked at the clock on the wall. He had maybe a half hour. The Yankees lost by three. At least they caught up in the end, Anne said. They changed your bandage. It's smaller. That's good. Michael nodded absently, opening the cupboard and rifling through his overnight bag for his wallet. There was his credit card. Perfect. He palmed it and walked out. Michael? Anne's voice floated after him. He went to the gift shop and looked around. There. Perfect. The clerk rang it up for him without an issue. See, he didn't need those cards. He smiled, ripping off the price tag. He put the gray knit hat on his head. It covered the bandage easily. It was comfortable. It fit with his sweats. For a moment, he felt normal. No one was looking at him and wondering about his head like he was some sort of freak. It was a good feeling. He returned to his room where Anne was waiting. When she spotted the hat, it was obvious that she didn't know what to say. He sat on the bed and patiently waited. He knew that she would figure out the why. Anne knew him better than anyone. She came to stand before him and gently adjusted the hat. Got tired of everyone looking at your head? He nodded. With the beard stubble, it's a very good look on you. Very Gary V. She trailed her hand over his cheek as she sighted the famous entrepreneur. He rolled his eyes. Well, you are handsomer. Plus, your voice is much nicer than his. Suddenly, he felt a little hollow. Anne immediately realized her mistake. I'm sorry, Michael. I didn't mean... He placed a finger on her lips, then gave her a hug. He'd forgive her anything. He slowly released her, and she tilted her head. It is different. I've never seen you wear anything remotely like that hat, but I do like it. He smiled. Did the doctor tell you it wasn't cancer? She asked. He nodded. She sat beside him and took his hand. I am so thankful. You've been through enough. He squeezed his hand. He was thankful, too. He was also thankful that she had been there beside him through this whole thing. I have a confession, she said. He looked at her curiously. I looked at the cards they gave you. He rolled his eyes. I think we can probably get rid of half of them. Maybe a few more. Anne looked a little mischievous. Unless you'd like to go to the zoo sometime. Against his will, Michael gave a smile and shook his head. He had no need to visit the zoo. Anne and he sorted through the cards, good-naturedly arguing over a couple of them. She put the toilet in the keep pile. 
He would sneak it out later and throw it away. Chapter 5 A couple of days later, Dr. Hemond held a final meeting with Michael and Anne. The swelling around the tumor site has gone down. Michael's headaches have decreased dramatically, and there was no dizziness this morning. Dr. Hemond checked his notes. From the scans and your blood work, everything looks good. I'm going to ask you not to engage in any vigorous exercise for the next two weeks. Rest when you are tired. You are not allowed to drive or operate any heavy machinery. You are on vacation, no working. If the headaches come back and do not improve with the prescription I am giving you for within four hours, I want you to call my office. If the dizziness returns, call my office. If the office isn't open, come into the hospital. If you experience stroke symptoms or have any seizure, call 911 immediately. You are doing extremely well, Michael. Most people would not be recovering as quickly as you. I'm very pleased by your progress. We'll set up an appointment for Wound to take out the stitches. He signed a form. I'm releasing you into Anne's care. Michael breathed a sigh of relief. He could go home. Anne was given another stack of forms and papers detailing appointments, the prescriptions, and what signs to look for if something went wrong. She added it to the collection in her purse to sort out and organize later. Dr. Hemond shook both their hands and then left the room. They collected up their possessions from the hospital room. It didn't take long. Michael gave the room one last look, and then they were greeted at the nursing station by the many nurses who had helped during his care. Kelly came forward and gave him a hug. We heard you were leaving us. Michael gave her a nod, and she hugged Anne as well. I think we'll be happy to go home, Anne offered. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Kelly smiled. He was an easy patient. All the nurses got together, and we signed a card for you, Michael, so that you'll remember us. You can have it right after you sign your discharge papers. She handed him the pen and clipboard. Without thinking about it, he started to write his name, but then the letters became difficult and confusing. He hesitated over them, then simply scrawled something unintelligible. He wouldn't be able to read the card. However, he could appreciate the sentiment behind it, he decided. Everyone congratulated him on his recovery, and finally he and Anne were able to leave. It was a relief to climb into the back of the car, a private driver waiting on them. He could sit beside Anne. The trouble began when he realized they were driving toward the condo. No, he said. He was surprised at his voice. It felt rusty. He cleared his throat. Anne looked at him in confusion. What is it? No, he repeated calmly. He pointed to the road ahead. Michael, it's okay. We'll go back to the condo and get you settled in, Anne said, trying to comfort him. He shook his head. He didn't want to go back to the condo. He had been looking forward to going to the beach house. That was where he wanted to go. He could take walks at the beach house. He could see and smell the ocean, listen to the sound of it from his room. He could fish off the pier if he found his old rod back. He could sit in his sailboat, even if he couldn't sail it. He could listen to his housekeeper, Fen Lee, chatter as she worked. It would be better than sitting in the condo downtown doing nothing. He wanted the beach. I don't understand. Anne was upset. What do you want? He grimaced, then motioned for her pen and the day planner that she kept toting around. He couldn't do the words, but perhaps a picture. He turned to the back of the book and began with clear strokes of the pen. There was the house, the deck, the sand, the waves, the sun in the sky. He even put a boat in the water for effect. Anne's eyes were clouded in confusion. A boat? He motioned for her to try to keep guessing. I don't get it. You're not going on a boat. Michael sighed, and then handed back the planner and pen. She studied the picture some more. Why would you draw this? Because I want to go there, he thought. He reached into his overnight bag for his house key to the condo. Right there, beside the key, was another one, the one to the beach house. He turned to Anne and held up the key ring. She stared at them, then looked at him. He held up the key to the beamer. "'That's your car key,' she said, wondering what he was driving at. He nodded. He held up the condo key. "'The key to the door of the condo?' she guessed. He nodded again. "'Please let her understand this.' He showed her another key. "'The key to your office.' She grabbed the key ring from him. "'Your safe, your desk.' There was one more key left. The beach house key. 
She looked at it, trying to remember what other property he might have since it was obviously a house key. The beach house, she guessed. You want to go to the beach house? He nodded, pleased that she finally understood. Michael, are you sure that's wise? The condo is much closer to the hospital. If anything goes wrong, she looked at him with worry. He was willing to take that risk. He gently took the key and held it up. She wavered indecisively. I don't think it's a good idea. We should stay near the hospital. Michael took both her hands in his and held them up between them. He silently pleaded with her until she sighed. He smiled. She informed the driver of the new address, and they were on their way. Michael leaned back and kept hold of one of Anne's hands. He contentedly watched the city go by. It took an hour to reach the beach house. Michael could feel his tension go away. The ocean had always helped him to relax. He didn't even wait for the driver to open his door, but got out and lent a hand to help Anne out. She looked up the large three-story home on prime beachside property, and he realized this was the first time she had been there. She'd never been to his condo either, even though he'd been to her apartment to escort her to various business functions that the company required his presence at. Wow, Anne said. It was beautiful. She had no idea that he owned such a property. Well, she'd known he had a house on the beach, but she hadn't thought it was this large or in a Cape Cod style. She thought it would be glass and maybe two stories. She loved it instantly. From the front she could see that the backyard was the beach, just sand leading to the ocean. She knew that it had been David and Rachel Ramsley's vacation home for years before Michael bought it from them. He went to the house on the weekends when he wasn't working, which had become fewer and fewer as the years went by. She could see why he wanted to be here. She just hoped the distance from the hospital wasn't going to impact his health should anything go wrong. He took her by the hand and pulled her up the walk to the front door. It was obvious he was happy, and so she shoved her worries away, letting him show off the house to her. He was proud of the place. Everything was beautiful, up to date. The kitchen was marvelous, huge with a breakfast bar and all the brand new appliances anyone could want. The living room, one of two, faced the water. The next one had a fireplace and an enormous television with cushy leather recliners. There was a study full of books and an old scarred desk, and a sea chest that looked at least a hundred years old. There were throw blankets on beautiful armchairs. The guest rooms each had their own spa bath. The master was simply huge with a walk-in closet that was nearly the size of her own bedroom in her apartment. There was both a spa bathtub and a large glass shower in the bathroom. There was a rec room with a pool table and a small bar. At the back of the house, each floor had sliding doors looking out to the water. There was a structured deck for the second and third floors. It was amazing. They stood on the deck and watched the waves gently push at the sand. Gulls soared over their heads. Michael put his hands on her shoulders and watched the ever-changing waters. He felt entirely at peace. He was home. Anne was here. They managed a light dinner before Michael began to tire. Anne told him to go to bed and that she would take care of the dishes. However, he pulled her away from the sink with a firm shake of his head to the negative. The housekeeper, Fenley, would take care of the dishes. Not that he could tell her that. He shut off the lights to the kitchen and climbed the stairs to the next floor. He was still in his comfortable sweat, so he really didn't see any reason to change. He pulled back the covers to his bed and sat yawning. He was wiped. Anne hovered in the doorway. She came over and took his hat off, laying it on the night table. "'Your hair is growing back,' she commented, softly touching it. Good. He had no liking for the bald him. Plus, it would cover the scar eventually. "'You know, I forgot to pack pajamas,' she said wryly. "'I didn't really think about staying overnight, since I hadn't expected you to get discharged so soon.' Technically, she didn't have to stay overnight. She had insisted since she was worried about him. He liked that she would be there. He didn't want to admit that he was a little worried, too, that if something went wrong there would be no one here to help him until Fen Lee came in the morning. Michael motioned to the closet. He had plenty of clothes. If she wanted to, she could borrow. What? He repeated the gesture. I don't understand. She was confused. He stood and went to the closet. He pulled out a tee and held it up against her. It was too big for her, but maybe to sleep in? kind of like a nightgown? 
Can I borrow it? she asked. He nodded. It was one of his Harvard shirts. He had the feeling she'd look amazing in it. Then again, he thought she looked beautiful in everything. She took the shirt. Thank you. He nodded, then endured her nearly tucking him in. Really, she was fussing too much, he thought tiredly. She checked on him three times that night that he was aware of. It was ridiculous. There was no way she was going to get any sleep when she kept tiptoeing over to his room to see if he was still alive. He wasn't going to get any sleep either, waiting for her to come back each time. On the third time, he reached out and tugged on the shirt that he had lent her. She had a pair of shorts on with it, and while he'd never seen her look so casual, he liked it. "'Michael, you should be sleeping,' she admonished. He had probably scared her. However, there was no sleeping when she was sneaking around. He steadily tugged on her shirt until she was sitting on the bed. "'Okay, what would you like? Can I get you something? A glass of water?' She could get him a full night's rest. He moved over, then patted the bed. It was king-sized. There was plenty of room for both of them. "'Michael, I'm not going to sleep here,' Anne said. He sighed. Then neither of them were going to sleep. He patted the bed again and took her hand so that she couldn't leave. "'Well, maybe just until you go back to sleep?' Anne got comfortable. Michael smiled and closed his eyes. When he opened them in the morning, it was a beautiful sunrise. The rays of the sun were cascading across the room but the most beautiful sight was in bed with him, cuddled up to him. He gently stroked her silky hair for a few minutes, watching her. He could hear Fen Lee starting coffee downstairs. Regretfully, he disengaged himself from Anne. He got changed into clean sweats and grabbed his hat on the way quietly out of the room. He came down to the kitchen got himself a cup of coffee. Fen Lee stared at him. What? You think you're some gangster? Start rap club? He smiled despite himself. He supposed he looked like a bum with the hat and the beard. He should shave. He gave the little Vietnamese woman a one-armed hug. She pushed him away. Go away. Drink coffee. I start clean kitchen, must finish. Make breakfast after. Shoo! Michael followed her suggestion, settling himself on a deck chair watching the waves in the sun. Life was good. Anne yawned. It must be nearly eight in the morning. She had slept in, and Michael was already up. She blamed the stress of everything that had happened since Michael's surgery. Grabbing Michael's robe from the bathroom, she padded her way to the kitchen, but was surprised to see a small woman humming and scrubbing the counters. Hello? The tiny woman stopped. She must be just under five feet in height. She was dark in color and of undeterminable age. She stared at Anne. My goodness! He finally bring woman home. I beginning to worry he always be a bachelor. Anne blinked. You pretty. Come closer. I make coffee. You want some? She peeled off her rubber gloves and grabbed a cup out of the cupboard. She used a step stool to reach the bottom shelf. Anne wondered what she did when she wanted something off the top shelves. Um, yes, please? Anne sat down on a stool at the breakfast bar. My name is Anne. You are... Fenley. I cook, clean, run errand. Take care of house and Mr. Michael when he here. She put down a cup of coffee in front of Anne. Cream? Sugar? Please. Anne watched as the efficient little woman grabbed the requested items. How long have you worked for Michael? Ten year. Fenley gave Anne the sugar and cream. She leaned forward conspiratorially. Tell me, Mr. Michael good in bed? Anne stared at her in shock and blushed furiously. Ooh, blushy, blushy! Fen Lee wiggled a finger. I thought so. We didn't... We aren't romantically involved, Anne said, flustered by the housekeeper's insinuation. What? No sex? Fen Lee gave her an unbelieving look. He big man, you pretty lady. No, Anne said firmly. Michael had an operation. I'm here to help take care of him. Fen Lee harumped. What sort of operation? Take appendix? No, he had a couple of tumors removed from his brain. He okay? The little lady turned serious. He's okay. He's just... Anne sighed and then explained about the speech aphasia. So he no talk no more? Fenley asked. Anne nodded. Not much, no. He no gonna call me bossy no more? 
Fen Li looked upset. He calls you bossy? Anne asked, surprised. All the time. It okay. Mr. Michael don't mind my bossy. Fen Li resumed wiping the countertop. If he no like, he would have fired me many years ago. You want breakfast? Anne struggled to keep up with the conversation. Okay. I make eggs and bacon. Brown toast. How you like egg? Scrambled, please. Anne looked around. Is Michael up already? He take coffee and sit on deck. I make him breakfast, too, as soon as I finish kitchen. No car in driveway. I not know he here. Good thing I have grocery and car for me. Are we eating your groceries? Fenley, you shouldn't give us your groceries. Why not? I'd buy more. I buy grocery for Mr. Michael all time. She put away the gloves and grabbed out a couple of pans. Give ten minutes. Breakfast ready. Thank you, Fenley, Anne said, but the little woman waved her away. Anne took her coffee and went to the deck to find Michael sitting in one of the deck chairs, sipping from a mug, the knit hat still camouflaging the bandage. He smiled at her, and she couldn't help the tenderness that flowed through her. She sat next to him. "'Have you been up for long?' he shrugged. "'I met your housekeeper.' He looked at her expectantly. "'She says you call her bossy.' Anne lifted an eyebrow. Michael gave a guilty but amused nod with a bit of a shrug. I like her. Anne turned her attention to the water. It was very calming. She could sit out here every morning with a coffee in good weather. Did she show up one day and refuse to go away, kind of like I did? Michael had a snort. Anne turned to look at him. She did, didn't she? He smiled and nodded. What did she say, that she had eight children to feed and so you couldn't turn her away? He held up five fingers. Oh, only five. I'm disappointed. Anne sipped her coffee. I still like her. And since the house is sparkling, I suppose she earns whatever you pay her. He nodded. Any headache this morning? He indicated no. Dizziness? Again, no. Good. Anne was relieved. A moment later, Fenley was at the door. Ten minute up. Breakfast ready. She waved a spatula at Michael. Now, Mr. Michael, why you two share bed? I look. Guest room not used. Missy Ann say no sets, but I wonder. Anne felt her face turn red, even as Michael got a little ruddy. He rolled his eyes at the little woman and shook his head. You have sex, you marry her. I, good Christian woman. No work for bad men, she winked at Anne. I make some coffee cake for you. Eat later. Anne sputtered. Fen Lee? What? No like cake? she said innocently. Yes to the cake, no to the sex. I stayed to be sure he was okay. I'll be moving to the guest room today. Anne was embarrassed. Okay, Fenley said doubtfully as she dished up breakfast and poured refills in the coffee. She then grabbed the vacuum and humming went to vacuum downstairs. Anne put her head in her hands. Michael ate a piece of bacon and watched her. She composed herself and started eating breakfast. I think you're right. She is bossy and nosy, Anne said. He smiled. Michael stared at the paper in frustration. He wanted to throw the pen across the room. Instead, he set it down carefully, like it was a poisonous thing on the desk. He'd started by trying to script out the alphabet. He had beautiful cursive, but that didn't matter when it didn't loop as it should when letters went backwards, sideways, and not in the right spot. He tried small words. Dog, cat, bird. What stared back at him was gibberish. He closed the journal, blocking the offending page. It all confirmed what he already knew. He rubbed his eyes. He now had a study that was entirely useless to him. Forty-two volumes of journals he had kept since he was eight sat on the shelves with all the other books, mocking him. Michael? Anne came in with his medication and a glass of water. She set it down on the desk. Are you okay? He nodded, as okay as he was going to be. She gently took the book from under his hand and flipped through it. It came to rest on his latest endeavor. Oh, Michael. He shrugged and took the medication. His head was beginning to hurt, but he suspected that it was from the stress of not being able to put his thoughts to paper. She flipped through the book and paused, reading, Is this poetry? He stood and gently took the book from her. 
The last thing he wanted was for her to read his many, many odes to her. They were boyish ridiculousness. He placed the book on the shelf with the others. You must have forty books here. Did you write them all? Anne asked, trailing a hand over them. Michael nodded. Forty-two. There would be no forty-three. Is it all poetry? Michael shook his head no. He was tired. He didn't want to even look at them ever again. They only reminded him of what he had lost. Michael turned and left the room. His head did hurt. He was going to take a nap. Anne followed him, hovering until she realized that he was going to lie down. She pulled the blinds, dimming the room, and let him mercifully be. Anne wondered if he had a headache, or if he was just depressed at the failure of his efforts. He had known he wouldn't be able to write, but he had tried anyways. Her heart ached for him. Drawn back to the study, she picked out a volume at random from the row of journals. Each were leather-bound vellum, two inches thick. They were beautiful books, filled with Michael's beautiful script. Opening it to the beginning, she sat in one of the comfortable armchairs by the window and began to read. It was a story, a children's story full of creatures from the beach and ocean. Words were crossed out, rewritten, and circled. A few pages later, the story started again. This time, it was a perfect draft of the other story, copied painstakingly from the earlier draft. There were pictures of the creatures and of their adventure. Anne enjoyed it immensely. She couldn't believe that Michael had written such a thing. He was always so serious, and here was an amusing story of imagination. How many times had she seen him writing at his desk during the early afternoon, and she had thought it was likely to do with the many legal issues the company dealt with? Michael had deceived them all. He was a writer at heart. And now he could no longer practice his craft. It was incredibly sad. She skipped a couple of pages and skimmed through journal entries about business at the company. This journal was old. The date put it a few months after she had been hired. She wondered what he had thought of her back then. She flipped through to find an entry with her name. There she was. The memory was as detailed as if it had happened yesterday, and she remembered it. He'd asked her for a specific document that he needed for the afternoon meeting. She remembered having it on her desk, but after a search she hadn't found it. She had begun a mad scramble to try to find it. The old secretary had left, and it was now her job to know these things, to be organized and ready. Yet she couldn't find the file. She'd panicked and gone through everything again. She'd made a complete mess out of what was on the desk, in the desk. She was in the middle of the file cabinets when Michael had asked her for the document because the meeting was going to start in fifteen minutes and he wanted to brush up on a particular clause. She must have looked absolutely horrified, because he'd knelt beside her and asked what was wrong. She admitted to misplacing the file. Then, like the wonderful man he was, Michael had calmly started the search with her again, going through everything like they had all the time in the world to find the file. It had stilled her nerves, and she'd been able to focus. Anne was certain she'd lost her job and that he would fire her, but she was determined to finish the day and find that file. A complete search of the office had determined that the file was not there. Michael sat her down, gave her a glass of water, and gently coached her through what she had done that day. Finally, they realized that the document was probably in the shredding room, waiting or already shredded. There was no copy. Anne had felt close to tears over her mistake. She'd picked up the pile of files to go there, and had probably scooped it up with the ones that were to be destroyed. Michael had simply listened. He told her that it was going to be okay. They went to the copy room and found the file in a pile waiting to be destroyed. The meeting had already started. He'd taken the time to escort her back to the office and gave her a couple of memos to type. When she asked him if she was fired, he'd said of course not. She knew to double-check her work now. He'd invested far too much time and training into her to have her leave. Then he'd gone on to his meeting. They'd never discussed what had happened that day ever again. Reading Michael's version fit with hers, only it showed his surprise that she thought she should be fired. It told how she reminded him of Max once in a while, young and impetuous, how she was improving as a secretary, also how he thought her skirt was a little short. The men in the copy room had been looking at her legs. Her appearance reflected on him, 
while he thought her legs were long and lovely, he simply must put an end to this. Anne smiled. He liked her legs. She thought back and recalled that was the week he had talked to her about the harassment policy and dress code. She'd been mortified then. Now she was thankful. He had kindly reminded her what she was striving to be, a professional secretary, which involved keeping up appearances. Thanks to the journal, she now knew he liked her legs. Well, they weren't at work any more. Maybe she should keep wearing shorts. She wondered if she had packed her short shorts. She'd kept up at the gym and was still slim and leggy. If he admired legs, maybe he would get a view. She put the journal back and selected one, checking the dates. It was perhaps five years old. She settled down and read about his reaction to her dating Roy. He listed Roy's occupation, yearly earnings, and that he used improper tax reporting. Height, weight, age, it was all there. Anne sat up straight. It was worse than an employee file. It was also illegal. What had Michael been thinking? He'd investigated her boyfriend. He went on to document dates that they went on. It was all there between work-related items that he'd written down. Then, right in plain sight, he'd written, What kind of name is Roy? It's a stupid name. Leroy. It sounds like something someone would name their bloodhound. She can't possibly be serious dating him. He cheats on his taxes. Anne stared at the words. He'd never said anything against Roy. He'd never commented on anyone she had dated. It was the reason she felt he had absolutely no romantic feelings towards her. She was shocked that he disliked Roy so much. She dated him for nearly a year before finally breaking it off because he just wasn't Michael. Anne flipped a few more years and found a poem. It was beautiful. It described a woman who sounded like perfection itself. It was romantic. Michael was in love. She swallowed thickly. Michael was in love with the beautiful, perfect, mysterious woman with her silky hair, perfect curves, and seductive smile. Suddenly she felt like the bottom had dropped out of her world. She'd known that Michael was in love with her, but had always assumed the possibility, the hope that he might come to do so existed. She'd never thought for an instant that he was in love with someone else. Anne shut the journal. She didn't want to know any more. Something had changed while he was sleeping. Anne was still hovering, keeping him company, being solicitous, but she seemed sad and depressed. He was sad and depressed. Still, she hadn't been earlier. Concerned, yes, not looking like someone had taken away her favorite toy. Now he was worried about her. He let her choose the movie. He let her choose the snack. He got up to refill her drink. Finally, he paused the movie and turned to look at her. She wasn't paying attention to the movie anyways. He instinctively knew it. Now she looked at him and he wondered what he could do to fix whatever was upsetting her. Michael reached out a finger and gently traced the frown lines between her eyebrows. She sighed. So he took her in his arms and just held her. If she wasn't going to talk, then he didn't know what he could do. She leaned on him. Michael waited patiently and was finally rewarded. I just realized today that I have loved someone for a very long time, but he will never love me back. She sniffled and wiped her eyes. I am so stupid. Michael's brow furrowed as he thought. Anne loved someone? He didn't like the idea at all. Then he suddenly knew who it was. Max. They'd each gotten an invite to the wedding today. Max and Anne were nearly the same age. When Max had worked for Ramsey Pharmaceuticals, Michael had seen him flirt with Anne. Truth be told, Max had flirted with every female back then. What if Anne had let herself fall in love with him? The thought made him sick. His Anne, in love with his youngest brother who was shortly getting married. Michael just held her. He didn't know what else to do. Anne fell asleep, so he gently settled them both on the couch, pulling a throw over her. He kept holding her, wishing impossible things. Chapter 6 Over the next couple of days Michael tiptoed around Anne, treating her like she was made of glass. She supposed he had every right after her teary outburst. 
Really, she needed to get her emotions under control. He got her coffee. He took her for walks on the beach. He even let her go on the sailboat to have a look at it. Anything she wanted to do, he was game. She had the feeling he was afraid of another soaking from her. It needed to stop. Anne noticed the entryway light had gone out. This morning she was up and Michael was nowhere to be seen. She had a feeling he was jogging, which technically wasn't allowed yet. She was going to have to lecture him about that. The good news was that she was alone and could tackle the simple household chore without having him try to do it himself. She started breakfast since Fenley was late. Maybe it was the housekeeper's day off. Anne didn't know the woman's schedule. She just seemed to come and go, food appearing as necessary. Everything was going nicely, so she pulled the chair under the light socket. She'd managed to locate another bulb, so she got on the chair and stretched to carefully remove the old bulb. It was difficult, and she had to stretch as far as she possibly could. If she had just another inch, it would help. It took a couple of minutes, but she managed to remove it. Slipping it into her back pocket, she was on the tips of her toes, trying to get the thread on the new bulb to catch when she felt two hands grab her hips. Anne shrieked. Her heart going a mile a minute, she slipped on the chair and crashed into Michael, who had been trying to steady her. He took a step back, and she slid down the length of him. The bulb shattered on the floor. Anne found herself plastered to the man, looking up at him in surprise. She leaned her forehead against his chest and took in a shaky breath. "'Michael, you scared me badly!' Her shirt had ridden up a little, and his hands were on her bare ribs. She was still wearing just what she had slept in, a pair of shorts and his T-shirt. His right thumb trailed across her skin. Anne looked up to see Michael watching her. Before her good sense could kick in, she went up on her tippy-toes and kissed him. He tasted like coffee and something that was uniquely Michael. Desire unfurled in her stomach, and he kissed her back. Oh, my! Fenley was in the doorway looking at them. The overturned chair and glass scattered across the floor. What burn? Anne sniffed. The eggs. She ran to the kitchen just as the fire alarm began to trill loudly. Grabbing them off the stove, she rushed to the back door, throwing the pan and burnt on eggy mess into the sand. First time I see that, Fenley remarked to Michael. He nodded. You stay put. Bare feet in glass. I get broom. Fenley moved around him. He ignored her, picking up the chair, avoiding the glass. He used the chair to stand on, took the cover off of the trilling fire alarm cover, and yanked out the battery. There was merciful silence afterward. Could have cut feet! Fenley shook her head as she swept up the mess. Michael ignored her and went to the deck to find Anne. She was leaning against the railing, looking at the waves. The pan was in the sand below. Michael leaned on the railing and looked at the pan. It was probably a good thing he couldn't say anything. He didn't think there was anything to say about that pan that wouldn't get a man into trouble. As for the kiss, his body was still thrumming. He reached over to take her hand, and she pulled away from him. He watched her with concern. Anne stared at the water. I'm sorry, Michael. I shouldn't have kissed you. It wasn't right. We can't repeat it. He reached out, but she backed away, looking brittle. Excuse me. She walked inside, and he turned to watch the waves, thinking. She had initiated it, but now regretted the kiss. She was in love with Max, so why had she kissed him? He supposed, in the moment, he might remind her of his brother. It was a depressing thought. What was she doing? He was in love with someone else, and she had practically thrown herself at him. It was embarrassing. She went to get changed into some regular clothes. As she sorted through the selection she had brought, she thought about the kiss. He was an excellent kisser. Her toes had curled, his hot hands on her ribs. She wondered if it might have gone anywhere if Fen Lee hadn't come in and the eggs hadn't burned. Her life was such a mess. She grabbed her cell phone and called L. She needed a girl's night out. Michael was bored. He had books littering the entire house, and he couldn't read one of them. He couldn't call anyone. What would he do? Tap Morse code? He'd already jogged today. No one was around. Fen Lee had a school function for one of her kids, so he was supposed to make a simple sandwich for dinner. 
Anne was out with the girls, and he had refused to have anyone babysit him. He wanted to be independent. He also didn't feel like having a sandwich. Driven to the television out of desperation, he idly flipped through the channels. There was no baseball game. Football was going on, but he had never bothered to watch it. He played golf. He didn't watch it. That was boring. He spent fifteen minutes on the business channel before deciding that it didn't matter. That part of his life was over. He paused on the food channel. They were going to make a steak. Steak sounded good. He had steak in the freezer, didn't he? The chef promised that it would be easy to make with step-by-step -step instructions. Well, he had done company mergers. How hard could it be to cook a steak? Michael turned up the volume and dug around in the kitchen. They were talking about spices in the background. He was pretty sure Fenley had a number of spices. He wouldn't be able to read them, but he gave them a quick taste test. If it tasted good, he'd sprinkle some on the steak. Easy. He pulled out a frozen steak and looked at the television. His looked a little larger. They were talking of cuts of meat, and he really didn't know the difference between a T-bone or a portobello steak. Whatever. Meat was meat. They had theirs cooking already. Not wanting to get left behind, Michael pulled out a pan and set the steak in it. He put the flame on high and settled the pan on the stove. They talked about thyme and rosemary and all sorts of green little bits that looked like chopped grass. Michael carefully perused the spice rack, choosing at random, sniffing, and then tasting. One made his tongue feel on fire. He grabbed a glass of water and downed it. He threw a couple pinches of the ones he liked on, plus some salt and pepper. Who said cooking was difficult? They were going to put together some potatoes in a sauce. Hmm. Michael rummaged in the pantry and pulled out a couple of potatoes. His were much larger than the tiny ones they had on the screen. Well, he'd just have two instead of the dozen they were making. They put them in boiling water. He could do that. He grabbed a pan, filled it with water, and plunked in the two potatoes, and then sat that on the stove, cranking the burner to high. He pulled the beer out of the fridge and took a drink while he watched the host and chef gather the ingredients for the sauce. They were cutting up a tomato. He'd seen some in the fridge. He grabbed it out and got another pan on the stove. By the time he found the cutting board, they were dicing onions. They were going a little fast for him. Well, did it matter if the tomato was cut perfectly? He was just going to eat it anyway. He set it on the cutting board and then hit it firmly with a pot, causing it to flatten, juice flying. Maybe that hadn't been the best idea. He looked at the tomato and shrugged. It looked broken up to him. It was pretty much the same as dicing. He slid it from the cutting board into the pan onto the stove. He doubted he could flatten an onion like that. Grabbing one from the fridge, he wondered if the peel was supposed to be taken off or left on. Carrots? Did he even have those? He looked at the television. They were going too fast. He looked in the fridge and pantry and came up with a carrot. Grabbing a knife, he cut up the onion and carrot, tossing the pieces in the pan. They weren't as small or as nice as the chef on the television had made, but they would have to do. Wine? Michael shrugged and poured some beer on the tomato, onion, and carrot mix. Should be fine. Improvising was a way of life. Who said he couldn't be spontaneous? He had this. He poked the mixture with a wooden spoon, feeling the master of his own kitchen. Watch out, Fenley. They pulled out a plate and set a slice of lemon on it. He had lemon, but he didn't see the point of cutting out a slice for one steak. He pulled out his plate and set it on the counter. A sprig of dill? He didn't need the garnish. Michael took another swig of beer. They were talking about the chef's new cookbook. Everything seemed to be well in hand, so Michael went back to the couch and found the remote. He flipped through a couple of channels. Nothing was on. He didn't care for crime shows or daytime therapy. Some woman was yelling in Italian at another man. There was a show on fishing. He hadn't fished in ages. He used to fish off the dock with his brothers, releasing all the fish back. He had always sailed. He wondered when he would be allowed to sail again. He switched through the channels until he returned to the cooking show. They were taking the potatoes out of the water. Michael got up to rescue his potatoes. He didn't have one of those fancy scoops like they used, all mesh, but there was a scoop with some holes in it. He pulled the two potatoes out of the water and put them on his plate. The steak was steaming. The sauce was smoking black. The tomato, black and red, seared to the bottom of the pan. The onion and carrot stood pathetically surrounded by black. 
Michael grabbed the pan and put it in the sink, running water over it. Steam flew up and the smoke alarm trilled. Ears aching, he grabbed a chair, popped off the cover for the smoke alarm, and pulled the battery. The deafening trill abruptly stopped. He got off the chair and grabbed the beer, having a drink. Well, okay, no sauce. It wasn't a big deal. They were plating the steak and ooing and aahing over the plate on television. It looked good. Michael looked at his own steak. It didn't look quite right. Maybe it would taste better than it looked. Shrugging, he slid it out of the pan and onto the plate beside the two potatoes. He made sure the stove was off and shut off the gush of water in the sink now that the burned food had cooled. Grabbing a new beer and his plate, he headed for the couch to taste his feast. He cut into the steak and examined it. It looked burned on the bottom, and the top was nearly raw. Was he supposed to have flipped it? They hadn't said anything on television about doing that. He hadn't seen them do it, but then again he hadn't watched the whole time since he had been trying to find ingredients. He took a tentative bite, then spit it back out onto the plate. He took a swig of beer to get rid of the taste. There was no describing the mess of spices and improperly cooked meat. Taking a deep breath, Michael took a fork to a potato. It was rock hard. The fork was stuck in it. Michael stared at the television where the host was taking a bite and proclaiming the meal superb. They were frauds. He got up and put his plate in the sink, the potatoes rolling into the water. The kitchen was a disaster. Disappointed, he made himself a sandwich. Anne met Jeanie at their usual bar. She was surprised that Elle wasn't there yet. It had taken some convincing from Michael that she should even go, but she missed hanging out with the girls, and surely Michael would be fine for one evening without her. "'You should think about mingling more. There are some good single mixers coming up.' Jeanie took a drink from her beer. "'You won't find anyone if you don't go looking.' "'I don't have time.' Anne stirred her daiquiri. "'I almost didn't come tonight.' "'There's a fundraising golf event on Friday,' Jeanie persisted as she crunched on a complimentary pretzel. "'I heard a lot of singles are going to be there. Tretton Bailey, the mayor's son, Earl Minton, he has oil money in, but he isn't great to look at. Oh, I know. George Stapleton, he owns a string of dental offices. You know how to play golf, and I've got an extra ticket since my dear Mr. Devell broke his ankle. Turns out you cannot golf in an air cast.' "'I can't,' Anne shook her head. "'I have to take Michael to the dentist. "'He has his annual checkup. "'Jeanie looked at her with sympathy. "'You're doing it all again.' "'What do you mean?' Anne asked, "'sipping her daiquiri through the straw. "'You're his caretaker. "'You're taking care of his appointments, "'his wants, his needs. "'You're putting him first and fretting over him.' "'Jeanie asked the all-important question. "'Who is fretting over you, honey?' "'Someone needs to look after him,' Anne said defensively. "'He has two brothers,' Jeanie sighed. "'Look, you quit being his secretary so that you could follow your dreams to have a family. "'Now you've just replaced the title of secretary to nursemaid. "'You're doing the exact same thing you were before and are no closer to being a wife and having children. "'If he hasn't figured out that you love him by now and acted on it, he isn't in love with you. "'He's just in love with the comfort of having you around to do everything for him.' Have some pride, and stop being his personal maid. I am not his nursemaid, Anne said without much conviction. Sure, honey. Jeanie reflected on it. No, I think it's worse. I think you're like his favorite blanket that he keeps taking around for comfort, but nothing else. Or maybe you're just his mom. His mom? Anne said, incredulous. You do everything a mom does. You've been momming him for years. Jeanie sipped her drink. I know. I got to watch the whole show. Anne put down her drink, feeling hollow inside. Jeanie was right. She had made the same horrible mistake. She was still tied to Michael, unable to take any steps to her future because of her dedication to him. She couldn't believe she hadn't seen it. She hadn't wanted to see it, she reflected ruefully. She loved taking care of Michael. But Jeanie was right. Michael wasn't taking care of her in return. Look, there's Elle, finally. Jeanie waved to Elle. Elle slipped into the booth. Evan was being difficult. Sorry I'm so late. 
No worries, Jeanie said. Mel looked at Anne in concern. Is everything all right, Anne? I've done it again, Anne whispered. I've let Michael become my focus, and I've stopped focusing on myself. Oh, Anne, Mel reached for a hand. It's understandable with the surgery and his recovery. We really appreciate the time you've put into taking care of him. Anne swallowed thickly. But it doesn't done any good. He doesn't love me. He just loves that I take care of everything, then he doesn't have to. L didn't know what to say. Jeanie flagged down a waiter, ordering drinks for all of them. Anne shook her head. I'm going to pass. I'm going back to the house. I need to think. Anne, do you want a ride? L offered. No, I'll call a cab. She fished out some money for her daiquiri. Are you sure? L asked. I don't mind driving you. No. Anne drew in a shaky breath. She felt like Elle might talk her into something, like staying with Michael, which was exactly what she really wanted to do. She just wanted to stay under different circumstances. How had she let her life become this? Dedicated to a man who only thought of her as a convenience, a friend at best. She blindly left the bar, and fortunately there was a cab waiting right at the curb. He took MasterCard so she got in. On the hour drive to the beach house, she tried to make sense of her obsession with Michael and struggled with the despair of knowing she had wasted twenty-plus years of her life hoping for something which had never happened, was never going to happen. Anne let herself into the house. It smelled like something had been on fire. She made her way to the kitchen and saw the dismantled smoke detector. Worried, she began to search the house for Michael, only to find him in the living room asleep in the leather recliner. He looked okay. She breathed a small prayer of thanksgiving, then went to investigate the kitchen. It looked like a bomb had gone off. There were spices scattered everywhere. Pans were in the sink, on the stove, on the counter. Something red coagulated on the counter and floor. There was a fork in a raw potato. What had he done? Fen Lee was going to have a fit. Anne just looked at the mess and shook her head. This was what Jeanie was talking about. Anne was a full-time caretaker. She was his wife without any of the benefits of being a wife. She slipped back into her old role of putting Michael first and her wants and desires second. She was forty years old. She wanted Michael as her husband and babies and this house. Yet he never made a move on her. He was contented letting her pick up after him, organize his life, make sure everything was good. He was comfortable. He didn't love her. He didn't want to be her husband. He didn't want to be the father of her babies. And so, if she wanted the happily ever after, she was going to have to get it elsewhere. Anne went to the living room and sat on the coffee table, watching him sleep. The ache gnawed at her. How was she ever going to get past him? Jeanie was right. She had to let him go. She had to go cold turkey. Her heart rebelled at the thought, but she didn't want to be eighty years old, full of regrets, childless, and trying to coax him to eat at the old age home. That was where she was headed if things continued like they were. It hurt. It hurt so badly to think about. Anne wiped away the tears as another sob came. She just couldn't do this any more, no matter how much she loved him. Loving him wasn't enough. He needed to love her in return, and since he couldn't, it was time to leave. She fumbled in her bag, pulled out her cell phone, and called for a cab. It would be an expensive ride back to her apartment after the expensive ride here, but there was nothing she could do about that. Michael stirred as she finished her call. He looked at her in confusion and sat up, reaching out to touch her tear-stained face, which set off another round of crying. When he tried to hug her, she pulled back, standing up, trying to get out of his reach. She wasn't going to get sucked in any more. I'm sorry, Michael, she said shakily. I can't do this any more. It was obvious that he didn't understand. He put out his hands helplessly. I can't be your caretaker, your assistant. Basically, I can't be your mom any more, she hiccuped. I'll send for my things tomorrow, but I'm going home tonight. Michael stood and shook his head. I already called the cab. Please don't make this harder than what it is. He motioned and grabbed those silly cards the hospital had given him. He held up the one with a question mark on it. Why? 
Anne asked. I am not happy here. Please, just let me go. He looked sad and disappointed, uncertain and a little lost. I'll call L in the morning. They'll be able to sort out your appointments and such with the day planner. Even now she was trying to take care of him. She took a deep breath. I'm going to wait outside. Please, don't follow me. He watched her go to the door. Stay, he croaked the word. Puddle. Puddle, stay. She gave another sob and leaned her head on the door. It took a minute to compose herself enough to look at him through a sheen of tears. Goodbye, Michael. And then she was gone. He sat down slowly, bewildered and alone. Jeanie had insisted that she go to the golf tournament, and supposed it was for the best. She needed to get thoughts of Michael out of her head and start searching for someone to be the father of her children, the husband of her life. It was time to move on, and she was determined to do her best. Jeanie had managed to introduce Anne to Earl Milton before the tournament started. He and Anne had chatted amicably for ten minutes, and then had to join their golfing partners for the tee-off. There were supposed to be cocktails afterward. They would make the effort to meet as many eligible men afterward as possible. Jeanie was man-hunting, a sport that she used to be very proficient at before she settled for Mr. Duvel. It's not like he's terrible or anything, he's just so... Anne was having a hard time describing Earl. He's like a basset hound, something you pet and then ignore. Jeanie grabbed her putter out of her bag. Jeanie! It's true, she insisted. He's not Prince Charming, but he's got good money and a sweet temperament. He agreed with everything I said. Anne shook her head and watched Jeanie sink the ball. I'm not sure I could live with someone who is constantly trying to please me. Oh, I don't know, Jeanie said. Sometimes it's good to know you'll be the one in charge. His wife, whoever her patient soul may be, will manage his life quite nicely, and he'll be eternally grateful. He's not the one for me, Anne said firmly. Jeanie put her hands on her hips. First rule. You need to have an open mind. None of them are Michael. You've been dreaming of Michael's Mr. Wright for twenty years. You're not going to be ecstatically, completely happy with anyone who takes that dream spot away from him. You need to settle for Mr. Okay, I'll have babies with him. Second rule, not all the men we meet here are hanging out for a wife. You're forty. You don't have time to convince a man you're his permanent honey. You're going to have to choose from the very limited selection of those who are looking for a miss right now. Don't strike Earl off the list until you've viewed the set of candidates. There are only three, and I'm not sure Trenton Bailey is actually seriously looking for a wife. Maybe I should try speed dating, or an online site, Anne offered weakly. Sure thing. My name's Anne, I'm forty, I'm looking to get married and have babies. I think that should scare them off. Jeanie rolled her eyes. Three respectable, independently wealthy men are here right now. You can be the stay-at-home mom you want to be. We just have to get one of those men interested in you. Anne nodded. She knew Jeanie was right. You should flirt more. Stroke their egos. Jeanie lined up to take her shot at the next hole. She swung and the ball sailed away. Men like that. Is that rule number three? Anne asked dryly. Sure. They played on, and at the whole nine rest area, Jeanie introduced Anne to Trenton Bailey. Trenton was tall, blonde, tan, muscular. His perfect white smile actually sparkled. He had a weak handshake and bad breath. He also talked exclusively about himself. Since they didn't have a job or do anything of value, Anne found him rather boring. He said he was looking for Miss Wright to become Mrs. Bailey, but Anne thought he wanted someone who would make him look good, and he was probably picky. His shoes coordinated with his golf bag, something that he pointed out. It wasn't going to happen. She couldn't see Trenton with children. Children were messy, demanded attention, generally disrupted a person's social life. Trenton wasn't going to like that. He felt the entire universe revolved around him. She regrouped with Jeanie at the tenth hole. Strike Trenton from the list. I am not getting sucked into the selfish void that is Mr. Bailey. Don't be so choosy, Jeanie admonished. He's a hottie. He might be, but he's not dad material. Anne felt this was a valid excuse, even for Eugenie. Well, there's still Earl, as long as you can convince his mother, 
Jeanie grinned. Anne groaned. Are you serious? Hey, she managed Earl for forty-three years. I think she just wants the perfect daughter-in-law. Anne rolled her eyes. She didn't need a mother-in-law that wanted to share the relationship. Earl was not worth that. Not that he was on her short list. She'd have to be pretty desperate. Anne tried to concentrate on her golf game. She was an okay golfer. Jeanie was spectacular. By the time they finished the eighteenth hole, she was tired. They headed to the clubhouse to see if they could snag a few moments with George Stapleton or see if anyone else might fit the bill for what Anne wanted. A single man, ready to get married and have children. Jeanie left to mingle with a few people and stalk the prey. Anne went to the bar and ordered a drink. She was going to need all the alcohol she could get to cope. Now, I believe I know every member of the country club, yet I am certain I have not seen you before, a man said as he sidled up to a bar beside Anne. He ordered a scotch. Anne forced herself to smile and turned to see George Stapleton. You're George Stapleton, she said a little stupidly. What were the chances? George smiled his perfect smile. You recognize me from the commercials. I'm afraid I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. Anne Schaefer. I partnered with Jeanie DeVal today for the tournament. She held out her hand, and instead of shaking it, he gave it a kiss on the knuckles. Did people still do that? Charmed. He released her hand. Put Miss Schaefer's drink on my tab, would you? Oh, no, you don't need to, Anne protested. Please allow me to he said, taking a sip of the scotch. Do you enjoy golfing? Yes. I'm not as good at it as I used to be. I'm out of practice, she exclaimed. She could see Jeanie had spotted her talking to George and had put up her hands, two thumbs up, in the middle of an elite country club. Anne tore her gaze away from her silly friend and focused on George. Well, then, we'll have to rectify that and get you a membership here, George smiled again. He did have a nice smile. He wasn't as handsome as Michael, but he wasn't unpleasant to look at. He had minty breath. He had good financial prospects being the owner of a chain of dental offices. He was making an effort. Anne supposed she could do worse. A half hour of pleasant chatter later, he had her number and promised to go out next Friday night to a nice little art fundraiser for children with disabilities. It made him dad material. Anne swallowed hard and smiled. George Stapleton was on the list. Chapter 7 What happened to Anne? Noah asked as he grabbed an apple. Anne had been gone for a little over a week. Michael still felt himself wandering the house searching for her. He was bored and heartsick. Noah! El hissed and gave him a warning look before glancing guiltily at Michael. What? She was all gung-ho to help, and now she's disappeared. Did you guys have an argument or something? He bit into the apple with a crunch. An argument Michael could understand. Anne had just decided that she wasn't happy here, wasn't happy with him. Michael didn't want to talk about it. He didn't know what to do. What he did know is that he wanted Anne to be happy, so if she needed to be somewhere else to be happy, then he wouldn't stand in her way as much as he might want to. He went to the deck, leaving the door open behind him. Anne need to take care of some personal things, El said to Noah. Michael could hear her just barely from where he stood. He knew that El and Anne were friends. She probably knew what was going on with Anne, but he didn't know if he could find a way to ask her. Instead, he decided to eavesdrop shamelessly. Is she coming back? I don't think so. She wants different things different things. Like what? Anne always struck me as the type to get what she wants. Michael could imagine Elle giving Noah an exasperated look. Noah was brilliant at the science of his job, but when it came to the nuances of people, he was terrible. Worse than Michael, and that was saying something. She's going on a date tonight with George Stapleton. Michael felt like he'd been punched in the stomach. He leaned back against the siding of the house, his Anne dating someone else. If she wanted to date someone so badly to try to get past Max, she could have dated him. Then again, he was Max's brother. Maybe it was too painful for her. 
Isn't that the guy who owns the chain of dentist clinics? He's always on television with the bad haircut, Noah asked. He and Anne hit it off at the golf tournament. Elle didn't sound very happy for her friend. I guess she's moving on. Michael didn't want her to move on, whatever that meant. He wanted her back. He swallowed thickly and wondered what he could do about it. Could Anne be happy with this guy? She said she wasn't happy here with him. He wondered what he could do to make her happy. The only thing he could think to do was ask her. Ask her. He almost gave a bitter laugh but stopped himself. He didn't want Noah or Elle to know that he'd been able to hear them. He'd have to try to make the effort. He'd go to Anne and ask her what he could do to make her happy. He'd make her understand that he wanted to try. He couldn't imagine life without her. The last few days without her had been horrible, lonely. He pushed away from the house and decided to take a walk and look at the sailboat. He would check the lines and make sure it was secure. It felt like it was going to storm. While he was looking the boat over, maybe his mind would come up with a solution of how he was going to get to Anne's apartment and communicate effectively enough to bring her back. He didn't want Elle and Noah's help with this. If it went sour, he would like to lick his wounds in private rather than see him pity him even more. An hour later, he cleaned the entire boat methodically. He was finishing by polishing up some of the chrome detailing when Noah came aboard. "'You still have the boat?' He ran a hand down the side of a rolled-up sail before having a seat. She must be thirty years old. Thirty-five next week. He'd gotten it three weeks after his fifteenth birthday to replace the smaller one he'd grown up with. Remember when we used to take it out? I'd never been so sick. Noah laughed, remembering. Noah was a horrible sailor. A rowboat on calm waters was the most he could handle. Michael nodded in agreement. Good memories. Noah reminisced. I don't think it helped that Max kept trying to kill us every time we let him try his hand at the wheel. Max had been reckless. He was young back then and always pushing everything to the limit. He lived a charmed life, never being seriously hurt despite the crazy stunts he had pulled. More than once he'd caused Michael a fright. Finally, Max had settled and matured. Paget was the final piece of Max's puzzle. Michael was glad for his youngest brother. Remember when he capsized this boat? Dad was so mad he threatened to sell it. He threatened, but he couldn't sell what he didn't own. Michael had made sure the boat was in his name. Even then, he'd understood his father. Thankfully, he and Mum were on that cruise for a couple more months, and he wouldn't have to deal with them until they came back. He loved Mom. He just didn't want to be smothered by her right now. Dad? Dad wouldn't understand. Noel reached out and gave a shoulder squeeze. We'll be okay, Michael. I know this thing with Anne is hard, but you'll get through it. He wouldn't have to get through it. He had a plan. Admittedly, it wasn't a great plan, but it was all he had, and he was going to try. He wasn't going to just stand by and let her walk away. Not his Anne. He nodded to Noah and put away the rag and cleaner. The boat was as good as it got these days. He supposed most people would have replaced it for something newer. However, he didn't want to. It was a piece of his childhood. He and Noah walked back from the marina to the house, both content to watch the water and not speak. In the house he stemmed his impatience and played with the twins. Ethan kept coming over to him with his book, demanding in toddler gibberish that he read it. He pulled the boy onto his lap and quietly pretended to read, none of the words making sense coming from his mouth, but his nephew didn't seem to mind. Finally the boys got tired and Noah with L departed with the twins. Fenley was due to arrive any minute to make supper. He didn't want any. He didn't need any. He grabbed the address book that was in his study and brought it to the kitchen. What he needed was some help to do what he needed to do tonight. He counted out the tabs, knowing that Anne would be under the S's for Schaefer, letter 19 of the alphabet. He remembered writing it in here. Now he needed Fenley to find it for him. He grabbed a piece of paper from the study and a pencil. He stroked out the main lines and began sketching. Soon a face stared back at him. With long lines he put in Anne's hair. He had to erase her eyes and redo them a couple of times. He set down the pencil when Fenley arrived and helped her to bring in the groceries. Why you help? I know, old lady. Fenley still gave him four bags to carry. How are you today? He motioned that he had an okay day. She nodded wisely and pointed to the sketch. You miss Missy Anne. 
Michael grabbed the sketch and put it beside the address book. He pointed to the pages and the sketch. Please let Fenley understand. What this? She started reading the addresses, then looked at him. What you want? He pointed to both of them again. Find an address? Fenley wrinkled her brow. Michael nodded. He grabbed a bundle of flowers that she had purchased to liven up the house. She always brought flowers on Friday for the weekend. He mimed, presenting them to Fan Lee and pointed to the sketch. "'You gonna get her back?' Fan Lee was excited now. "'About time. No other pretty ladies putting up with you.' Michael laughed and pointed to the address book. "'Okay, okay, you bossy!' She perused the book, reading the names out loud until she found Anne's, and he grabbed the highlighter he had taken from the desk in his study. She directed him, and he highlighted the appropriate address. "'How you going to get there?' Fen Lee asked. He thought he'd take a cab. He pulled out his credit card and laid it on the counter. Fen Lee shook her head. "'No, no cab. You go change. Looks sexy for Anne. I have better idea.' He watched as she pulled out her cell phone and chattered away in Vietnamese. "'There. Nephew, come. He drive.' She shooed him away with her hands. "'Shower. Look nice. Twenty minute. Nephew here.' Michael grinned and gave the tiny woman a hug. She hugged him back and then shoved him away. Go! He did. He showered, he shaved, he picked out a new suit to wear. He hadn't worn a suit since his last day at Ramsey Pharmaceuticals. He felt strangely nervous as he folded a knot into a tie with practice movements. Tonight meant so much. He was downstairs before the nephew arrived. Fenley looked him over, approving. You handsome man, Mr. Michael. And lucky lady. He smiled his thanks. He hoped this would work. Moments later, Fenley was showing the address to her nephew, who carefully put it in the GPS on his phone. Michael grabbed a bouquet of flowers, and they were off in the nephew's rusty bucket of a car. It was small, and it didn't have the leg room that Michael needed, but he wasn't going to complain. His head touched the ceiling, and he could feel every bump in the road because the shocks were shot. Michael fiddled with his cuffs and tie. The nephew said nothing and Michael was grateful. He didn't know if the boy could speak English, and Michael didn't want to try to converse. As they got closer to Anne's apartment, Michael's trepidation and anxiety climbed. He tried to concentrate on the city and the people walking. Whatever he thought he might say or do when he had made this plan seemed silly now. This wasn't going to work. He closed his eyes and tried to regroup. He didn't know if it was going to work. It might. He would just wing it and do his best. He wanted Anne back. He wasn't going to get her back if he just sat at home and hoped. This was the only thing he could do. After the internal pep talk, Michael felt only marginally better. However, it didn't matter how he felt. They were here. Michael opened the door and folded his body from the passenger seat, taking the flowers. Good luck, Fenley's nephew said in perfect English. Michael looked at him in surprise, then nodded. He approached the lobby and found the daunting row of buttons. Anne was apartment 506. Surely it would be on the fifth row, the sixth one in. He pushed the button. There was no response. He looked at his watch. He hoped he wasn't too late. Michael pressed the button again. What? a cranky old lady said. Not the right button. Michael didn't know what to do. He couldn't press buttons at random, hoping to get Anne. "'That you, Larry?' the voice asked. Michael tried to lie and say yes, but no sound came out. It was like his brain had lost the word on the way to his tongue, and nothing worked. He tried again. "'Nope.' The old lady muttered something about old men losing keys all the time, and the door buzzed and opened. Michael grabbed the door. He tried to say thank you, but that didn't work either. Instead, he made his way to the elevator. Then he rethought that plan. If he went to the wrong floor, he could get lost trying to get back to the right floor. Knowing his luck, he'd count buttons again and end up on the sixth floor rather than the fifth. No. Better to take the stairs and be certain. It took a few minutes to find the stairwell. He'd never taken them in Anne's apartment, always using the elevator before. Five flights of stairs later, he was a little out of breath, and the flowers were looking a little wilted from his slightly panicked grip. He made his way to the elevators, then knew the rest of the way from memory. The numbers on the doors were mixed up. He was fairly certain this was her door. 
there was only one way to find out. He knocked. There was a rustling on the other side, and Anne swung the door open with a smile. Shock replaced the smile as she saw him. She was beautiful. She had her hair up and a navy curve-hugging dress on. His heart went to his throat, and Michael knew that even if he had been able to speak properly, he wouldn't have been able to say anything. He held out the flowers. They were sunflowers and daisies and seemed highly inappropriate for the classy vision before him. She took the bouquet with some confusion. Michael, what are you doing here? He tried to speak. He should have known it wasn't going to happen. He went into her apartment, shutting the door, and took her hands. The flowers were in the way, so he grabbed them and set them to the side table before grabbing her hands again. Michael, I can't do this right now. I have a date. He raised her hands and kissed the back of a hand and laid it over his heart. Surely she understood. Anne closed her eyes. I don't understand. There was a knock on the door. Michael wanted to shout at the man to go away. That's George. I need to go. Look, you can stay here and I'll call you a cab when I get home. Michael pulled her hands out of his, her movements jerky as she grabbed the clutch from the side table. Desperate, Michael grabbed her hand and sank to one knee, begging. Anne looked at him sadly. Michael, I'm not coming back. He watched in disbelief as she opened the door and walked out of his life again. Michael sat slumped on Anne's couch. He felt like the entire world had died around him. He took a deep breath and decided to go home. There was no point in staying. Anne had made her choice. It wasn't him. He locked the door behind him and left the apartment. People walked the streets intent on going where they were going. Traffic was loud. He looked around and a taxi pulled up in front of him. He got in. Where to? Michael opened his mouth to reply, then shut it. He didn't have an address on him for the beach house. He might have a credit card, but he couldn't get home without being able to give directions. Buddy, you okay? Michael gave a short nod and got out of the cab. He would walk. It would be a long walk, but maybe he'd get there before Fenley started breakfast. Did it really matter? He began the long trek. He was going to regret wearing Italian leather loafers. Well, sneakers didn't exactly go with the suit. An hour later, and the loafers were being annoying. The mass of people had thinned out, and he came to a poorer section of town. People were begging for money. He found a discount shoe store and bought a new pair of runners. Outside, he exchanged the footwear, putting the loafers in the shopping bag, easy to carry. He was about to get up when a dog came over, sniffing his feet. It was pathetically thin. Michael tried to push it away, however it seemed to think that he was petting at it, and sidled closer. There was a hot dog vendor at the edge of the park nearby. Michael went over and held up two fingers. He pulled out cash, and the man gave him change. Michael laid the two hot dogs on the ground for the dog to eat and walked away. He was perhaps half a block away when the dog caught up to him. Michael tried to shoot away, but the stubborn canine just kept pace. Finally, he ignored it. At some point, it would get tired and go home. An hour later, the dog was limping beside him. Michael looked at it. It sat, panting and wagging its stump of a tail. It held up a paw, licking at it. Michael sighed and knelt to see what was wrong with the paw. It was hot to the touch, and there was swelling. He could clearly see a sore full of infection. It was surprising the dog had kept pace with him this long. It licked his hand. It wasn't his dog. Ten more minutes of walking, Michael couldn't take it anymore. He picked up the dog. It wasn't light. Probably thirty pounds. He grunted and kept walking. Five blocks later, he saw a veterinary clinic that was still open. He walked in and received admonitions about bringing in the dog without a collar or a leash. Michael put down the dog. Then he plunked down his gold credit card. When the lady at the desk realized he couldn't speak, she spoke louder. Michael was unamused. An hour later, they had determined his dog was a boxer and Boston Terrier mixed with something undetermined. She was still puppy and likely to get bigger. She was already spayed. They drained and cleaned the infection, bandaging the paw. After a bath, he could see the brown speckles and the black patches on her short coat as her white areas shined. Her pushed-in nose twitched as shots of antibiotics and vaccinations happened. A collar and a leash were had. 
flea and heartworm medication were added to the bill. So was a small bag of dog food. Michael wondered how he was going to carry it all and the dog. Finally, they were finished, and he found he was the proud owner of a dog. He absently petted her as he was handed the vaccination records. With a tight smile, he led the pet out of the building. For another hour, they walked until the dog began to limp again. Sighing, Michael shifted the bags and picked up the dog. She settled her head on his shoulder and let out a gusty sigh as he carried her. He felt like one of those people who was carrying around a package. That's what he should have done, mailed her home. He had a bitter laugh at that, and it started to rain lightly. He decided the dog's name was FedEx because he was carrying her around like a package. She didn't seem to object. Hours later, he was sitting on a bench in the dark with FedEx shivering beside him, pressed against his side. The rain was pouring down, and both of them were soaked. He'd thrown out the loafers. They were one less thing to carry. His feet were sore. So was his back. He petted the dog and debated what he should do. He was maybe halfway to the beach house. It would have been smarter to go to the condo, as it was much closer. However, he hadn't taken his keys when he'd left to try to bring back Anne. Now there was no Anne, but he'd gotten a dog. When he was a child, he'd wanted a dog. His father had unequivocally said no. So there had never been any pets. Well, he was keeping this one. Getting up, he decided there was nothing to do but continue. It was in the early hours of the morning, and nothing was open. He dumped the dog food in the trash to lighten his load. Fenley could buy some. Michael picked up FedEx again. It was hours past sunrise as he trudged up to the house. The rain had stopped. He had blisters on his heels. The front door was unlocked, and Fenley rushed to meet him as he entered. How it go? Missy Ann like? She halted in shock. What happened? He didn't even look at her. He just wanted to have a shower, change into dry clothes, fall into bed, and let despair swallow him whole. He put down the dog, kicked off his shoes, and squelched in his sock feet to his room, dripping water everywhere. FedEx followed. Forget the shower. He'd had six hours of rain poured on him, and he was too tired for it. He showered enough, he decided. He peeled off his clothes and dried himself and the dog with a towel before getting dressed in comfortable sweats. He wished he had some scotch or whiskey in the house. He could down a bottle or two right now. FedEx sighed gustily and watched him with sad brown eyes. It was probably better that he didn't get drunk. He'd never been drunk a day in his life. He didn't know if he'd be a mean drunk or just a sad one. Michael fell across the bed and closed his eyes. Moments later, the bed dipped as FedEx joined him. She sniffed around and curled up next to him with her head on the pillow next to his. He didn't even care. The dog was waking him up. It kept nosing his hand around and licking it. Michael jerked back and pretended he was sleeping. He didn't want to get up and face the world yet. FedEx snuffled against his neck and Michael squirmed away. Finally, when she whined, he sat up and ran a hand through his hair. The dog bounded to the door. He got up and let her out. Belatedly, he remembered all the money he put into her and grabbed the leash and collar. He ran after her, blisters protesting. FedEx did her business and came straight back to him, dancing merrily in the sand. Michael sighed and walked back up the deck stairs, the dog following. They made their way to the kitchen. It must be late afternoon. Fenley wasn't there yet, but a bowl of water and some dog kibble had made it to a dish on the floor. FedEx consumed a lot hungrily and slurped up some water. There was a box of colorful bags on the counter. He picked it up. From the pictures he could see that they were scented poop bags for the dog. He was not picking up FedEx's poop. However, if he didn't, it would be all over the beach, and he really didn't want to step in FedEx's poop. He supposed he was picking it up. He had no idea what he was supposed to do with it afterward. He sat down in the box and eyed the dog. Michael wondered how often a dog pooped in a day. FedEx was roaming and sniffing. Michael decided to make coffee and eat some cereal. As he ate, there were two brown eyes watching him mournfully. She was sitting and staring, her head moving with the movement of the spoon. Rolling his eyes, Michael left a little in the bottom of the bowl and fed it to her. She gobbled it up, and he put the empty dish in the sink. He stretched. He was still tired. He decided to head back to bed. FedEx followed him. 
He decided that she was a good dog already. Noah would hate her. Max would love her. They both settled on the bed, and he reached out a hand, stroking her short, silky fur. He missed Anne. The child yelled gleefully as it came into the bedroom. Michael popped open an eye to see Evan's face right in his toddler breath fanning him. He sighed and sat up, pulling the little boy onto the bed. Immediately, Evan reached out and grabbed FedEx by an ear. The dog pulled her head back and stared at the intruder. Michael hoped that FedEx was okay with kids. She pursed her lips and let out a puff, not quite a bark. Then her head swiveled to look at the door. Expecting to see Ethan next, Michael was surprised to see Elle carrying her other son. She put Ethan carefully on the bed, looking at FedEx. Ben Lee tells me you went to talk to Anne and came home with a dog. She let FedEx sniff her hand and then gently petted her. What happened? He didn't want to talk about it. He focused on Evan instead, encouraging the boy to jump on the bed, something Elle never liked. Obviously it didn't go well, Elle remarked dryly. No kidding, Michael thought. Not to be left out, Ethan began jumping too. FedEx retreated behind Michael and stared over his shoulder at the two boys. "'If you don't have anything to say, I'll call Anne and get the story from her,' Elle warned mildly. She caught Ethan before he could fall off the bed. Michael didn't feel threatened. Let Elle call Anne. He was surprised she hadn't already done so. It had been a few days since the ill-fated trip to Anne's apartment, and Michael had sulked the entire time, mostly sleeping and taking care of the dog. Fenley had told him he probably needed antidepressants. He didn't see how they would bring Anne back. He figured she was probably just angry at him because he wasn't eating what she cooked and baked. Fenley told me you're not doing so well. Elle eyed him critically. You look like you could use a shower. A shower, a shave, and new clothes. It had seemed like too much effort, so he hadn't bothered. Now he felt a little grimy and ashamed that Elle should see him so. He sighed, handing her Evan, and trudged to the closet. FedEx followed him closely, keeping an eye on the intruders. "'Does the dog have a name?' Elle had followed him, too, watching him grab sweats at random. He nodded. "'I suppose that means you're keeping her,' she asked. He looked at FedEx. She had stuck by him. She wasn't going to leave him. Even now she was by his side, looking up at him. He nodded again. Elle reached out and gave him a hug. Michael swallowed it against the thickness in his throat and hugged her back. I'll leave you to your shower. Come downstairs afterward. Fenley is going to make chocolate chip pancakes. Michael had existed on coffee and not much else since the debacle at Anne's apartment. He supposed he should eat something, even if he wasn't hungry. It would make Elle feel better. Anne had been seeing George Stapleton for a few weeks now. He was a little self-obsessed, but Anne had come to the conclusion that men generally were. He took her to all sorts of functions, and it was obvious he was pleased that she was on his arm. He felt that she made him look good. Anne did her best to be the perfect girlfriend. She was gracious. She maintained a classy image. She deferred to his judgment. In return, he was a perfect gentleman, opening doors, introducing her to his set of friends, paying for their entertainments. He was even a good kisser. Nothing earth-shattering, however, yet not repulsive either. He never pressed further than what she would allow for intimacy, something that she appreciated. He just wasn't Michael. They talked about his home in the city, a lovely historical three-bedroom apartment in a very sought-after neighborhood. They discussed the vacation home he had just purchased in Vermont for skiing. Anne wasn't really a cold-weather sports person. She preferred being warm, but she allowed that she could give it a try. He had gotten her the golf membership at the country club. Her game was improving thanks to the practice she had playing with him. It really shouldn't have come as a surprise when, after dessert during dinner at the club, he got down on one knee, producing a ring that was far too big for Anne's liking. It was garish and large exuding wealth like George did. George wanted children. Little Stapleton heirs to the Stapleton Empire that he was continuing to build. At least they would have free dental care. Anne felt like a fraud as she smiled and accepted the proposal. Everyone clapped and congratulated them. 
She should be congratulated. She was getting what she wanted, right? Chapter 8 Michael wished he hadn't agreed to Thanksgiving. It was noisy. His family had invaded the beach house with good intentions and mountains of food, yet it felt hollow without Anne there. He knew they were trying to cheer him up. He just desperately wanted them to leave him alone. He sighed. He was going to do his best today. He was tired of the moping he had been doing for the past few weeks. He might not smile and be happy, but he would participate. They would appreciate that. He grabbed utensils to help set the table, but Paget and Elle shooed him out of the kitchen. They told him to join the guys watching television. He didn't want to watch the game. He had never watched football. He didn't know the rules, the teams, who was the favorite. Michael sighed again. He noticed that FedEx had abandoned her post at the kitchen, begging for scraps from the dinner preparation. Michael wandered over to the sliding door and saw FedEx barking and jumping in the sand. Silly dog, it was cold outside. The wind was biting at this time of year and FedEx had a short coat. Michael leaned to the left to get a better look at what the dog was barking at and took a choking breath as he saw Ethan walking on the mole. He felt like a brick had slammed into his chest. The mole was a line of rocks that helped to protect the marina from the wicked winter waves. Spray was bouncing up as the waves crashed into the rocks, making the mole slippery and dangerous. During calm weather, people fished off of it. In weather such as this, everyone avoided it, because a person could be swept away into the cold waters. It had happened in the past. People died that way. Michael wrenched open the sliding door, ran across the deck, and vaulted over the side of the railing. He had a moment of panic over the height while he was in midair, but then he hit the sand, rolling. His ankle hurt, yet he scrambled to his feet and ran as fast as he could through the sand, ignoring the pain, breath coming in gasps from the cold air. He was wearing only long shorts and a tee, his feet completely bare. It had been hot in the house with the kitchen cooking enough food to feed a small army. Outside, he swore he could see his breath as he raced across the sand toward the mole, praying Ethan wouldn't fall, desperately hoping he reached the toddler in time. FedEx jumped beside him, running along, barking excitedly. Michael tried not to trip over the dog as he made the turn, and without breaking stride started up the straight rocky shelf toward the toddler who was being sprayed by the water. For a moment, Michael panicked when he lost sight of the boy as a wave crashed over the mole, but Ethan reappeared on the other side of the water as it dispersed over the rocks, unharmed and still toddling over the uneven surface. Making the last of the distance, gasping, lungs burning, Michael fell to his knees and wrapped his arms around the little boy. Ethan was soaked and chatted happily at Michael's ear and toddler nonsense. A wave came up and Michael had to steady himself under the force of it as the water crashed over both of them. If he hadn't gotten to Ethan, it was certain the boy would have been swept into the waters. Michael hugged his nephew, relieved, thanking God that he was safe. A shout sounded from behind him, and Michael turned to see Noah and Max coming up the mole. He walked back to meet them part way, holding Ethan. The boy seemed to think it was one big adventure, even though it was obvious that he was cold. Noah hurried up and took his son in his arms, grateful. He hugged him hard. We should get back to the beach. It's not safe here, Max said. The wind was whipping at them all and the cold spray of the water soaking their clothes. Michael looked around. He didn't see FedEx. The dog had been running, jumping, and barking right beside him the whole time, but now she was nowhere to be seen. It wasn't right. She barely ever left his side. Michael? He shook his head at Max's query, not even looking at him. The dog wasn't on the beach or the mole which could only mean that she'd been swept off when that wave had crashed over them. Panic curled in Michael's stomach. This was his dog. He walked further up the mole, scanning the water. Michael, what are you looking for? Noah shouted, nearly at the beach, holding on to Ethan. I think he's looking for the dog, Max shouted back. He scanned the area, looking for Michael's dog. It's just a dog. It'll come back, Noah yelled. It wasn't just a dog. It was FedEx the first pet he'd ever had. She was the only one who listened to him, even when what he said didn't make any sense, who understood when no one else did. 
She had been his lifeline, his reason for getting up in the morning after he didn't win Anne back. Michael swallowed thickly, worried about his dog. Suddenly, Michael saw FedEx struggling in the water. She was swimming, but Michael knew how cold and how big those waves were. He sprinted across the mole and dived out as far as he could. He was lucky only to hit his knee off a of rock during the dive. With the unpredictable waves, he could have been smashed back into the line of rocks that made up the mole. He broke water, gasping. It was stupid cold. Keeping up even strokes, Michael made it to the dog and grabbed her by the collar. For a moment, the swell brought him up and he could see both the mole and the beach. He debated his options. The mole was closer, but the water could kill them if it was too violent against the rocks. With today's wind and waves, it was likely they would be injured or worse. The beach was further, but the chance of getting there in one piece far better. Tugging on FedEx, Michael headed for the sand and prayed that no rip currents brought them out to sea. He didn't want Max or Noah trying their luck with that rowboat they used to play in when they were kids. Or worse, try to sail his boat in an attempt to rescue him and the dog. They were inexperienced amateurs at best when sailing would likely get hurt trying. It had been years since he had taken either of them out on the sailboat, and he knew that neither of them had sailed since. Michael doubled his efforts to try to get to shore pulling FedEx with him. Both of them were shivering uncontrollably. It was freezing. He'd be surprised if there wasn't a light dusting of snow tonight. He tried to think toasty thoughts of turkey and the fireplace. He would even watch the dumb football game. Anything except this penetrating cold. His feet and hands were numb. His teeth were chattering. Still, he swam. It was easier with a sort of side stroke to hold on to FedEx and make some progress. An arm came around him from behind, and Michael jerked in surprise. Hey, big brother, thought you could use a little help. Lean back and kick your legs, just like you taught me. It was Max. He was using the same technique Michael had taught him years ago when he was a kid to rescue a distressed or drowning swimmer smaller than himself. Well, Michael reflected ruefully, Max probably had thirty pounds or more of muscle on him and was an inch taller. He kicked his feet and let Max steer them towards the shore. It took both of Michael's hands to keep FedEx's head above the water now. The dog was paddling half-heartedly, eyes nearly closed. Finally, they reached the point where they could put their feet down and walk through the waves, chest deep. Noah waded out and grabbed the other side of Michael, helping to support his shivering form up to the beach. Elle and Paget stood in the sand, each toting a twin. Michael looked at the dog in his arms. FedEx was shivering, but was she breathing? I vote we all go inside and try to warm up, Max puffed. Ladies, why don't you find us some dry clothes and get towels ready? Paget nodded and quickly headed for the beach house. Elle remained, tears streaking down her face as she held Ethan, who had been wrapped in an adult hoodie. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Michael shook his head. He hefted FedEx. His lungs felt like they were on fire, but he managed a word. Barking. What? she asked, not comprehending. He repeated hefting the dog and again said, Barking, Ethan. The dog was barking at Ethan? Max supplied. Michael nodded tiredly. Barking. If you hadn't noticed the dog, would you have seen Ethan? Noah asked. He looked at the shaking dog in Michael's arms with a new respect. Michael shook his head no. His heart constricted at the thought. I'm sorry, Michael. I take back what I said about the dog. Noah swallowed thickly. Here. I'll carry her in, and Max can pull you along. That's way we'll all get inside quicker. Michael hesitated a moment, but let Noah take FedEx. The dog was getting so big, and after such a run and swim, he was ready to drop to the ground himself. He wasn't sure he had the strength to carry her much longer. Max pulled one of Michael's arms over his shoulder and wrapped his other arm around his waist. Come on, Michael, one foot in front of the other. We got this. Paget met them part way and wrapped a blanket around them. He wanted to ask how FedEx was. She slipped herself under his other arm and helped to tug him along. I laid out clothes in Michael's room for both of you. It's a good thing all of you are close enough in size that you can share from the same wardrobe. Noah and Max would be borrowing his clothes. He far preferred it when Anne borrowed them. He sighed. He really needed to stop sinking like this. A particularly hard shiver shuddered through him, and he was grateful when they entered the house. It was blessedly hot inside. 
Max and Paget led him to his room, making him sit on the bed. FedEx. Michael was surprised that the word had come out right. He tried again. FedEx. It's okay, Michael. We'll both get changed and we'll feel brand new in just a moment, Max assured him, disregarding the odd word that he had said. To Max, it was one of those words that was substituted for something Michael wanted to say, best ignored. I'm going to get some gauze and tape for his knee, Paget slipped away, and Michael realized his knee did sting. He looked down to see it was dripping blood down his leg. FedEx, Michael repeated and motioned toward the door. Max looked at him in incomprehension, and Michael felt a flash of frustration. How did one mime a dog without looking like a complete idiot? Michael, let's get changed into dry, warm clothes. Then we can work out whatever it is you're saying. Max pulled off his own shirt and grabbed a towel. Michael sighed and followed suit. Paget came into the room and knelt down in front of him. She had a couple of pads of gauze, tape, and scissors. She used a towel to remove some of the blood, and Michael winced. Sorry. How bad is it? Does he need stitches? Max asked as he leaned over to have a look. Michael wanted to remind them that he was right here listening to them. Just because he didn't talk much didn't mean that he wasn't fully cognizant of the situation. No, it's just scraped up pretty badly. Paget pressed the pads against his knee and set to securing them with the tape. Max handed Michael a dry sweatshirt. I think your clothes look better on me. Michael snorted. He pulled on the hoodie over the dry tee that he now donned. Finished with his knee, Paget gathered her supplies. That was a very brave thing you did today. Thank you, Michael. Michael shook his head and jerked a thumb to Max. Yes, I would have done what you did, but we both know you're the faster runner and better swimmer, even if you are an old man, Max said. We all saw that wave. I wouldn't have made it on time. He shrugged. FedEx, barking. Max put a hand on his shoulder. Let's finish getting changed and then we'll check on the dog. Paget left them to it, and within a few minutes, Max was directing Michael along the hall to the living room. Michael felt drained, but needed to check on FedEx. He gave both Evan and Ethan a hug, received one from Elle, who was still wiping tears, and then sat down on the rug by FedEx. Noah was roughing up the boxer mix with a fluffy towel in front of the fireplace. FedEx rolled onto her back to get a belly rub, none the worse for the adventure. Spotting Michael, she wriggled over and licked his hand happily. Michael shook his head and petted the dog, the worry in his chest easing. I guess she's going to be fine, Noah said. Does the mutt have a name? That X, Michael repeated. He wondered if they would finally understand or just not get it. He pointed to the dog. That X. Max began laughing. Did you seriously name the dog Fed X? Michael gave a sheepish smile and nodded. It was about time they figured it out. That thing with the commercial. That was about the dog. Max sat and wiped his eyes, still chuckling. A FedEx commercial. Remember he kept pointing from the television to the dog? Why would you name a dog FedEx? Noah looked at him incredulously. Michael sighed. There was no way he was going to be able to explain it. Max slapped Noah on the back. Hey, it's all good. At least we now know the dog's name. FedEx gets a full turkey dinner today. No bones, Elle sniffed. Michael turned and had a look at the kitchen. Nothing smelled burnt. He wouldn't have been surprised if another pan had been destroyed while they were outside. With luck, the pans would be okay and Fenley wouldn't be angry. He wasn't sure if he would survive another tongue lashing from the little housekeeper. Elle and Paget continued to finish the meal. FedEx got up and started trailing the boys around. I just don't understand how he got out of the house. Noah said as he watched Ethan babble and chase a ball. All the doors and windows are shut with the cold outside, and he hasn't figured out how to open knobs yet. Michael used a chair to help himself stand. His knee was really smarting now, and the ankle was slightly swollen. Limping, he went to the back door and grimaced at the newly installed doggy door. He had a feeling that that was the escape hatch. Noah followed him. Well, I'll be. Perfect for dogs and toddlers. Michael motioned to an old sea chest that was full of books. He pointed to the door and raised an eyebrow. Max, help me move this, Noah called. Michael gave his arm a small shove and gestured as if to ask why. He went to the sea chest, ready to grab a handle, but Max nudged him good-naturedly out of the way. 
Step aside, old man. You've got a hurt leg. Go sit down and wait for dinner. You've done enough heroics for today. Old man? Was this some sort of nickname from Max? Michael wasn't sure he liked it. He wasn't that old. He watched Noah and Max set the chest in front of the doggy door, preventing any further escapes for the day. Max wrapped an arm around Michael's shoulders. Come on, the recliner's comfortable. I'll get you some ice for the knee. Michael was beginning to feel that they were coddling him just a little too much. After all, his head was completely healed. However, he was tired. He settled into the recliner, and a moment later, FedEx joined him, snuggling in at the side in her usual spot. Max came with a bag of ice wrapped in a towel and put it on Michael's knee. Michael sat up and put it on his ankle, then leaned down in the chair. "'Why didn't you say something?' asked Max. He sat on a nearby chair and took the ice away to examine the swollen ankle. Michael rolled his eyes, petting a happily panting FedEx. "'Well, excuse me, Mr. Attitude.' What did that nurse call you? Cranky pants? Max poked at the ankle and Michael twitched. It's not broken. Michael already knew that. He expected in a couple days the swelling would go down. Some day, when Max was injured, he planned on poking him back. Hard. The swelling will probably go down in a couple of days. Max placed the ice back on it. Hmm, Michael agreed with only a little sarcasm. Max, why don't you leave your brother alone? Paget asked. Michael silently agreed and closed his eyes. I have six years of brotherly love to make up for, Max complained. I have to bother him. It's in the rules. It's true, Noah deadpanned. It's in the rules. Come here and carve this turkey, Elle said. Michael could hear the laughter in her voice. He was glad. It meant that she had gotten over the scare that Ethan had given them all. They gathered at the table and Michael stayed in his chair. It was comfortable. It was his favorite chair. His dog was here. Maybe Max was right and he was becoming an old man, he thought drowsily. What about Michael? Al asked. I'll bring him a plate, Paget said. They gathered round, putting the boys in high chairs and doling out the food. By the time Paget came to the recliner, plate in hand, Michael was asleep. FedEx lifted an eyelid to look at her, then snuggled back to sleep with her master. Soon the dog was snoring softly. Fen Li stepped into the kitchen. Immediately she knew that someone had been busy. She put away the groceries and saw leftovers of a Thanksgiving dinner in the fridge. This was why she had been given the weekend off. Hmm. Good thing she had come back early. She spied two high chairs. There was a toy on the couch, and Michael was sleeping with the dog in his usual chair, a throw blanket tossed over them both. FedEx watched her, but didn't leave her master's side. Fenley opened a cupboard. Her pans had been rearranged. They were all there and looked clean and okay, but Fenley knew someone had been cooking. She padded softly to the guest rooms and had a peek. Four adults and two sweet little babies. No Anne. Stifling a disappointed sigh, she went to the deck and pulled out her cell phone. A stream of Vietnamese later, and her nephew would bring the extra groceries she needed. She started in the kitchen, banging a pan firmly onto the stove. Michael jerked, startled by the sudden noise. Perfect. She proceeded to start the coffee pot and get breakfast going for two, all the while keeping an eye on her boss without appearing to. He yawned, stretched, and got up to let the dog out. He waited for FedEx to come back and let her in. Within moments, he joined her in the kitchen, going straight for the fresh coffee. You in big trouble, Mr. Michael. He looked at her in surprise. Taking his coffee, sat down on a stool and raised an eyebrow, waiting for her to explain further. You pay me cook, clean, and run errand. Now you got four cook and two freeloaders in house, she pointed to the guest rooms. What you do that for? You fire me? Michael smiled and shook his head no. I need job. I pay bills. I support family. Three in college. No more cook without me, Fenley said firmly. Michael pointed to the pan on the stove. Yes, pan's okay this time. Next time, maybe not so lucky. She popped some bread into the toaster. You have bad habit. Burn pan. He burns pans? Max yawned and headed directly for the coffee. Michael made a sound of protest and put up a finger indicating that it happened once. Ha! Twice. Once you, once Missy Ann burn eggs, Fenley accused. 
I sense a story behind this, Max said. Michael flushed a little at Max's inquiring look. He sipped his coffee, refusing to be drawn into this. No more cook. You banned from kitchen. Fen Li looked up at Max. Which brother you? Max grinned. Max, and you are? Fen Li. God made you too tall. Get crick and neck just looking at you. She pulled out the toast and proceeded to make a plate, which she placed in front of Michael. God made you too short, Max returned. He sat beside Michael at the breakfast bar. I like her. I want one. Michael rolled his eyes. One of Fenley was more than enough. Only one of me, that enough. Fenley put a second breakfast together and put it in front of Max. I hope you like egg like this. It's perfect. The doorbell rang and Fenley bustled over. She pulled her nephew in, grabbing bags from him while chatting away in her native tongue. In moments, the kitchen was stocked and more pans were placed on the stove. Breakfast for the remaining guests were started. The nephew left. He hadn't said a word the entire time. So, how long have you been working here, Fenley? Max asked. Ten year. First time I see you, she accused. Who are all these people? We're family. Expect to see more of us, Max replied. You're a very good cook. Thank you. You, a charmer. You charm pants right off lady upstairs. Max choked on his bacon and Michael laughed heartily. Fenley put a plate on the floor and FedEx began eating. In my country, we kill dog and cook it. She's kidding, right? Max looked at Michael. Michael shrugged, smiling. He was pretty sure Fenley just liked shocking people. You married to lady upstairs? Fenley asked. Engaged. We get married very soon. Good. Those other two with babies married? Yes. Max decided Fenley deserved to get interrogated in return. You married? Yes. Thirty years. Now he boring old man. She poured orange juice in two glasses and placed it in front of them. He my boring old man. Kids? Five. Three in college, so you need to stop cook and let me do job. She waved a spatula at them as she complained. I need money to pay school. Max looked at the orange juice. I'm not really a fan of orange juice, thanks. Fenley stopped and stared at him. Full of vitamin? You drink. Max smiled, relying on charm. Thank you, Fenley, but I'll be fine without it. Ha! Vitamins you need. You get cold and die unless you drink vitamins or orange juice. Then they accuse me of murder because I not let you take no vitamin. She pushed the glass closer to Max. No die, drink. I no go jail. Michael calmly sipped the orange juice and looked at Max. I'd prefer drink! Her voice whipped out like a miniature drill sergeant. Max drank. Michael laughed. Finley cackled. You silly boy. As if. Paget came to the kitchen and gave Max a kiss. She looked at Fen Lee, surprised. Hello. Lady found her pants back, Fen Lee observed. What? Paget looked at Max, who put his hands up in surrender. Michael just grinned. Coffee? Tea? Tea would be lovely. Paget sat on Max's leg, wrapping an arm around his shoulders, and picked a piece of toast off his plate. Green, strawberry, black, peppermint? Fen Lee asked. Michael wondered if Fen Lee's nephew brought, brought all of that. He never had tea in the house before. Green, if you have it. If I have. I know offer if not in cupboard. Fenley put water on to boil. Max pushed his glass of orange juice at Paget, who absently drank some. Fenley set up more toast and dished up a plate of breakfast for Paget. Suddenly, she grabbed Paget's hand and chortled, That big rock! Personally, Michael thought it was a little conservative for some that he had seen. However, Paget and Max were on a bit of a budget. Paget blushed. This silly one give you ring? Fenley pointed at Max. Yes. Paget smiled at Max dreamily. Oh, she too in love. Joke's no work on her. Fenley waved a hand and turned the eggs. See, Mr. Michael? Turn food at no burn. Max grinned and turned to Michael. Care to share? Pardon? Paget asked. Apparently eggs got burned. Max goaded. Michael stood and put his plate and utensils in the sink. He drained his coffee, and the cup joined the rest. With a pat on Fenley's head, he snapped his fingers, and FedEx bounced beside him like she was on springs. Both left out the sliding door. Where is he going? Max asked. You brother knew no nothing. 
They go jog. Happen every day. He jog even when three feet snow. Fen Lee shuddered, handing Paget her freshly brewed tea. Crazy. So tell us about the eggs, Max suggested. And burn egg. Too bad. I think if smoke alarm no go off, I no come, maybe there be more babies around here, she winked suggestively. Well, that would be about time. They've only been dancing around each other for the past twenty years. Max rolled his eyes. Paget frowned at him. Don't tease Michael about this. I think he really likes Anne, and El said Anne really likes him. We all want them to get together, Max replied. No, Paget knew where this was headed. What? Max asked, all innocence. No interfering, Paget warned Max, poking him in the chest with a finger. They need to figure it out for themselves. She make him happy. Fen Lee made a coffee for herself. She leave and he sad. Elle made her way sleepily into the kitchen, Ethan in her arms. Well, she's dating George now. How can she date George? Max asked. Who is George? I thought she loved Michael. She does, Elle said quietly. But George is there. He's romantic. He says all the right things. He wants a home and a wife and children. Who says Michael doesn't want all those things? Max defended his brother. Elle put Ethan in the high chair and sat down. Well, he needs to tell Anne that before she ends up marrying George. They're engaged. When? Max demanded. She sent the picture text yesterday. I guess he asked her this weekend. Isn't that a bit fast? Patchett asked. She can't marry him. It will devastate Michael. Max pushed his plate away, not hungry anymore. Well, I'll just have to be here for him, Elle said quietly as she fed Ethan. Fenley heaved a heavy sigh. She knew Michael wasn't eating well. He'd lost some weight, too. He was depressed, pining for Missy Anne. She didn't know how he's going to be when Anne married someone else. Even though Michael was older than her, she actually viewed him as one of her children, taking care of him as she had for the past ten years. She didn't want to see him hurt. She glared at Max and pointed the spatula at him again. Come more often. Bug Mr. Michael. I promise I will, Max replied. Good. Fenley sniffed and doled out more food. Chapter 9 Michael gave a half-hearted smile and offered his arm to yet another person of Max's and Paget's acquaintance. It was a small wedding by high society standards, but it was nice and classy. The country club had done a good job with the decor. Quiet, subtle, expensive-looking. He didn't know the exact cost, but he and Noah had given some money to the day. When Max had tried to protest, no one had explained that it was non-negotiable. Max had done much for so many, and now it was their turn to do something for him and his new bride. Seating Paget's Aunt Lucille, he made his way back to the back of the church. Noah and he were ushering people in. Some guy named Adam was waiting with Max, greeting guests. Max had said that Adam had been instrumental in introducing the couple. He was happy for Max and Paget. He smiled by rote to the next couple. The woman looked around critically. She had blonde hair, and he could see some of the resemblance to her daughter. The man looked pleasantly surprised and held out his hand, making introductions. Paget's parents. Michael nodded, kept his expression pleasant, and proceeded to usher them down the aisle. If they thought it odd that he didn't introduce himself, they didn't bother to tell him. He made sure they settled into the pre-selected seats and gave them a copy of the program. As he made his way to the back of the room, he saw Noah leading Anne and George Stapleton down the aisle to sit on the groom's side. He recognized George from the series of commercials the man made for his dentist chain. He didn't like the man on television, and he really didn't like the man in front of him now. Anne, however, looked absolutely stunning. She was a vision. It was enough to take his breath away and throw a brick in his gut. She wore a pale blue satin number with flowers on it. She was exquisite. She wasn't his. He dragged his gaze away from her. He walked out of the room and took a moment for himself outside. He watched the valet park cars and people wander into the building, greeting each other. Kristen Gaines came up to him. They shook hands. Michael, I heard what happened. Right shame. He turned to his wife. Dorothy, remember Michael? 
"'Of course, dear,' she smiled at him kindly. "'Such a pity.' He nodded his greetings, wishing they would stop acting like he was something to be pitied. He sighed. He's going to have to go back in. It wasn't like he could avoid his brother's wedding just because he'd rather not see Anne on the arm of some other man. Besides, he wasn't getting a peace out here as people came up to greet him, people he couldn't reply to. Straightening his jacket, he turned but was interrupted as his cousin Dylan came to greet him. Michael hadn't seen him for some time, but it wasn't surprised that he'd come to the wedding. Despite the age difference, before Dylan got married, he and Max had been up to a number of ventures together. "'Max told me,' Dylan said, about the speech thing. Michael nodded. "'He also told me that you brought his shares so that he could start the fund for caring for the kids that were affected by Ramsley Pharma's bad drug.' Dylan shook his hand. "'I want to thank you for that. A lot of people needed that funding.' Michael shrugged. He knew that Dylan's girl Shannon had been on the drug. He wanted to ask how she was. Dylan seemed to know what he wanted to say. Soon. She'll join her mom soon. Dylan's wife had died seven years ago. He'd suffered through a lot. Avery had a sleepover and Caden had a birthday party. Shannon is resting with the nurse, so I thought I'd come down for the wedding. I don't expect to save for the reception, Dylan explained. I like to spend as much time as I can with Shannon. Michael nodded. He offered his hand to Dylan again, wishing that things had been different. He was glad, though, that Dylan had forgiven him. You need anything, you let me know, Dylan admonished him. Michael made the same hand motion back that Dylan had just made, knowing that Dylan would understand that he reciprocated the gesture. Dylan nodded, and the two of them headed back to the room that had been set up for the wedding. He helped seat the last few people. He was surprised to see his mother enter alone. He hadn't expected her to defy his father. She spotted him and smiled. He went forward to greet her with a kiss on the cheek. Noah told me. She looked tan from the cruise. She patted his cheek affectionately and blinked back tears. If you need anything, I know you can't tell me, but let me know. He nodded. She took his arm. Of course, your father wouldn't come. He's still not able to forgive Maxwell. I, however, was not going to miss this. He slowly escorted her to the front. She was seventy-five years young now, and while she had kept herself up very well, Michael could see a frailty starting to set in. He laid a hand over hers and assisted her to sit, giving her a program. Then it was time. The bridesmaids were lovely, the bride beautiful. Max was obviously the happiest man in the room. Vows were made, rings were exchanged. All the while, Michael tried not to look at Anne. If he could have married anyone, it would have been her. He supposed he'd stay a bachelor forever. He was surprised that she had come to the wedding. He knew Max had invited her, but to go and see him be wed when she was in love with him? Unless Michael had misunderstood. Michael supposed he could have... Then, who was she in love with? It wasn't him, that was for certain. Michael waited his turn, then escorted Tiffany, Paget's sister, down the aisle. He didn't much like her. She was beautiful, yet she was also critical and vain. He suffered her in silence as he escorted her to the lawn. Pictures would be taken while the guests were entertained with cocktails. Then the reception would take place. Michael wished today was over already. He was happy for the couple, he wished them all the best, but he just felt a little off. It seemed like pictures took forever. Finally, they ended and the group headed inside. There was dinner, speeches, cake cutting. Michael watched it all, feeling a little more of an observer than a participant. He wondered if he should take some pain medication, but he didn't really feel like he had a headache. He ignored his head and watched the dancing until Elle made him go on the floor with her. She chatted amicably about how nervous Paget was before the ceremony and how she'd felt at her own wedding to Noah. He nodded at appropriate moments. She seemed very happy. She also looked very nice for as a bridesmaid. At the end of the song, he returned her to Noah. He didn't feel dizzy exactly, just not right. Paget commandeered him next. He treated her with all the due respect of the bride that she was, and listened to her happy burbling about the wedding, how she loved his brother Max, 
her thanks of him being a groomsman, how she adored their mother. Instinctively, he knew his mother would adore Paget as well. He was glad. It was too bad about his father. Well, it was David's loss, not the other way around. Unfortunately, after their dance, Paget paired him with Tiffany. Fortunately, Tiffany didn't seem to want to speak. That was good. He didn't want to speak either. At least, that was what he told himself. It was easier pretending he had any control in the matter. Then there was Dix. She was Paget's maid of honor. Once again, he listened as a woman complimented the bride, the venue, his brother, the meal, and whatever else she could think of. After, he gently danced with his mother. She told him how much she adored Paget, and he had to smile at that. Then, using a mother's intuition, she asked him what was wrong, and he shook his head, suddenly tired. He gave her another smile and escorted her back to Max. Max would make her forget that she'd seen him unhappy in any way. Max was great at charming and distracting people. When Michael turned around, there was Anne. She gave him a shy smile. Care to dance? He swallowed and held out a hand. He couldn't refuse her. Michael didn't want to. He escorted her to the dance floor, and she put her hand on his shoulder and her left hand in his. He noticed the ring. It was huge. He felt like someone had hit him in the abdomen with a baseball bat. No, the entire world had tilted like a bomb had gone off. She was engaged. He ran a thumb over it. Yes, uh, George asked me a couple weeks ago. She smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. What could he say? He wanted to know why she would be with a man who didn't make her happy. Then again, she said Michael didn't make her happy. So what right had he to judge? Instead, he just held her close and they danced to the music, not speaking any further. This felt like the final goodbye. Michael was grateful. He was grateful for all the years he had known her. He was grateful for the time he had with her. He hoped she would find her happiness somehow. He tried to memorize the moment. Then the music ended all too soon and he released her. George was waiting impatiently. They were introduced, and Michael nodded to the other man's greetings. George possessively threaded Anne's arm through his. Michael disliked him greatly, and excused himself as soon as he could. If he was abrupt, it was because he couldn't stand to stay there any longer and pretend to be happy for Anne. Wanting to escape, he headed to the terrace. He breathed in the cool night air and looked over the impressive landscaping. He wanted to be home where he could lay in the chair with FedEx and ignore that the world had turned itself upside down. His feelings felt raw, like they'd gone ten rounds with a heavyweight champion and come out the loser. Anne was engaged. Anne married to that odious man. Anne having little Stapleton children. He felt like cursing a blue streak, throwing something. Instead, Michael stood and concentrated on breathing. Michael? L had come out, probably to check on him. He wished she wouldn't. He didn't feel good. He wanted to be left alone. Michael, are you okay? Anne asked, laying a hand on his arm, obviously concerned. No, he wasn't okay. Then, suddenly, his body stiffened. He turned toward the right, his eyes rolling up in his head as he fell convulsing to the ground. Anne felt bereft. She danced with Michael one last time. It had been a final goodbye, and she had savored every moment of her time with him. The rock on her left hand felt heavy, a burden. George insisted on dancing with her afterward, and so she let him lead her out on the floor. She had the feeling George was jealous of Michael, which was ridiculous. He was the one she was engaged to. Plus, he had been the one who had insisted on going to the wedding. Against her will, she watched Michael leave through the doors to the terrace. Elle followed, so she knew he was being looked after. She gave George a smile, but really didn't want to talk. George, however, did want to talk. He talked about the wedding and how they would have something bigger, splashier, more expensive. Nothing but the best for his Anne. She didn't even want to think about it. Suddenly, the idea of just having a small wedding on the beach appealed to her. Simple. The guys didn't even have to wear full suits. The problem was she could only see Michael as the groom. What was she doing? 
Who was she kidding? She was miserable. She'd have to return the ring. Maybe she'd just pack it all in and forget about the husband part entirely. It wasn't like it was uncommon for a woman to go out and order a pregnancy from the local sperm bank these days. But she didn't want to raise a child alone. She wasn't going to get what she wanted, she admonished herself. Anne smiled and automatically nodded to something George said, because he seemed to expect it. There was a commotion near the terrace. Elle motioned frantically for Noah and Max. Michael. Something had happened to Michael. Anne's breath caught in her throat at the certainty of the feeling as she froze, watching the brothers and Paget head out to the doors. Anne? George asked her, mildly annoyed that she stopped dancing in the middle of the song. She slowly let go of him and walked towards the terrace. Anne! Now he really was annoyed. She ignored him and picked up her pace. People were milling about, talking, and she pushed through them and saw the most terrifying thing. Max had his arms around Michael's torso, holding his arms while Noah held his legs. Michael was convulsing. Paget was on a cell phone. Someone suggested using a spoon to make sure he didn't swallow his tongue. Another person said that was a myth. Anne knelt before him and grabbed his hands. Michael didn't squeeze her hands back. He didn't know that she was there. She looked at Max and was frightened. He focused on Michael, speaking calmly. It's going to be okay, Michael. The ambulance is on the way. You're very strong and you'll get through this. We're all here to help you. And you have to stick around, you know, because who else is going to teach the kids to sail a boat? No one, I wouldn't know where to begin. Michael was drooling, so she used the skirt on her dress to wipe his face, even though it was difficult to do so with his jerky movements. There was red mixed with the saliva. Blood. What? Max asked, distracted. I think he bit his tongue. Her voice wavered. It seemed to take forever for the ambulance attendants to arrive. They injected something into him and asked what had happened. Elle spoke up, her arm around Mrs. Ramsley. I came out to talk to him, and he just started shaking. They asked all sorts of questions, and finally loaded him up onto the gurney. Anne followed them, and Noah stepped up to stop her. I'll go with him. I'm his brother. No, insisted Anne. I'm going. You can meet me at the hospital. I know all of his information. Anne, you're engaged to someone else. Noah said with some contempt. He doesn't need you. But in her heart of hearts, she knew he did. She also knew she wouldn't rest until she was with him again. She tore the engagement ring off her finger and threw it on the ground. Not any more. She walked around Noah and got into the ambulance. The driver closed the doors, and soon they were headed up to the hospital. Just before they made it there, Michael stopped seizing. Inside the hospital, Michael was separated from her, and she was giving admitting forms to fill out. She sat and diligently dealt with paperwork, wishing someone would tell her how Michael was. She handed back the completed forms and sat, waiting. She was still in the waiting room when Michael's family arrived. She let them know that he had stopped convulsing. Beyond that, she knew nothing more. They waited, and finally a doctor came to see them. He introduced himself as Dr. Smith. "'Special occasion?' he smiled and sat down. "'Okay, I understand all of you are concerned for Michael. "'Is this the first time he's ever had a seizure?' "'Yes,' Max said. "'I see by his chart that he was a patient of Dr. Hemond. "'He's had surgery on his brain.' "'Dr. Smith looked at the papers in front of him. "'Sometimes the brain is a funny thing. "'While Michael's migraines, dizziness, and hallucinations have disappeared. "'Hallucinations?' Noah interrupted sharply. No one said anything about hallucinations. The young doctor checked his notes again. It's here on his chart. Anne put her head in her hands. Michael had never said anything. He'd been suffering through so much and never said a word. When she'd been his secretary, she'd known all about the migraines and their increasing strength. However, he'd never once complained about them. She could feel Elle rub her back. As I was saying, most of Michael's previous symptoms have disappeared post-surgery. However, we all knew that there might be some side effects. Sometimes, if a stroke happens during the surgery, there can be interruptions in the neurons in the brain. They happen infrequently and randomly. With proper medications, we can work out eliminating the seizures. 
Are you saying that he had a stroke during the surgery? Max asked. It's likely that he had a small one. It explains the speech aphasia and the seizures. The doctor confirmed. We've sedated him, and he's going to be very tired tomorrow. We'll keep him until the day after, and if there's no other lasting effects, he'll be able to go home. He's going to be okay? Mrs. Ramsley asked, her voice quavering. Yes, he will be okay. Dr. Smythe stood up. Now, seeing this is a special occasion, I'll let the entire group see him for five minutes. Then you all need to go back to the party. No one gets to stay tonight except Michael. He's going to sleep the entire time anyways. Visiting hours start at eight tomorrow. They followed the doctor and found Michael laying in a hospital bed, the hated gown on, asleep. A monitor blinked nearby, reading his vitals. Anne hung back as everyone either squeezed his hand or gave him a kiss on the cheek. Finally, most of them trailed away, and Anne came over. She perched on the bed and grabbed his hand. She clutched it to her and leaned forward to place a kiss at the edge of his mouth, then straightened to watch him sleep a moment. "'I'm sorry, Anne,' Noah said. "'I didn't know.' Anne nodded. She suspected everyone except Michael knew now. Then again, maybe he knew, but didn't want to hurt her feelings by rejecting her. She wiped away a tear and gently put Michael's hand down. Can I get a ride home? Of course. Taking a last look at Michael, she allowed Noah to lead her out of the hospital. Everyone was gathered in the parking lot with the limo. Noah explained. It seemed the most expedient. She crawled into the limo and Al wrapped an arm around her. She leaned on her friend, feeling emotionally exhausted. Once again, she'd put Michael first. Maybe that was what she was meant to do. You're the secretary, aren't you? asked Michael's mom, eyeing her. Anne nodded. I was. He gave you all of his shares, she stated calmly. David's fit to be tied over that. I'm sorry, Anne replied. She wasn't sure what else to say. No, Rachel smiled. I think it's wonderful. Anne was puzzled. Why? Michael always was the most generous person with the people he loves. I'm looking forward to a third wedding, she said. Anne burst into tears as the rest of them got into the limo. Things haven't been going smoothly, Al cautioned Mrs. Ramsley, hugging Anne. She nodded wisely. The quiet ones are always the hardest, but once you have them, they'll never let you go. Chapter 10 Michael listened groggily to the beeping and the clock ticking. Right away he knew he was back at the hospital. He heaved a heavy sigh. In response, someone started strangling his arm again with the blood pressure cuff. Good morning, sleepyhead. Kelly. Michael opened his eyes and saw a dimpled smile. His tongue hurt. Welcome back. He closed his eyes. He didn't want to be back. I'll go get you some breakfast. Kelly removed the cuff. Michael must have dozed off because Kelly was back with a tray almost instantly. He ran a hand over his face and tried to remember what had happened. There was the wedding. He danced. Anne. Anne was engaged. Michael closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose. Despair danced in his chest. Maybe they could just put him out of his misery. How about I help you sit up? Kelly used the foot pedal and the bed obeyed. I've got the walker here just in case you need to make a trip to the washroom. You're going to be very tired, so you need to call me when using the call button if you need to get up. Otherwise, we'll be picking you up off the floor. He ignored her. She could call him Cranky Pants all she wanted. He was tired and wanted the world to go away. She pushed the table over his legs. You'll feel better once you eat something. No, he wouldn't. Michael sighed and opened his eyes, dropping his hand. There was no point in arguing with Kelly. He drank the coffee and ate what he could stomach of the breakfast before pushing it away and going back to the sweet oblivion of sleep so that he could forget about Anne and her engagement to George Stapleton. Max and Paget were the first to arrive. They brought a ridiculous plant. It was small and fern-like. Michael had no idea what to do with it. He supposed Fen Lee would look after it. 
You've scared us, Michael. Max sat on the chair, and Paget perched on his leg. It seemed to be one of their favorite ways to sit. Michael waited. He didn't even know what had happened. The doctor hadn't been by yet to tell him his prognosis. "'Has anyone told you what happened?' Paget asked. He shook his head. "'No. You had a seizure,' she explained. "'The doctor says you're going to be okay, but you'll be on some new medication.' "'A seizure?' Michael heaved a sigh. No wonder his tongue hurt. He'd probably bitten it when he fell. "'Hey, you've made our wedding the talk of the season,' Max tried to lighten the mood. Michael sent them a look of apology. Paget gave her husband a look of exasperation. She leaned over and took Michael's hand. "'We are just glad that you're okay.' "'Weren't they supposed to be on a honeymoon?' Michael mimed the airplane with his hands. "'That's what trip cancellation insurance is for. We'll go later,' Max said. Michael nodded. El and Noah came next with the twins. They both set the boys on the bed, and Michael endured their hugs and pats. Thankfully, they did not bring a plant. He wondered if it had been Paget's idea. "'Michael, please do me a favor and never do that again,' El shuddered. He couldn't promise it. He didn't remember being on the terrace. El filled him in on the details. Michael was sorry that he had upset her. His mother came. Rachel did not bring a plant. She did, however, get the chair from Max and Paget. They all chatted around him, and he let the noise wash over him. Michael fell asleep again because they were gone when he woke up, and Kelly had appeared with lunch. She followed him to the washroom. It was humiliating. Michael managed better with lunch, but his tongue still hurt. Dr. Hemmen came, pulling up the chair. "'Well, Michael, it's good to see you again, even if the circumstances are not what we would wish.' Michael nodded. "'The seizure was unfortunate, but we knew it was a possibility,' he said in his heavy accent. "'We've put you on a course of medication which should prevent further seizures once we have the levels adjusted to what your body needs. I'm also going to give you some pills that will act as a sedative. Did you feel the seizure coming on? Did you feel odd or different?' before the seizure happened. Michael nodded. He had felt off for most of the evening. Well, good. That means there is a chance that you will know when a seizure is coming. You can take one of the sedative pills and lie down in a dark room. This may stop a seizure from happening at all. We're going to keep you for the rest of today, and I expect you will sleep a lot during your stay. Tomorrow you may be discharged and go home. He looked at Michael over his glasses. No headache? Any dizziness? Michael shook his head no, and Dr. Hammond wrote his response down. Then I think, unless something changes, we should not be meeting again. Michael held out a hand, and Dr. Hammond took it. Good luck, Michael. After the doctor left, Michael slept some more. Anne looked at herself in the mirror. She was pale and washed out. She'd slept fitfully throughout the night and so decided to stay in bed until well past noon. She looked every bit her forty years. She pulled her hair back into a sloppy bun and listened to George berate her over a voicemail message. She had humiliated him, publicly embarrassed him. He railed at her lack of manners. He didn't care about her connection to the Ramsley family. He was going to sue. The engagement was over. Wait, what? What had he just said besides the vulgar language? She hit the replay button. There it was. Between her connections to the Ramsleys and suing her, he said it was in today's papers. Anne ignored the rest of the message and raced to her front door. She grabbed today's edition of her subscription newspaper off the floor from the hallway and began flipping through it. It had made the business news in the front page of the society section. There were wedding pictures someone had leaked to the press. Michael looking so handsome in his suit with his brothers. There was a picture of Anne and Michael dancing. There was her throwing off her ring as the ambulance attendants rolled Michael away on the gurney. The society page made a gossipy splash, discussing so many of the private details of their lives. Her engagement, alluding to the possible twenty-year romantic relationship between her and Michael. Michael's resignation from the company. 
The business section merely showed Michael's photo. The brothers cropped away in a photo of her on George's arm. It discussed how Michael had stepped down now that she was the largest controlling shareholder of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. It speculated on what medical condition he might have and made a suggestive comment about why he had left all his shares to his secretary. Anne flushed red and buried her head in her hands. Michael was going to be mortified. She was mortified. It made her look mercenary at best and a slut at worst. It made him look like so many other men banging their secretaries. The only thing the paper couldn't say was that his wife had turned the other cheek since he was not married. What had David Ramsley said to her once? She'd been very young and perhaps had worked for Michael for two or three years at that point. Ah, yes. He said men who wanted to excel in their careers did not have affairs with their secretaries. He thought her crush quaint, however it would be better if she saw someone else. Anne had never liked Michael's father. David had never liked her. She knew Michael was a grown man who made multi-million dollar decisions every day, but David had still pulled the strings in the background. He did that in everyone's lives, a master puppeteer and manipulator. At the time, she'd been humiliated and simply tried to best contain her feelings. Now she wondered if he had given Michael the same talk. It didn't help that David had unsuccessfully hit on her later, insinuating she could fast-track her career if she had an affair with him. Well, the cat was out of the bag now, and even if most of it was speculation and even fabrication, there was no stuffing it back in. Anne got dressed and went to the local café. She needed something more than a regular coffee this morning. She was about to order when a woman grabbed her by the arm. "'Excuse me? It's you, isn't it?' She was excited. Anne looked at her blankly. Pardon me? I'm not sure what you're talking about. The stranger held up a gossip tabloid, and there she was, throwing the ring front and center. The headline read, Move over Kardashians, meet the Ramsleys. The sub-headlines were, Something wrong with Bachelor Michael? Wild wedding for Max? Twins for Noah? Pregnant with another set? At the bottom it said in bold letters, just how long have boss Michael and secretary Anne been having an affair? She grabbed the paper out of the woman's hands and opened it to the inside article. Photos were splashed across the page in all their colorful glory. It detailed everything, only in a graphic, garish way. They hadn't just run with the story. It now flew with lurid suggestions and speculations. One paragraph inquired if Anne was sporting a baby bump and asked if she even knew who the father was. "'Will you sign it?' The woman grabbed a pen out of her purse, holding it up. "'No!' An aghast Anne pushed her past her and rushed out of the shop. "'Hey, that's my paper!' Fortunately, the woman didn't follow her. Anne spotted a magazine stand and could see that this tabloid wasn't the only one that had decided they were front-page sellers. She dug her cell phone out of her purse and called L. She barely waited for the hello. Oh, have you seen today's papers? Max and Paget mentioned we made the Times, Elle replied. No one went out to buy one. Anne had a panicked laugh. She could imagine Noah when he saw the tabloids at the newspaper stands. Anne, are you okay? Max didn't think it was that bad, Elle said. Anne groaned. We made more than just the Times. I'm sure the journal has followed suit. You know how newspapers all print nearly the same thing? Anne could hear one of the twins babbling in the background. Ethan, let go of the phone. Sorry about that. We made the tabloids. It's lurid and trashy and it is front page. Anne repeated the headline. Elle was silent for a moment. This isn't good. No. She couldn't bring herself to tell Elle about the baby bump speculation. Her phone vibrated. Jeannie's on the other line. I'll add her to our call. Anne punched in the necessary buttons. Hi, Jeannie. On my Aunt Viola's grave. Are you preggers with Michael's baby? What? Elle demanded. No. Anne sat down abruptly on a street bench that was meant for people waiting for the bus. An old man looked at her and kept feeding the pigeons. Then it's George's. Jeanie sounded so disappointed. There is no baby, 
Anne clarified. Apparently, I was just fat in the dress. The one you wore yesterday? You look beautiful in that dress, Elle said. Yeah, well, tell it to the press. Anne had a bitter laugh. They think you're pregnant with a second set of twins. L was silent. L. Jeanie drew out her name. Is there something you'd like to share? I went to the doctor. Unexpecting. I haven't even told Noah yet. Is it twins? Jeanie gushed. It's far too early to tell that sort of thing. Besides, the chances of having twins twice is unlikely. How did they know? L asked, bewildered. Congratulations, Anne said. She was happy for her friend. She was sad that she had no baby bump of her own. How was Michael this morning? Good. He slept through most of our visit, but the nurses said that was normal. They expect he'll be more awake this afternoon. Elle was kind with her next question. Are you going to see him? Yes. Anne couldn't imagine not seeing him. Are you sure, Anne? Jeanie's voice was gentle. You'll get sucked into his life again. I love him. Anne replied simply. She was already sucked into his life. She didn't want to live without him. I'm going home to eat a pint of ice cream, since I'm fat anyway. I'll let you know what I decide to do. There was a loud noise in the background of the phone. Elle's voice came through dryly. Noah's home with five tabloids and two newspapers. He looks fit to be tied. I'll call back later. Good luck, Anne said before Elle disconnected. Honey, did you really throw that ring, or did they Photoshop that? Jeanie asked. Elle sighed and gave her the rundown on the entire evening. Michael flushed. He was embarrassed. He was angry. He was devastated. Anne with a baby bump? Did the math even add up? He knew nothing about when women were supposed to show. Could she be carrying George's child already? He felt sick. Kelly continued reading, perched on his bed. She'd come in all excited that he was a celebrity and that the nurses had a famous patient in their hospital. She'd teased that he was going to need security now. Then she'd sat down and proceeded to fill him in on the horror show that was his life. Noah. Noah would threaten to sue and get Deagle to get all this stuff removed and retracted. A retraction and apology on the bottom of the twelfth page in the tiniest print possible, knowing the tabloid industry. Michael wondered what Anne thought of the whole business. Had she really thrown her ring? That was probably photoshopped. Tabloids liked drama. He stared at the photos. When Max had said Michael had made the wedding the talk of the season, he'd understated things. It looked like they were going to be the talk of the city, whether they liked it or not. Turn on Channel 3, a nurse, he thought her name might be Dana, came charging into the room. She grabbed the remote before Kelly could and turned the television to the correct station, putting up the sound. It was one of those shows that talk about celebrities and movies. Now they were discussing the wedding and the photos in the tabloids. They had been upgraded to the talk of the nation. Everyone is speculating about what's really going on behind the public facade presented by the Ramsleys. A woman was saying, Ramsley Pharmaceuticals is one of the largest drug companies in the country, and recently Michael Ramsley made headlines when he gave his secretary all his controlling shares before leaving the company. That's right, Carol. A man now took over, and a picture of Business Weekly showed the article detailing the transfer. Brothers Max and Noah have both been in the press before, but Michael appears to have been hiding. The formal head of Ramsley Pharma is speculated to have been involved in a twenty-year-long affair with his secretary, Ann Schaefer, the same woman that he handed over a fortune in company shares to. Indeed, Tom, Carol said. However, it looks like things were not going well for the couple, as Ann had recently become engaged to George Stapleton, the dental king. But it looks like that's off. We have exclusive video of Ann throwing away her $80,000 diamond engagement ring. Tom pointed to the screen, and there it was in cell phone recorded glory, Anne pitching the ring after Noah telling her that she was engaged to George. She really had broken it off, in an incredibly public way. Michael didn't know what to think of that. We tried to reach out to George, but he's yet made no comment to the press, 
Carol tittered to Tom. Perhaps he's just sad that his crowning achievement has cracked his veneer. George was seen on his hands and knees searching for the diamond, Tom allowed. It's said that he used some vulgar language that wouldn't be fit for his dental commercials. Let's talk about Anne's unconfirmed baby bump, Carol gushed. I think it's Michael's. Is the baby yours? Kelly asked him. Michael shook his head. This was a train wreck. Well, at least she broke up with George, Kelly said sympathetically. Carol and Tom speculated on what kind of disease he might have and if he was dying. How could they even say this stuff on television and not worry about being sued? Michael gently took a remote from Dana and shut the television off. Noah was going to have a fit. Max couldn't have known it was this bad, otherwise he would have been angry. Their father was going to have a coronary. Michael could imagine David's rant once he found out. He'd always disliked Anne. He'd say that this entire episode had proved him right. Well, Michael had no intention of sitting through another lecture. He wasn't his father's employee anymore. Perhaps his father would stop speaking to him altogether, like he had with Max. Sadly, it would be a relief. What did Anne think? Anne, how are you? Kelly popped off off the bed and put the tabloid behind her back trying to hide the evidence of what she had been up to. Michael looked at Anne, hungry to see how she was. She looked tired and frustrated. Anne came forward and plucked the paper from Kelly's hands. She sighed, tossing it in her bag onto the chair. Please go away. She followed Kelly and Dana to the door and then shut it after them. Perching on the bed, she took Michael's hand. He drank in the sight of her. How are you doing? she asked. He gestured that he was okay. You scared us all. He nodded gravely. I'm glad you're okay. She tucked a bit of her hair behind her ear that had managed to escape the bun. He took her left hand and rubbed his thumb over her ring finger. I didn't love him, Anne shrugged and wiped away a tear. I thought maybe, given time, I can learn to, but... Michael put a hand to her cheek. Then, because he had to know, he motioned to her stomach. Anne gave a watery laugh. No, I am not pregnant. Good. He was reassured to hear that. She sniffed, so he tugged on her gently until she was resting beside him on the bed, head on his chest, his arm around her. Maybe there was a chance for him after all. He tried to say that George was an idiot. It came out, I, June, June, George... Anne looked at him confused. Michael sighed, frustrated he ran a hand through his hair. It's okay, Michael. It wasn't. He stared at the ceiling. Anne sat up. Putting a hand on his cheek, she turned his head so that he looked at her. She looked so sad. Please don't be upset. I'm upset enough for both of us today. He nodded. I guess you heard all about the trash that they're printing. She pointed to the tabloid. It was worse than that. He reached over and grabbed the remote, turning on the television. On came Carol and Tom, talking about some celebrity going into rehab. Anne looked at the television to him. What's going on? He pulled her against him so that she could comfortably see the television and motion from the tabloid to the screen. They didn't, she asked in horror. In response, Tom and Carol started a repeat of the previous segment dragging the Ramsley name through the proverbial mud. Everyone is speculating about what's really going on behind the public facade presented by the Ramsleys, Carol said. Michael let Anne watch the whole thing, her hand covering her mouth as she watched in disbelief. After it was over, he turned the power off. This is worse than I thought. Anne wiped away more tears angrily. I can't believe they just talked about us like that. He rubbed her back. Part of him was angry at these people who thought they could just speculate on the lives of others. Another part of him was grateful. Anne wasn't engaged or pregnant. What did it mean, though? The door opened with Noah and Elle coming in. Kelly rolled her eyes from the hall and mouthed sorry to Michael and Anne. Noah leaned against the wall, arms folded, while Elle took the chair. Where are the twins? Anne asked. I left them with my mama. It seemed like the best idea. Elle looked at Noah. 
He thinks we should sue. Michael sighed. They could sue, but would they win? If they won, would it be worth it? If the retraction would be lousy. If they lost, it would add more fuel to the fire. The truth was, the majority of what was printed were... Mm, close to facts. What was pure speculation would be hard to prove was libelous. I know what you're going to say, Noah stated flatly, that there is no use in suing them unless we can win, and we probably won't. The court will likely throw out the case or rule in favor of those trash tabloids like they've done in the past. Michael looked at Noah wryly. There really was no point in suing. They can just get away with it? Anne asked. They can print and say whatever they like on television just to get more readers and viewers. On television? Elle inquired. "'We've made the entertainment news,' Anne said angrily. "'You're kidding!' Al looked at Noah, who visibly reigned in his temper. "'We can do a press release, an interview, and present our side. "'Make them look like cads,' Noah said darkly. "'It's about the only thing we can do. "'I probably still have the name and numbers of the columnists from the GQ and Business Weekly,' Anne offered. "'They've been trying to get Michael to sit down for an interview for years.' If you'll contact them, it will be a start. They're both reputable magazines. We can give a press release to the other magazines we choose. Do you want to do the interview? Anne asked Michael. We need to do this, Noah interrupted. The company's reputation has suffered. This could affect the Claymore purchase. We need to present a united front as a family. That means all of us together. Although how we're going to get Dad and Max in the same room is beyond me. "'Is there any way that your father would forgive Max?' Al questioned. "'If Max were to apologize, grovel and admit he was wrong, which he will never do because he was right,' Noah said in disgust. "'The old man can't forgive anyone.' Michael grimaced. He could make it happen. He didn't want to do it, but he had a trump card when it came to their father. While David had hired private investigators to monitor his children's lives and a few more people, besides— Michael had hired someone to investigate his father. The result had been earth-shaking. He had only confronted his father once about what he had found out when it was in desperate situation. He'd rather keep the secret to himself. He didn't want to burden his brothers with it. It was better to forget what he knew. Forget, Dad. We can do it without him. He's too much of a headache to deal with. We should set up the interview for as soon as possible. You get released tomorrow. Would that be too much for you? Noah asked. "'Are you sure that you want to do this?' Anne queried softly of Michael. He nodded. It needed to be done, plus it wasn't like he could answer any questions anyways. He was relieved that Noah seemed to be taking control of the situation. "'I still think we should give it a couple days for Michael to be rested enough. I'm sure the colonists will appreciate the time to run the whole interview idea past their editors, and they'll want to make up a list of questions for us to look at,' Anne said." At least, the last time they wanted to interview, they were willing to be limited to a list of questions. That may have changed. We'll find out when you contact them, Elle said. In the meanwhile, I'm going to see what trouble the twins have gotten into. I suggest we all leave and let Michael get some rest. He's going to need it for the rest of the interview. Michael agreed. He was feeling fatigue creep up on him. Anne grabbed her purse. I'll come back tomorrow with Max, and we'll get you settled at the beach house again. Michael nodded. He was glad to have Anne back in his life again. He tried to figure out a way to make her happy, he reflected drowsily as she left. Chapter 11 Michael was happy to be home. He could hear FedEx whining at the door. "'Is that a dog?' Anne asked, confused. Max, who had accompanied them, just grinned. Michael entered the house, and FedEx was jumping like she was on springs, easily reaching chest height. He leaned down and petted her roughly. She danced and licked his hands excitedly. "'About time! Thought you'd never come back!' Fenley yelled from the kitchen. "'You forget you live here, Mr. Michael?' Michael smiled and went to the kitchen, where he greeted the housekeeper with a hug. She pushed him away. "'That dog wander all over house looking for you.' "'Hello, Fenley.' Anne greeted. She wondered when Michael had gotten a dog. Oh, Missy Anne back! Fenley grinned. You staying? I'll be helping Michael with his recovery, Anne said. 
Max reached past the housekeeper for an apple and whispered something in her ear. She tittered. I hope so, Fen Lee cackled. I make lunch? Michael shook his head. He was tired just from the car ride. He yawned. I think we'll pass, Max said. My big brother looks like he just wants to take a nap. Max tagged along with Michael upstairs. Anne sat down at the breakfast bar and watched Fen Lee putter around. When did Michael get a dog? Anne questioned. One day he bring in. Dog with him ever since. Sleep on bed. Fen Lee wrinkled her nose. It sleeps on the bed? Anne couldn't believe it. Michael wouldn't allow that, would he? Sure, it go everywhere with him. Fen Lee shook her head. Good dog. What's its name? Fen Lee cackled again. FedEx. FedEx? You're serious. Anne laughed as Fen Lee nodded. So, you know answer right. You stay with Mr. Michael? Fen Lee put away the mop that she had been using. A few days at least. After that, we'll see. Anne hedged. We see, Fen Lee snorted. You go, Mr. Michael said. You stay, make happy. Fen Lee, it's not that simple, Anne sighed. Sure it is. Fen Lee looked at her watch. Oh, I late. Daughter music show. Must go. You stay, Missy Anne. Fen Lee grabbed her purse and hustled for the door. Max had brought the dog out to do its business. He brought FedEx back inside the living room and petted her. I really like this dog. You know, we were never allowed to have pets as kids. I never once thought Michael would want one. Anne was surprised as well. She knew Michael had a loving heart, but never thought he would be a dog person. Maybe a fish person, but not a dog person. However, he seemed to have adopted FedEx, and the dog was more than equally devoted to him. When Max stopped petting her, FedEx padded upstairs to find Michael. She'd probably crawl in bed with him again. Anne thought it was funny. She didn't see Michael as a person who'd let a dog sleep on the bed. Yet, he did. When do you leave for the honeymoon? Friday next week. Max grabbed a glass of water. Are you moving back in? Anne nodded. For a couple of days at least. Just until Michael isn't so tired. Are you going to tell him that you love him? Max cut to the heart of the matter. When he was deeply in love with the mystery woman? Probably not. Definitely not. She wondered if she should try to find out who this woman was. No. She really didn't want to obsessively compare herself to the perfection as Michael had called his mystery love. I think that's between Michael and I. Max sighed and put down the glass. As a man who is extremely happy right now, married to the woman he, whom he loves, I'm going to interfere a moment. I really wish you wouldn't, Anne said. It hurt too much. I don't know what's been going on between the two of you, but I think both of you has miscommunicated. Max came over and put his hands on her shoulders, looking down at her. Anne, he loves you. He might not say it, but he does. Like a kid sister, or a friend, like a secretary that he's had for over twenty years. She smiled sadly. Okay, I didn't want to do it, but I'm bringing out the big guns. Max grasped her arm and drew her along to the study. Max, we're friends. Of course he loves me, like a friend. Anne swallowed and said the dreaded words that haunted her sleep ever since she had learned his secret. Michael is in love with someone else. That's where you're wrong, Max said calmly. He grabbed a journal at random and checked for the date. Ah, here are the good ones. He's got away with a pen and a word. I've seen the poetry. He loves her, whoever she is, very much, Anne said miserably. Max stared at her. You're as blind as he is. Max, would you please just stop? She wiped away a tear. We shouldn't be invading his privacy anyways. Please, put the journal back. Invading his privacy? I've been reading his journals for years. Max shrugged. Sure, he doesn't know that I've been reading them, but I think it's about the only way to get inside his head and know what he was thinking, especially when he was being the perfect robot worker for our dad. Anne grabbed the journal and put it back. Anne, the poetry is about you. Some of it is even a little suggestive, considering who it's coming from. Max grabbed another volume. Her golden hair, her blue eyes, her fair skin, it's all about you. 
Trust me. Was it? It described her and mother probably 20% of the female population in the country, and tried to tamp down the hope that she felt. The poetry never mentioned her name. There was no way to know for sure. Max, it's not me. She makes the office seem more alive every time she enters. When the sun filters through the afternoon glass, her hair takes on a color like burnished brass. Max flipped through another section. See, it's an office romance. Whose hair does he get to see every afternoon? Hmm, I wonder who. He couldn't possibly be right. Maybe Michael's mystery woman was from the office. She'd give Max that much. She grabbed the book and put it on the shelf. Max, stop. He raised an eyebrow and grabbed another volume, holding it over her head so that she couldn't grab it from him. I lent Anne my umbrella since it was raining and she didn't have one. What neither of us counted on was the wind. When she returned from her dentist appointment, she was completely soaked through. I remember that, Anne said. And there was nothing special about that day except I ruined the umbrella. I don't know why he even put it in the journal. He lent me his suit jacket and let me go home early. Max smiled wolfishly. Really? You two sure have different memories. After you left, he wrote this entry, and it describes your lovely curves as those wet clothes hugged your body. So he's a red-blooded male like any other and can appreciate the female figure. Anne glared at Max. Put the book back. Nope. Max grabbed another and flipped through to a random page. Anne is dating some guy named Greg Wilson. Did you know that he had every one of your boyfriends fully investigated? Not only is that illegal, but it's creepy when your boss is checking out your love life. I wonder why he did it. Could he be jealous? Greg seems to be a nice guy, but Michael certainly didn't like him if this entry is anything to go by. Anne put a hand over her eyes. It's odd, I'll admit it. He's obsessed with you. Max grabbed another book and read from a random page. Her colors are as vibrant as the brightest butterfly. Her smile a caress against dreary skies. She excludes perfection in every way. She grows more beautiful every day. Soon there will be no words that understand how to describe my ever-lovely Anne. Max looked extremely satisfied. Anne grabbed the book from him and scanned the lines, finding it word for word what he had recited. His Anne. His ever-lovely Anne. Max poked her on the shoulder with each word. He loves you. He loves you. She believed him. Michael loved her. All those beautiful poems about her. She hugged the journal. I believe my work here is done. Max bust her on the forehead and let himself out, whistling merrily. Michael absently petted FedEx as he reclined on the bed after his nap. He was sick of this cat-and-mouse sort of game that he and Anne had been playing. He was feeling better and really didn't even need to nap anymore, but if she thought he wasn't fully recovered, she might stay longer. He wanted her to stay in his life permanently. That meant he was going to have to make her want to stay. He had to tell her that he loved her. He had to gamble that she might choose to stay and try to love him in return. And he knew exactly how to tell her. He got up and padded barefoot to the study, grabbing the very last journal that he had written in. The words were right here for her to read. All he had to do was get her to read them. Then she would know. Then they could figure out what they were going to do with their lives. She'd either want to be with him, or she'd look at him with pity and move on with her life. He looked around the house and finally found her sitting on a window seat, a throw blanket over her lap, a mug nearby, and a book in her hand. It wasn't just any book. It was one of his journals. She flushed once he caught her reading it. I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't have. It's just beautiful, the poetry. She was embarrassed. Most of the poetry was about her. It was fine. She could read every single one of them. Right now, he'd like her to read one particular entry. He took the journal out of her hand and put it to the side. Anne took it as an admonishment. I am sorry. I'll never do it again. I shouldn't have invaded your privacy. Michael knelt in front of her and flipped through the pages until he found the entry he was looking for. 
he held out the book to her. Surprised, Anne took it and read, Anne has quit. I am drowning. She looked at him with devastation in her eyes. Oh, Michael, I'm so sorry. It was the worst timing, quitting the day you got your prognosis. Michael shook his head and pointed to the opposing page. Anne turned her attention to the words. His last words that he wrote the morning before the board meeting, before the surgery. There was a hitch in her voice. These may be the last words I ever write. I love you, Anne. She pressed a hand to her mouth and stared at the page. It was right there in black and white if anyone had known where to find it. Michael had never felt so scared in all his life. Not even of the possibility of dying or waking up from surgery knowing that a huge hole in his life had happened with the damage to his brain. This mattered more than all of that. This was Anne, and he loved her. He stayed kneeling in front of her, waiting to see what she would do, what she would say. Anne started crying. Michael closed his eyes for a moment, letting the despair wash over him. He then removed the book from her hands and hugged her close. Whatever Anne wanted, it would be okay. It wouldn't be okay, but he would pretend that it was. Michael held her until her tears were spent. Anne pulled back and wiped her face on the cuff of her sweater. Oh, Michael, why didn't you tell me twenty years ago? He hadn't had the words then. He barely had the words now. She gave a bubble of laughter and wrapped her arms around him, hugging him tightly before whispering in his ear, I love you. She loved him. She loved him. Michael could feel joy spread through his chest. Then he kissed her. Tentative, then with desire. He picked her up, brought her upstairs, and to his bed. He was not going to waste another moment. As he joined her, Anne smiled dim and she put a hand to his shoulder. I'm not on any birth control, and I happen to know there are no condoms in this house, she warned. Michael put a finger to her mouth, silencing her. His hand crept along the hem of her shirt, and he raised it so they could put a gentle kiss to her abdomen. He would give her as many babies as she wanted. When he looked at her, Anne was smiling with tears in her eyes. He leaned forward, hungrily kissing her, and she didn't protest. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look forward to the next epilogue of Words Unspoken. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Epilogue Anne leaned back on the blanket to catch some afternoon sun on the beach. The interview had gone extremely well. GQ and Business Weekly had done tasteful covers. The company had recovered from the scandal, and Noah had managed to get Gaines to have the position that he deserved as head of the company. It had taken a few months, but now their lives were back to normal. Michael had only one more seizure. They had his medications adjusted, and it was unlikely he would have another if everything went well. Otherwise, he was in perfect health, which made Anne very happy. Elle waddled to the blanket on the beach and carefully plunked herself onto it. She rubbed her distended stomach with a sigh. If they kick any harder, they're going to come out the wrong way. Did you find out the sex? Padgett asked. Boys. Two boys again. Elle shook her head. I can't believe I'm silly enough to have four baby boys under four. I'm going to lose my mind. Should I lend you Fen Lee? Anne asked. Don't offer what you aren't willing to give, El warned. We will all help, Paget said, slathering on sunscreen for her fair skin. Her own baby bump was tiny, even though she was three weeks ahead of El in her pregnancy. Group momming. I think it could really catch on. Did you get the nursery painted? El asked her. It's a beautiful sky blue for baby Morgan. Paget was also having a boy. Once she and Max had announced the news, Michael had handed over the key to the downtown condo. It was a three-bedroom, which was far better than Paget's single. Max and Paget had protested, but Michael had insisted in his own quiet way. Have you picked out names? We're arguing still. Elle took a sip of her iced tea. Noah has bad taste in names. 
and watched as the guy slowly took the sailboat out. Michael was trying, this time more successfully, to teach Max how to sail. Noah had gone along since the water was calm today, but she doubted he would last long. He looked green the minute he'd set off on the boat. Fenley had two napping twins in the house. FedEx had a life jacket and was on the boat, so she simply wouldn't let Michael out of her sight. Life was very good. It was about to get better. Why did he insist on going on the boat? He knows better, El muttered as she watched them go out further. He's only going to be sicker than ever. He had to go. Michael asked him to, and said calmly, He wants to commandeer both your husbands for a small task and had to talk details. El looked at her expectantly. Why? What does he want them to do? Paget asked curiously. Anne smiled. Well, I'm figuring it has to do with shopping for a diamond ring, since he had a page torn out of the jewelry magazine in his pocket of his shorts this morning, with all sorts of them on it. El and Paget both sat up on the blanket, alert. Really? grinned Paget. It's about time, El exclaimed. I'm so happy for you. Don't tell. He doesn't know that I know. Anne couldn't contain her happiness. She grinned. We'll have to start planning, shopping, dress hunting, Paget said dreamily. When do you think you'd like to marry? Fall? Winter? Summer, Anne said firmly. Here on the beach, right in the back of the yard, it was going to be perfect. Next year? Paget nodded. That's doable. It always takes a while to find a good venue anyways. This year? Hopefully before my baby bump shows too much. Not that I'd really care anyways, Anne said casually. She saw Michael wave from the boat. She waved in return. Elle grabbed her in a hug. Congratulations! Paget hugged them both. Does Michael know? He found out this morning. After I stuffed that page of rings back in his pocket, Anne laughed and hugged her two sisters-in-law. I had to tell him to distract him before he figured out that I knew what he was up to. They leaned back and watched the guys chatting about baby names. Life was good. If you enjoyed Michael and Anne's story in Unspoken Words, book three of the Ramsley Brothers series, then continue the magic with Dillian and Kelly's story in Reluctant Husband, book four of the Ramsley Brothers series. Dylan Ramsley hasn't really been living. Since the death of his wife and daughter, he's just been trying to make it through the day with his two boys. Kelly Islington didn't expect to have a crush on one of the wealthy and handsome Ramsleys, but when she met Dylan, she fell for him. From general mishaps to her friend's interference, she's certain she hasn't made a good impression on him. When the custody of Kelly's son is threatened by a corrupt judge, Dylan steps in. While he wanted to help, he didn't count on marrying Kelly. It isn't ideal, but now that Kelly has him, can she convince her reluctant husband to be happy? Look for Book 4, Reluctant Husband, as an e-book or paperback on Amazon. Also, it is enrolled in the Kindle Unlimited program. You can also find the audiobook on YouTube for free and coming soon to Audible. Thank you for listening to Words Unspoken. If you enjoyed this audiobook, perhaps you'll enjoy Book 4 of the Ramsley Brothers series, Reluctant Husband.